O God, author of all wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, we ask thy guidance in our consultations to the end that truth and justice may prevail in all of our arguments. Amen. Before we get into the formal part of the agenda this morning, it will be a good, fun, packed, and busy day. A um, couple of quick announcements just for the interest of those in the gallery. We will be starting with the public hearing items this morning. Um, we will be taking an extended uh, recess over the lunch hour uh, to meet with the Premier and Cabinet. So we'll be breaking at 11.30 instead of our usual 12.00. Uh, and I believe there will probably be some other changes to the agenda that we'll go through for now. But before we do those, Alderman Pincott. Thank you, Your Worship. It's, uh, it's my pleasure this morning to uh, introduce to members of council uh, and, the, and the, the public uh, our new city auditor. Mr. Todd Horbisenko uh, started with us last week, and uh, I'm actually quite impressed he managed to get get by uh, four days without being uh, either hounded by council or the media or anybody else, so I'm, I'm quite impressed. Uh, that said, um, we're pleased to, to have Mr. Horbisenko with us uh, this morning and, uh, uh, and also to have him join the City of Calgary. As many of you know, he, did, uh, he was Deputy Auditor at the City of Edmonton and uh, after the extensive search of which I would like once again to thank uh, Alderman Lowe and uh, the two citizen members of Audit Committee, uh, Mr. Draper and Mr. Carpenter, for the amount of work that they put in to come up with the best candidate in North America for this job. Uh, I also would like to thank council support and in particular uh, Audit Committee support for all of the work that has been going on at Audit Committee for the for the uh, over the past year, um, I know that the the new members of audit committee have a uh, we well we have continuing work and in particular I also like to thank uh, Alderman Hodges for his work as he is no longer on audit committee. With that, your worship, Mr. Todd Horbisenko, our new city auditor. Welcome, Mr. Horbyshenko. We're very happy to have you here, and we look forward to working with you uh, a lot going forward. Uh, would you like to say a couple of words? Uh, yeah, if you, if you just take a moment. Uh, thank you, Alderman Pincott, for that kind introduction. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of City Council, good morning. I just want to say a few words to share with you my excitement to work with you and the administration to provide cost-effective, high-quality services to the citizens of Calgary. As City Auditor, I'll lead and develop a team of internal auditors who, while independent of, the, uh, independent of the administration, will work with management to provide City Council and the citizens of Calgary assurance that their tax dollars are being spent wisely. Being a small team, we concentrate our efforts on the most important or highest risk areas facing the City to maximize the impact of our work. The results of our reviews provide management with an independent and objective ass uh, assessments, and they are intended to use the actions of the past to improve the future. We'll then publicly report these actions to reinforce the city's public accountability framework. In addition to yourselves, I've read that the city has over 14,000 employees working together to achieve the city's vision, to create and sustain a vibrant, healthy, safe, and caring community. I'm very excited to join the City of Calgary and these 14,000 people to work towards achieving this vision. Appreciate you having me here this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much and we echo your excitement. We're very happy to have you here and I will also repeat uh, what Alderman Pincott suggested, which is our special thanks to the Search Committee and the Audit Committee for finding you. <laughs> and I think Alderman Pincott has something for you. A little, little something. <laughs> Thank you. Cartoon from the Sun, I believe. <laughs> Thank you very much, Thank sir. You. All right, that takes us then to question period. Alderman Collier, your card on question period? On the agenda, Your on Worship. The agenda. Alderman you. Lowe on question period? On the agenda, Your Worship. And Alderman Hodges on question period. Alderman Pinkot on question period. Anybody? <laughs> no questions today. All right, on the agenda. I suspect we're going to have a number of these. So let's start with... <laughs> I'm just looking at my list of lights that are on. Uh, let's start with Alderman Collier Card. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, uh, on the agenda oh. under Section 9, Items from Administration and Committees, we have the City Manager's Report uh, 2011-05, the Airport Tunnel Underpass. 
And on Friday, this confidential report came out, uh, C-2011-06. And I understand some of our colleagues that were away uh, on council business didn't receive this. And actually, um, many of us that have reviewed it over the weekend don't really feel it needs to be confidential, Your Worship. And I was wondering if it could be tabled publicly now so people have a, a chance to review it. Um, I'm going to suggest not at this juncture, um, because the reason that some of it is confidential is because it requires items under active negotiation uh, with the airport authority at the moment. And there are, in fact, some updates to it. I will, however, suggest that what we can do, um, which I think Alderman Stevenson was going to move anyway, is we can move discussion of 06 uh, right behind 05. So my thought is we'll have the public presentation on 05, go in camera, discuss 06, determine what needs to stay in camera and what can come out, okay. and then have the discussion after that if that works for you. Okay, thank I, you. I, is, that, is that everything? Yeah. Thank you. All right, thank you. I realize I didn't ask for a mover for the motion. Alderman DeMong, since your light's not on, will you move the agenda? Thank you. And seconder? Thanks, Alderman Putmans. All right. Um, so let's just keep working our way down. Alderman Lowe. Well, thank you, Your Worship. I'd like to uh, add an item of urgent business. Uh, I've uh, circulated the clerk with 35 copies. You and I discussed it briefly. Alderman and Hodges and I will uh, bring this forward. It has to do with amendment to the streets bylaw concerning pathway clearing, Your Worship. Topical for today, I might add. Uh, we have a situation in the city where we have uh, people who have passed designated pathways adjacent to their property who are being served with notice uh, and orders to clear the full pathway to the full width, which uh, is causing some concern and anxiety out there. So uh, the purpose of the, uh, of the uh, motion, Your Worship, is to uh, direct uh, some action with respect to staying these orders, doing some education, and making a change to the bylaws. So I'd appreciate adding that. Okay, do we have a seconder for that? Thanks, Alderman Hodges. Um, so to add this motion of uh, this uh, item of urgent business, are we agreed? Any opposed? Very well, that's added as 11.1. .1. Alderman Hodges? Sorry, Worship, on today's uh, public hearing agenda, uh, I take it it's appropriate to, I'd like to bring forward uh, the Greenbrier item and the bone SARP amendment item, bylaws 12P 2011 and 13D 2011. Uh, so I'm uh, moving this and it will be seconded by Alderman Pincott that the agenda for today's meeting, combined meeting, be further amended by bringing forward and tabling report uh, CPC 2011-018 the amendment to the ARP and the land use redesignation to the 2011 April 11th combined meeting of council. April 11th? Yes. All right, very well. And Alderman Pincott, you're seconding that? And uh, the reason you worship is this is a kind of a bit of a complicated issue. Uh, we're not actually holding anything up. Uh, the transportation infrastructure is not in place to support, uh, yet in, the, in place to support this land use redesignation. Uh, that'll be a subject of discussion uh, in the coming months, and uh, a tabling will enable there to be further consultation between the planning department and the uh, uh, planning uh, members of the community association in the area. So I think the tabling uh, would be worthwhile. Great. Um, all right, then, any further discussion on this item? So to table this item, are we agreed? agreed. Any opposed? Carried. Alderman Pincott. Uh, thank you. Um, I will. Uh, I would like to move the tabling of CPC 2011-27, which is, um, if I look at 27, 8.1 on our agenda. Is it 8.1? Yes, indeed, mm -hmm. 8.1. Uh, so I would like to bring this forward and table it for one month uh, to the to the next public hearing in March. Is, uh, is that March 7th, Madam Clerk, or is that a regular meeting? March 7, then. Um, okay. And uh, um, a couple of things here. One is that uh, I had asked um, industry for some further data and research uh, on this, and I was advised on uh, Friday that they had actually managed to find uh, uh, an electrical engineer who could perform that work, but that work hasn't been performed yet. Um, as well, Alderman Chabot had been working with administration um, to identify potential um, amendments to the bylaw that's before us. 
and they were distributed to Alderman Chabot this morning, and he isn't here, and he asked me if I could, along with the tabling, uh, have the proposed amendments included, and I have 35 copies here. Okay. So. I think Alderman Marr. I think Alderman Marr seconded that one. So that's uh, tabling of that item for one month until March 7th. All right. So on that tabling, any further discussion? Are we agreed? agreed. Any opposed? Carried. Alderman Farrell. Thank you. I have a couple of amendments, please. I um, am asking for a tabling for two months for the item number 2011, CPC 2011-021 in Crescent Heights. Mm -hmm. And I'd like that for um, April 11th, if possible, please, to give the community more time to work with the applicant. So okay. I'll move that first. I have two of them. Sure. Do we have a seconder for that one? Thanks, Alderman Pincott. Any further discussion on that one? All right, tabling then CPC 2011-21 till April 11th, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Alderman Farrell? Thank you. My second one is in Eau Claire, and it deals with the Eau Claire ARP and the B lands. One is a table report, CPC 2011-126, or 2010-126, and the other is a proposed new bylaw, 18P 2011, CPC 2011-030. So items like, 6.1 and 8.4 on today's agenda. Yes, yeah, so I would like to move the last item up to be dealt with the tabled item, please. Okay. Because as they are related. Thank you. That should be relatively easy. Do we have a seconder for that one? Thanks, Alderman Collier-Cart. Any further discussion on that? All right, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Thanks, Alderman Farrell. Alderman Carra. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, on the agenda, we have CPC 2011-02, which was tabled from last month. It's item 6.3 on the agenda. Related to that is my notice of motion, which is 10.1.2 uh, on the agenda. I would, they are very related, and I would like to move 10.1.2 up uh, before we address 6.3, because they are, they are intertwined. Hmm. Can we do that one, Madam Clerk? All right. Uh, so you want to move 10.2.1. excuse me. 10.1.2 to just ahead of 6.3. Yeah, I want it to be 6.3. Okay. And 6.3 becomes 6.3A or something. Okay, no problem. Do we have a seconder? Thanks, Alderman Hodges. Uh, any further discussion on that? Okay, are we agreed? Yes. Carried. Thanks. Oh, sorry, Alderman Pincott is opposed. And so is Alderman Lowe. One time I don't call. <laughs> All right. Um, very well then. Alderman Stevenson. Thank you, Your Worship. I have a couple of amendments. The first one is uh, I'd like to move that we bring um, uh, C-2011-05, the, uh, uh, or bring, oh, let me see here, the in-camera one, which is 06, bring it forward and uh, have it uh, held or heard at the same time as 05. Okay. Well, I'm going to put it right after 05, if that's okay. all right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Do we have a seconder for that? Thanks, Alderman Keating. Uh, any further discussion on that one? That was what Alderman collier Cart was referring to earlier as well. All right. So on that one, are we agreed? Agreed. Any opposed? Carried. Alderman Stevenson? Yes. Uh, the... Um... But on... Procedure. I thought I heard you say you wanted us to go in camera first in 06. No, I think what we'll do, um, the way that Alderman Stevenson has just put it, did I, is that um, we'll have the public presentation first, then we'll go in camera, and then we'll come back out and continue the debate, if that's all right with you. We'll have to do that at that time. I'm a bit confused about public presentation on uh, 05. It's not part of the public hearing. Uh, I'm sorry. I meant administration presentation. Okay. The administration has... Uh, has an uh, introduction to the item that they would like to do in public before we go in camera. Thank you, Your Honor. Alderman Stevenson? Uh, yes, um, I have a, a letter uh, from the um, um, proponent for uh, CPC 2011-06, which is the bottle depot in um, Terradale. Mm -hmm. And so we have a letter that has been sent also to the city clerk, the law department, the development authority, that they would like to um, withdraw both of these applications effectively immediately. 
Okay. So you want to thank you. Uh, I think the right way to do that is to table it, sign a die. Is that right? No. No. no we can just them. withdraw them. Alderman Lowe, help me out here. Uh, sign a die is uh, it stays there forever oh, okay. until the next election. What if they want to withdraw it? It's uh, I'm filing I'm, the I'm looking at uh, Mr. Tully or Madam <laughs> Clerk. Because, uh, Madam Clerk, sorry, you jumped to your you 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 look like you had an answer for me, Alderman Love. Well, no, but you, right. you said matter. stand up, so I stood up. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Clerk, file and abandon the bylaw. Ah, file and abandon the bylaw. That's what we're doing because it is a bylaw. All right, so we've got a motion then to file and abandon the yeah. bylaw. Do we have a seconder? Uh, thanks, uh, Alderman Mar. And are we agreed? Yes. Any opposed? Carried. That's all. All right. Uh, anything else, Alderman Stevenson? Oh, well, that's it. Thank. Alderman Jones. Thank you, Your Worship. Your Worship, I'd ask uh, that uh, 6.2 or CPC 2011-001 be tabled last month to this meeting to be heard following CPC 2011-0, or the, to hear bylaw 15P-2011. And now that that one's been tabled a month, uh, the applicants asked me to table mine to come back following the bylaw. So I'd like to table CPC 2011-001 and land use 1D 2011 for one month to March 7th. So Very well, heard at the same time as you're seconding? Yes. All right. On that one, are we agreed? Agreed. Any opposed? Carried. All right. Uh, anyone else? All right. So then motion to approve the agenda as amended. Are we agreed? Your Worship, you've got some other items here, I believe. Oh, sorry. There's a, um, an item, a blue sheet um, from the Oh, yes, yes. Sorry. So, all right. So, um, I'm just going to read these out, and Alderman Pincott, you'll move them. Thank you. So, there is a blue sheet item from the city manager, which I think we can make 9.1.3 on the budget process. All right. I have an in-camera. We'll do these all together. I have an in-camera personnel item that we can do 12.5. Um, anything else, Madam Clerk? Yes, Your Worship. There's a report from um, the Community Services Committee, CPS 2011-10. It's an in-camera item, and it's Southland Leisure Centre Arena. Okay. All right. So that we'll add that as 12.6 uh, in-camera item, re Southland Leisure Centre. Okay. Uh, anything else? All right. That's it. So Alderman Pincott, you're moving those. Do I have a seconder? Thanks, Alderman Hodges. Are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. And finally, to adopt the agenda as amended, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Okay. Thank you. I was surprised I didn't have one this time. So that then takes us to the um, confirmation of the minutes. Can I have someone to move the minutes, please? Move the minutes. Thanks, Alderman Marr. Seconder. Uh, thanks, Alderman Stevenson. Any changes to the minutes? Your Worship. Mm -hmm. Alderman Hodges? I have an item. I meant to draw this to clerk's attention before the meeting. Page 5 of 8 of the minutes of January 17th. I'm, it's, the word products appears, and I'm not sure that the word products was meant. Uh, business plan and budget uh, coordination is often the term used, but I haven't seen the term products as a part of uh, the budget process. It's the second... Uh, motion on the page of uh, page five of, uh, as I say, January 17th. Did we mean that? Oh, I actually do know why it says products. Oh, uh, good. Yeah. Because Mr. Sawyer's presentation that day was about the yeah. Mr. Sawyer's presentation that day was about the documentation that will come to council, and he was using the term products to okay. describe that. All right, if it fits the context. <laughs> um, any other changes? And we're taking both of these sets of minutes together. Any other changes? All right, then on the motion to approve the minutes of uh, the two meetings you see there, 17th and 24th January, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Consent agenda. Thanks, Alderman Collier Cart. Seconder, Alderman Pincott. Any discussion on the consent agenda? All right, on the consent agenda, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. All right, that takes us then into public hearing items. And we'll do a little dance and get ready here. And we're starting with CPC 2010-126, 
to be immediately followed by CPC 2011-030. Thank you, Your Worship. Ian Culp representing Calgary Planning Commission on the land use oh. items today. Thank you. Uh, as uh, you change the uh, agenda here, I should note that uh, bylaw 18P 2011 has also been brought forward as part of this uh, presentation. Proposed land use that is uh, being sought is located in the area of Eau Claire. Uh, the areas affected are outlined in red and encompass two city blocks bounded by Eau Claire Avenue, 2nd Avenue Southwest, 6th Street Southwest, and 4th Street Southwest. The purpose of the direct control bylaw is to take the lands from the existing direct control and add in some additional uh, local commercial type uses, allow for an increase in FAR or floor area ratio, as well as to allow for additional commercial type activity in uh, specified locations within the development area. In reviewing the direct control bylaw, the uh, note that an amendment to the Eau Claire Area Redevelopment Plan is necessary. That was originally covered by bylaw 108 D 2010. At the time that was first brought forward and tabled, uh, we noted that there was an error in the map, uh, which uh, still included a height limitation uh, because that was not the intent of the amendment to the bylaw or the amendment to the ARP, we chose to uh, take this back to Planning Commission and re-advertise the ARP amendment, which is reflected in bylaw 18P 2011. Uh, it is now in accordance with uh, the expectations of the applicant and the intent of administration and CPC. In that respect, the DC bylaw is uh, recommending an increase of available commercial space up to 9,000 square meters from the existing 4,500, as well as a minor change to the type and number of commercial uses that might occur in the site. As well, in return for the additional floor area, uh, there's uh, specifications on where that commercial must occur, as well as the extent of how big that commercial individual spaces can be. Uh, in that respect, we are recommending that Council uh, adopt uh, the ARP amendments as shown in Bylaw 18P 2010 and in respect of that, abandon Bylaw 108D 2010. As indicated, the policies and the bylaws are the same with the exception of the change to the mapping. And in that respect, uh, we would also recommend that Council adopt the proposed redesignation and give three readings to bylaw 108 D 2010. Thanks, Mr. Cope. Any questions of clarification on this proposal? All right, we'll move into public hearing then. Anyone in the public uh, wishing to speak in favor of this proposal? Anyone wishing to speak in favor? Uh, good morning, Your Worship and members of council. I'm Jeff Hyde uh, with the uh, uh, representing the owner. Um, we have worked uh, long and hard with the uh, um, City of Calgary Planning Department and uh, I'd like to express the fact that uh, we're very happy, happy with the recommendation uh, being put forth here and as such are, are, are very are supportive uh, of, the, uh, of the new DC bylaw. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Hyde? All right, anyone wish to speak in opposition to this? Oh, still in favor? Sorry. It's all right, uh, Your Worship, uh, Tim Barsley, Fraser Milner. I think I'm still in favor. Uh, Mr. Merritt of our office has been working on this and we've been asked to take a look at the a title issue. We've been talking to your staff about this quite extensively. We've got most of it resolved. However, uh, what we would ask council to consider if it supports the recommendations and readings is to only give the bylaw two readings today. That'll allow us to finish the uh, process we need to with respect to the title matter. And uh, that's the conclusion of my comments. Okay, thanks, Mr. Bardsley. Uh, Alderman Farrell for Mr. Bardsley. Thank you, Mr. Bardsley. There were some concerns expressed by the community about um, the possibility of large bars going yes. into this neighborhood. How have you addressed that? My understanding, Alderman Farrell, through the chair, is that what's happened in the bylaws has been a definition crafted of a drinking establishment that essentially restricts the public area to a, what you would call in the bylaw a medium or a small. Mm -hmm. okay. And I believe that was addressed to community satisfaction. Uh, they're sitting here and they're nodding yes. 
So I believe that took care of the problem. Thank you for doing that. Thank you. Alderman Lowe for Mr. Bardsley. Actually, Your Worship, but, uh, if I understand, Mr. Bradley, you, you're asking us to withhold third reading until the title f issues are resolved. Is that correct? Yeah, third reading of the bylaw. Um, if I may make a point, um, my name has an E in it. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll come um, up there. Yeah, I'm, I'm still trying to get used to this. It's kind of like uh, watching a ball game with. Uh, anyway, yes, Your Worship, just the bylaw, though. There's no need to withhold anything on the policy. I think the bylaw is the only one we're concerned about. Okay. Ms. Lone, is that? You're happy with that. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Thanks, Alderman Hodges for Mr. Beardsley. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong place for the E. I'm getting in trouble this morning, I can tell. Yes, uh, thank you, Your Worship. Just briefly, on um, page two of this uh, report, uh, Mr. Bardsley, the owner is listed as BCIMC Realty Corp. Is that still the case? Yes, Your Worship, it is. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Great. Anything else for Mr. Bardsley? All right, thank you, sir. Thank you, worship members of council. Anyone else wish to speak in favor of this proposal? Anyone wish to speak in opposition to this proposal? All right, then, questions for administration? All right, Alderman Corral. I don't know if Mr. Cope is the person to answer this because he wasn't the part of the land use team. He's representing CPC. I'm just curious, I mean, what we're talking about here is building a vibrant downtown core um, with the ability to be many things to many people over the film, fullness of time once we build something. And we've just got so many discretionary uses right there that would just seem to be to be no-brainers. I'm just wondering what our rationale is for having discretionary uses rather than permitted uses to allow a more flexible and market responsive approach to urbanism. Mr. Watson. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, to Alderman Carrar, we have a discretionary use bylaw, so we have discretionary uses on almost everything, as I think Council is aware, including the downtown. And that gives us the ability, of course, as we see what comes in and how it fits to, uh, well, frankly, to refuse it if it doesn't fit, even if it fits all the rules. It's uh, certainly the uh, consultant that we hired to look at our land use bylaws said we were somewhat an anomaly in North America for that, but that's a long history of that, and that's the way it's. Yep. Oh. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman Carr. Alderman Farrell. Thank you. I would like to move the item, CPC recommendations, and two readings um, of, of the, uh, the item. And, and two just readings. Two readings, please. Okay. Just a little bit of background. This has been a really interesting application, quite exciting, really, and it shows the evolu evolution of, of this community into more of a mixed-use community. And But it, uh, th th while the application was exciting, it, it contained a significant amount of retail. So we had asked the applicant to work with the administration on, on doing a market study on how much retail could this neighborhood actually absorb, recognizing that our goal was to see Eau Claire market area develop as a, as a retail area. And so I think we've achieved a, a healthy balance and I'm quite pleased with the results. So happy to, happy to move it and thank you to the Community Association for coming down today. Thanks, uh, Alderman Farrell and Alderman Marr, you were seconding that. Any further discussion on this item? All right then, on the recommendations, are we agreed? Any opposed? Worship. Can we yes. do them separately because there's recommendations in the original report that refer to the bylaw that has to be amended. So can we do the vote? CPC sure. 2010-126. Yeah. First? So let's just say, all right, so Alderman Farrell, you then were moving the recommendations in CPC 2010-126 and two readings of the bylaw. Very well then. So on that, well, we'll do it again. Are we agreed? Any opposed? Okay, carried. So then on bylaw 18P 2011, on first reading, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. On second reading, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. On bylaw 108D 2010, first reading, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Second reading, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. And then the other one was. 
CPC 2011-30. So, Alderman Farrell, you're moving the recommendations in two readings there as well. Okay. So, or did we just do that same bylaw? Oh, we did the bylaw already, didn't we? Okay. So, we, do, we need the amendments to the ARP. That's what we're looking for. So, you move the amendments to the ARP then? Madam Clerk? We need to do the recommendations on the CPC report 030, which is uh, recommendation one to abandon the proposed bylaw 41P and adopt the amendments in the ARP. And you already gave three readings to the bylaw 18P. Two readings? Two, two readings, yeah. Okay, I see, I see, I see, I see, because they both had the same bylaw in them. That's where we got a little confused. So, Alderman Farrell, if you could move the first two recommendations of CPC 2011-030 which is to abandon the proposed bylaw and adopt the uh, amendments to the ARP? Yes, do we need a, uh, another public hearing for this? Do we need another public hearing, Madam Clerk, or did we take them both together? This is a little bit messed up, but we'll move forward. Well, Ms. Sloan? I can't, I'm just a little bit confused. We called, we called report 20, um, 26, mm -hmm. correct? That's what we had the combined public hearing on. We've had a combined public hearing on 41P Right. We have not had a public hearing. Your Worship, um, I'm a bit confused myself. It seems to me we've had a public hearing. The recommendations of CPC 2010-126 were called, which would be bylaw 14P 2010 and 108D 2010. As far as I can tell, that is what we have had the public hearing on. I do not believe, at least according to my notes, that we've called the other item. Mm -hmm. So if the other item requires readings, which I believe it's supposed to be abandoned, it, you don't need any public hearing if, if we're just simply going to abandon it. If we're yes. going to be giving readings to 41P and 108D, we can just call them if that's what we've had the public hearing on. I think the challenge, Ms. Flown, is what I just called was 18P yeah. rather than... Um, rather than 41P, which is the one that they want to abandon. That's right. And so, Your Worship, when the item was called, as perhaps Mr. Watson can confirm so we're all correct, 41P and 108D are the two bylaws that we require readings on. Correct? Now I'm confused, too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping Mr. Mat Tita and Mr. Cope have got it figured out. I believe it's Through 41 the chair. and 108. Yes, uh, the item that was moved forward, which is uh, CPC uh, 2011 030, and that's bylaw 18P 2011. That bylaw should be given the three readings. Two readings. Or, or two readings. Uh, and that part of that recommendation is that bylaw 41P 2011 be abandoned. Okay. Sorry, you were right, Madam Court. Or it's 41P 2010, sorry. I think Madam Clerk is always so, right. So, Your so Worship, like, if that item for 18P has not been called, then technically we have not had a public hearing on that item. Gotcha. We were taking them together, and I did call the vote on it. Let's do a quick do-over, shall we? On proposed bylaw, then, 18P 2011. Mr. Cope, anything to add? Nothing to add at this point. Anyone else wish to speak in favor of this bylaw? Anyone wish to speak against this bylaw? Alderman Farrell? <laughs> oh, sorry, Mr. Feck is coming. Good morning, Mr. Feck. Good morning. Uh, my name is Oscar Feck. I've been speaking about these issues many times. Like uh, Alderman Cora indicated, he picked that up when I mentioned that we create so many rules, so many bylaws. The planning department doesn't even understand what's going on anymore. I've been here a long time. I've been here since 1952. Does city council or planning department ever listen? We had good rules and laws from the 40s, 50s, 60s, 1970s. In the 80s, we changed it all. It's called to fit whoever wants to get something approved. Uh, Mayor Nancy, uh, we have to listen. You're not listening. 
So my point is, why, why is the taxpayers or whoever just like talking to a brick wall? We shouldn't do that. In the Beltline, same thing. You created more rules and laws to fit whoever wants to get something approved. Again, a bar and hotels and goes on and on. So why aren't we going back to good common sense, what we had? Not create rules and laws to fit whoever we want to make it fit to. That's wrong. It seemed like that's the way the whole thing is going and nothing has changed for the last 20 years. And it seems like it's continuing and it probably won't change, not unless we start analyzing and taking the bull by the horn and say, look, what's going on here, planning, planning department? Let's create some good rules and laws, make it fit for everybody. Everybody should have the same rights and rules. Mary, that's all I've got to say for now, but even with the tunnel, we create so many uh, uh, fluoride. It seems like we create so many... Don't go off topic. No, I, no, I'm not trying to get off topic, but right. you know what I'm saying. It's I hear just, you. I hear you. Thank you. Just hear me, Mayor. Fluoride, the tunnel, it's just a political ploy. That's all it is. Smoke screen. Including the zoning, so let's get the take the bull by the horn and let's start using common sense. Would you please do that, Mayor and Alderman? We will always try, Mr. Feck. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. All right. Uh, the latest breaking news up here at the head table is I may have been right in the first place uh, with what we where we were going, but uh, Ms. Flown. Yep. So what do we do now, ma'am? Okay, Your Worship, we've now had the public hearing on 18P, which we did not have previously. However, Council did give two readings to that bylaw. The Municipal Government Act requires that prior to second reading of a bylaw requiring a public hearing, we hold the public hearing. We've now held the public hearing, but we've already given second reading. So what Council needs to do is rescind second reading, consider the public submission, and then proceed with deciding whether you want to give second reading. <laughs> Worship on a point of procedure. Yes, Alderman Chabot. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, being as I wasn't here for first reading, uh, I may not be allowed to take part in this. Sorry, you can't set. So just give us a moment and uh, we'll call you back in. Once Thank you, I'll sort excuse of myself. This. Thank you for that. Thank you. So, Alderman Marr, you're moving to rescind the second reading of bylaw 18P20. Your Worship, I move what uh, our legal counsel said. Thank you. And Alderman Pincott is seconding that. Thank you. On that, are we agreed? Any opposed? All right. Now, I believe, well, do we, we still need to abandon the other one too. So Alderman Farrell. Finish 18P, second reading. Okay, let's do that first. Yeah. Can you move second reading of? I, I will do just that, thank you. Thanks, Alderman Pincott, you're seconding. So second reading of 18P 2011, are we agreed? agreed. Any opposed? Carried. Now, Alderman Farrell. If you could move the other two recommendations in CPC 2011-30. So moved. Aldrin Pincott, you're seconding. Any further discussion? On those, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. All right, thanks, Ms. Sloan. Thank you. Uh, we got through that one relatively easily. So now, according to our amended uh, bylaw, we are dealing with Alderman Carra's notice of motion, 10.1.2, Alderman Carra. Thank you, Your Worship. Let me just find my papers here. Bear with me, I apologize. No problem. I don't know what happened to my papers. Luckily, you know this file so well, Alderman Kra. I do. Okay. <clears throat> Tell us. All right. So last month, as you may or may not remember, we tabled uh, CPC 2011-002, uh, amendments to the Park Hill Stanley Park Area Redevelopment Plan and a land use and an associated land use redesignation in Park Hill. 
there was, um, this is a classic showdown between a community that was not happy with an upzoning and a developer that had gone through the process and ended up with a compromised upzoning that sort of fits where we want to go with Planet Calgary, which is densify our inner city, but doesn't necessarily give us the means to actually get there. I thought this was a perfect opportunity to step in and work with administration on an innovation project. So my notice of motion that I'm bringing before 6.3 is a request for funds from City Council to pursue an innovation project. And uh, just to give you a little bit of what we did was we took a month and what we did was two things. Number one, we extensively worked with the community associations involved. I'm sorry, I'm being distracted by David Watson there. What's happening over here? Okay. Keep an eye on them. Shifty. <laughs> okay. So what we did was we did two things. We took the month and we put together a terms of reference that should be in your package. Uh, Madam Clerk, is that the case? No. There are no terms of reference? How did those not get circulated? I apologize. I was in Quebec City. But we have an extensive terms of reference that were put together uh, in conjunction with, uh, and can I get those circulated to my council colleagues? We do have the notice of motion, but there's something else, is there, Alderman Carra? Yeah, there is a terms of reference that describes exactly where we want to go with this. No, I haven't seen that myself. Okay, well. Can I, can we table this until the lunch break and then we can sort of, until why, don't, lunch break? why don't we table this to uh, this and its associate item to, uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. Well, how about just the end, first item after lunch? Please. Okay, let's do that. Thank you and my apologies to Very counsel. well, and Alderman Farrell, you're seconding that. Are we agreed? agreed? Any opposed? All right, we'll deal with that after lunch then. Thanks, thanks for being, uh, Generous on that, Alderman Carra. Uh, that then takes us to, I think, item 7.1 on our agenda, CPC 2011-016. Is that right, Mr. Cope? Yes, sir. All right. <laughs> Take it away. And I assume the lights that were on were for the previous item. I'll clear them now. <clears throat> Thank you, Your Worship. The proposed redesignation that is before you in Bylaw 11D 2011 is located in the community industrial community of Highfield. The parcel in question is outlined on red and fronts onto 42nd Avenue Southeast. The proposed redesignation will take the lands from the existing IG General Industrial District at, and redesignate it to IC Industrial Commercial District. Uh, the purpose of the designation is to allow for a wider range of commercial type activities to be located in the existing building on the site. The site itself, as is shown here, it fronts onto 42nd Avenue where the access is taken from, and there's considerable area for parking located at the rear of the existing building. The existing building is under renovation as we speak, shows the access from 42nd Avenue, and the next two pictures uh, just show the adjacent uh, bay type commercial uses that occur on each side of the building. In considering the application, CPC noted that it is consistent with some of the land uses in the area. It will retain the industrial character of the area, and therefore they are recommending that Council adopt the proposed redesignation from IG to IC and give three readings to Bylaw 11D 2011. Thanks, Mr. Cope. Any questions of clarification? All right, public hearing then. Anyone wish to speak in favor of this application? Your Worship, members of Council, my name is Greg Donaldson. I'm with Brown and Associates Planning Group. I'm the applicant. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thanks, Mr. Donaldson. Any questions for Mr. Donaldson? Oh, you're getting off easy today, it looks like. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak in favor of this item? Anyone wish to speak in opposition to this item? All right, then. Questions for administration? All right, Alderman Carra, are you moving this one? Mm 
Thank you. Yeah, I will just to move uh, that uh, we proceed with uh, CPC's recommendations that we adopt the proposed redesignation and give three readings to the proposed bylaw. Okay, great. Um, Alderman Chabot, you're seconding. Any further discussion on this one? Very well then. On the recommendations, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. On the bylaw then. First reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? <clears throat> Carried. Second reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Authorization for third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. And third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Thank you. All right, so that takes us to item 7.2, land use redesignation, uh, bylaw 12D, 2011. Thank you, Your Worship. The proposed item for redesignation is located in the community of Stony 2, also in an industrial area. Parcel in question is outlined in red, with access taken from 100th Avenue on the north and uh, directly adjacent to the north portion of Barlow Trail Northeast. Proposed redesignation will take the lands from the existing IG Industrial District and redesignate the lands to IB uh, Industrial Business District with a height limitation of 30, meter, 30 meters and a uh, um, FAR of 1.0. Uh, the area is currently used as a uh, area for the short or longer term parking requirements associated with park and fly. The area outlined in red. Don't need that one. Go to the next one. Again, showing access from 100th Avenue and the parcel in its current status uh, as taken from Barlow Trail looking towards the northwest. Proposed redesignation will lands land to be redeveloped to allow for a more uh, comprehensive commercial type activity under the IB district. And it's primarily uh, intended to be used for a hotel complex. Should note that the lands to the west of the parcel are currently zoned with a similar designation for a similar type of use. In that respect, Calgary Planning Commission is recommending the council adopt the proposed redesignation and give three readings to bylaw 12D 2011. Thanks, Mr. Cope. Any questions of clarification? Alderman Chabot. Thank you. Very briefly, Mr. Cope. It says the ultimate FAR to be determined at the time of development permit application, and it does indicate <laughs> proposed FAR for commercial to be 0.5 and the maximum FAR of 1.0 to support, oh, sorry, uh, maximum FAR of 1.0 support commercial uses and 0.5 for office uses. So the FAR on the commercial side cannot be varied beyond one? Uh, it's not specified. Oh, beyond one, no. Uh, one is locked in. And what about the uh, FAR for the business unit? Can that be uh, varied above 0.5? That is not specified as part of this land use. Uh, depending on the type of activity that is occurring in the area and based on a TIA, that will determine the actual FAR for the site. The Stony and uh, Area Structure Plan uh, does make provisions for that variance in FAR based on the types of use and traffic generation. Is this um, contingent at all about uh, in regards to airport trail and the tunnel? No. Okay, I'd to ask that question. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Mr. Cope. Thanks, Alderman Chabot. Any other questions of clarification? All right, any members of the public wish to speak in favor of this proposal? Good morning, Your Worship, members of the Council. My name is Manuchuk. I'm the applicant for this, and I'm here to answer any questions you may have. Morning, Mr. Chug. Any questions for Mr. Chug? Oh, you're getting off real easy today as well. I intend keeping it that way, Your Worship. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much. Anyone else wish to speak in favor of this proposal? Mr. Fack. Yes, Mayor Alderman, my name is Oscar Fack. Like I mentioned last, uh, just a little while ago, this building is finished. Why are you coming back to get it approved again? This is what I'm talking about. Keeps changing from one uh, 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 FIR uh, one this, to one. This one's one just a parking lot, Mr. Fack. There's nothing else there. 
No, but this building came back before to uh, get it a change from hotel to condo, then back, back and forth. This has been here so many times, and I'm not knocking anybody. It's just, we, uh, we seem to try to fit zonings even when the buildings are finished. No, this is the one by the airport. It, it, I think you're thinking the one next door, but make your point anyway. Well, well, I'm trying to make my point. The building that's uh, finished or whatever, this is a parking lot next door, but both are linked together as far as I understand. So, well, even if they are on, but what I'm saying, this is the chaos or problem that's going on here. Let's quit all this. Once the building is approved, then let it build, let it finish, get it finished, and then do it with whatever you want. Same thing, the one on 17th Avenue and 24th Street. They had to come back two, three times. The building is almost finished to get the final approval. Uh, you know what I'm saying, Mayor and Alderman. It's, it's very simple. Thank you. If there's any questions. Hey, thanks, Mr. Fack, and I have to say, uh, uh, you know, your sentiment is an important one for us to hear, so thank you. Yes, thank you. Anyone else wish to speak in favor of this proposal? Anyone wish to speak in opposition to this proposal? All right, then, Alderman. Thank you, Your Worship. I'd like to move the recommendations on the three readings of the bylaw. Thanks, Alderman Stevenson, seconded by Alderman Marr. Alderman Chabot. Thank you, Your Worship. Just based on the last presentation, I wonder if I could ask administration to come forward again and uh, and tell me exactly what do we have on this site right now. Is there any structure at all? Uh, just a temporary building to uh, facilitate the park and fly operation. Okay. So the intent is to demolish that building then and replace it with this new Once structure based on this land use? Once the development permit is in place for a uh, permanent type of use, uh, I would presume that that building would be removed. Okay. Oh yeah. Looks like it's just a lot. little hut, right, Mr. Cope? Oh, uh, there's two. This is actually at the south end, at the southwest corner, uh, with an access. There is another building at the entry off of 100th, which is of approximately the same scale. So storage, essentially. Yes, it's it's long-term parking for the airport. Okay. Thank you for that. Thank you, Worship. Thanks, Alderman Chabot. Any further questions or debate on this matter? All right, then, on the recommendations, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. So then, on bylaw 12D 2011, first reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Second reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Third authorization for third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. And third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Thank you. All right, CPC 2011, uh, well, I was going to say 018, but that one's been tabled. So 019, uh, land use redesignation, Mayland North Airways, Shepherd Industrial. Good morning, Your Worship, members of council. Calgary Planning Commission is recommending the redesignation of four privately owned parcels associated with item CPC 2010-019 and bylaw 14D 2011. The proposed city initiated redesignations are intended to align the land use maps of bylaw 1P 2007 with the existing approved developments on these parcels in order to better reflect the nature of these developments. The proposal includes redesignation of four parcels from industrial general district to industrial business and industrial commercial districts. Parcel A, maps one, or, sorry, maps A1 and A2, is located in the community of Mayland in Ward 10 and con contains an office building. The site was originally designated I2 district under bylaw 2P80, which was transitioned to IG district. The transition limited the existing office uses to a maximum use area of 50% of the gross floor area of the building. In order to remove this limitation, an IBF 1.0 district is proposed with a floor area ratio of one. Parcel B, maps B1 and B2, located in community of North Airways and Ward 5, contains a building with a variety of industrial and commercial uses, including retail and consumer service uses. This site was also transitioned from I2 district under bylaw 2P80 to IG district, where retail and consumer service uses were no longer permitted. Therefore, the proposed redesignation to IC district will accommodate all of the existing uses. 
Item three, parcel C, map C1 and C2, is located in the community of South Airways in Ward 5 and contains an office building. This site was transitioned to IG District, which limited the existing office uses to a maximum of 50% of the gross floor area of the building. Redesignating this parcel to IB F1.0 District will accommodate the existing office uses occurring on this parcel. Parcel D, maps D1 and D2, located in the community of Shepherd Industrial Ward 12, contains an office building, which is transitioned to IG District. Redesignating this parcel to IB F0.5 District will accommodate the existing office uses. Notification letters were sent to the affected landowners and no opposition was received. Therefore, Calgary Planning Commission is recommending that Council give three readings to the proposed Bylaw 14D 2011 to ensure that the land use maps in Bylaw 1P 2007 reflect the nature of these developments and because the proposed land use districts are consistent with the land use transition strategy that was part of the original approval of Bylaw 1P 2007. Thank you, Your Worship. Okay, thank you, Mr. Smith, is it? Yes. Thank you. Uh, any questions for clarification for Mr. Smith? Uh, Mr. Alderman Chabot. Thank you, Worship. There are no existing subleases on site on any of these parcels that would uh, create a legal non-conforming uh, use? I'm sorry, I don't. Uh... I don't know the answer to that question. I believe Mr. Watson can provide you. Do you know Mr. Watson? Through the chair, I can't speak definitively, but we do not believe so. Otherwise, we would have, certainly we have looked at all the sites and what is actually existing on the site. So all tenants and sub and subtenants would have been notified of the proposed change? I believe not the tenants and subtenants, but certainly all the owners, which would have a concern should one of their subtenants or tenants have a problem. Would, Mr. Yes, that would have been the... Uh, um, the responsibility of the owner himself to advise those individuals. That's right. Okay. Thank you, Your Worship. No further questions. Thanks, Alderman Chabot. Um, any further questions of clarification? All right, public hearing then. Anyone wish to speak in favor of this proposal? Anyone wish to speak in opposition to this proposal? All right then, Alderman Jones. Your Worship, I'll move the recommendations of CPC and three readings of the bylaw. Thanks, Alderman Chabot. You're seconding. Any further discussion on this matter? All right, then. On the recommendations, are we agreed? agreed. Any opposed? Carried. First reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Second reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Authorization for third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. And third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Thank you. That takes us now to uh, CPC 2011-020, Inglewood, item 7.5 on your agenda. Mr. Pope. Thank you, Your Worship. Proposed items before you today are both a road closure and a land use redesignation for those closed portions of road. The areas affected are outlined in red and uh, affect the corner of St. Monica Avenue and 14th Street Southeast should note that the lands have been uh, redeveloped for open space purposes and pathway. Uh, the uh, proposed closure will close that portion of St. Monica Avenue as well as <clears throat> two corner pieces of the former cul-de-sac <clears throat> and, re <clears throat> and redesignate lands to RC2 district and SCS district to reflect the actual uses occurring on the site. Council uh, or CPC has considered the item uh, and given the fact that the lands have already been redeveloped in accordance with the uh, proposed plans, I recommend that Council adopt the proposed road closure and road closure bylaw 1C 2011 be, 2011 be given three readings. And secondly, adopt the proposed redesignation of that portion of closed road and give three readings to bylaw 15D 2011. Photos before you right now are showing the current development of the site uh, of the pathway which would be designated SCS and the two little corner pieces that are going to be designated RC2. Uh, in that respect, we are recommending approval of the bylaws. Thanks, Mr. Cope. Any questions of clarification? Alderman Carr? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, this, is, I w this was interesting when it came up because this road's been closed for years and it was basically a uh, piloned off stretch of highway that was piloned off to prevent cut through traffic when the Comforce site was redeveloped. 
And in recent years, the community got together and working closely with the Parks Department and a bunch of other people built, I think, the nicest playground in the city of Calgary. It is spectacular with public art and everything. I just, I'm, you know, my question, I guess, would be, how is this not closed before? I mean, I mean, this is obviously just a, a late after the fact piece of housekeeping. Fair question. Mr. Cope, do you have an answer or Mr. Watson? Yes, I do, uh, Your Worship. Uh, this area was actually a subject of a road closure a bylaw uh, in the early 1980s, I believe. Uh, however, the closure was never affected uh, at land titles. So technically the roads have remained open even though they were redeveloped uh, in the inter intervening time frame. There's some amazing um, all access playground equipment sitting in the middle of that road right away. So <laughs> it's gone. Um, but I will be. No, no one will be driving through it anymore. No, I, I will make a motion to support this as soon as all right. if there's any. Let's questions. finish our public hearing okay. first. So combined public hearing then on both uh, proposed bylaws. Anyone wish to speak in favor? Anyone wish to speak in opposition? Okay, very well. Alderman Carra, would you like to make the motion? Yeah, as per the CPC report, um, I recommend... You don't have to read them all. Okay. I recommend <laughs> we do everything that the CPC report asks. <laughs> Thanks, Alderman Carra. <laughs> Alderman Chabot, you're seconding. Any further discussion on this one? All right. On the recommendation, though, to recognize that you shouldn't drive through a playground, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. All right, so then we have two bylaws here. On bylaw 1C 2011, first reading, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Second reading, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Authorization for third reading, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Third reading, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. And on 15D 2011, first reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Second reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Authorization for third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? agreed? Any opposed? Carried. And third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. All right then, that takes us to 7.6 has been tabled, so 7.7 .7, CPC 2011-022, um, land use redesignation in Saddle Ridge. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, proposed redesignation is located in the community of Saddle Ridge. The parcel affected is a former acreage parcel, as outlined in red, and currently takes access from 80th Avenue Northeast. Proposed redesignation will take the land from the existing SFUD, Special Purpose Future Urban Development District, and redesignate the lands to DC Direct Control District to accommodate the additional uh, uses of place of worship and a private school. Uh, the land itself will be, have temporary access from 80th Avenue likely in the same location as you can see on this aerial photo. The low, uh, area of Matey Trail will be developed uh, just to the west but off-site and of course no access to Matey Trail will be allowed. In the long term, once the interchange area is developed in this location for Matey Trail and 80th Avenue, future access will be located from the north uh, once the uh, rest of the development areas are, are developed and the internal road system created. Uh, and with respect to the use of the parcel, CPC was accepting of the proposed uses, existing development shown on the land uh, in this aerial or in this photograph. Um, in that respect, uh, CPC is recommending that council adopt the proposed redesignation from SFUD to direct control and that three readings be given to bylaw 17D 2011. Thanks, Mr. Cope. Uh, questions of clarification for administration, Alderman Chabot? Just one, Mr. Cope. I saw a house in that picture that you provided. Was that on a different site or is that on that site? Uh, on the photograph, that is the house which exists on this parcel uh, at the current time. S FUD, Future Urban Development. Yes. It doesn't, does that allow for that? Yes, it allows for one residence on a, on a parcel. Okay. Thank you for that. No further questions. Thank you, Your Worship. Thanks, Alderman Chabot. And just for my interest, uh, Mr. Cope, my favorite land use designation, of course, is SFUD because it's just fun to say. <laughs> but um, typically these are acreage parcels where there is a home? Uh, quite often uh, the, the SFUD district actually replaced our old urban reserve district under bylaw 2P80. It's essentially a holding 
district uh, pending future urban development. Uh, but within that, there is a number of uses, and a single detached residence is one of those uses. Thank you. Public hearing then. Is there anyone who wishes to speak in favor of this item? Your worship, members of the council, my name is Manichu, I'm the applicant, and I'm here to answer any questions you may have. Any questions for Mr. Chu? They really are letting you off easy today, aren't <laughs> Thank they? Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak in favor of this? Anyone wish to speak in opposition to this? All right, then. Alderman Stevenson. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I will move the recommendations and three readings. Uh, Your Worship, this, um, this parcel uh, has been, uh, the application has been in now for two years on it. Uh, we as the, the city has held it up uh, for a, a few different reasons. One of them was uh, road uh, necessary, decisions on necessary roads, uh, uh, right of ways there. Also, uh, uh, most recently because of uh, stormwater retention. This is a part of the infamous cell D. There's 36 parcels um, here and uh, we've been trying to come up with the, an amendment to the Saddle Ridge um, uh, area structure plan to accommodate development on these. Uh, and we have finally come up, I think, with a way of doing it. So I would urge my uh, fellow members of the council to support this, but then I would like uh, your worship to be recognized for a motion arising when this uh, item is complete on this. Thank you, your worship. Thanks, Alderman Stevenson. Did I have a seconder? Alderman Jones, thank you. Alderman Chabot, and then I have a question for Mr. Cope. Thank you, Your Worship. Well, maybe um, Alderman Stevenson can address this. There's been some issues raised by the Saddle Ridge Community Association as well as the Martindale Community Association on things that they don't support in this current application. And I probably should have asked Mr. Chu to address this issue, but hopefully Mr. Stevenson can address it in his close. Uh, but Mr. Cope, have any of these issues raised by the two community associations been incorporated into this? Yes, as indicated, the actual access to the site is uh, temporary from 80th Avenue. Right in, right out. Uh, right in, right, well, likely right in, right out. Uh, it's not divided at the current time. Uh, once it's fully developed, I believe it is a, a divided roadway. Yes, that's correct. Uh, the long-term access will come from the north from an internal road network, so I believe most of their issues will be addressed. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. That was actually my question too, Mr. Cope. I did notice that uh, there was one strange note that talks about the height of the dome versus the airport guidelines. I imagine that that has been sorted, yes? Uh, not yet. Uh, that would uh, form part of the development permit review. Uh, certainly there is certain restrictions on height for anything in proximity to the airport. Uh, part of the development permit circulation will include uh, circulation to the airport authority as well as to Transport Canada. If there are any issues with uh, height in excess of what's allowed under the airport vicinity district, uh, that will be accounted for as part of the development permit. Thank you, Mr. Cope. Uh, anyone else before I call on Alderman Stevenson to close? Alderman Stevenson? Thank you, Your Worship. Um, yeah, the letters from the community associations date back to 09, and I talked to um, Saddle Ridge uh, yesterday about this. What the concerns are, are twofold. One is the um, uh, the stormwater retention, and of course, what what has had happened is the applicant has um, uh, put stormwater retention for their site on the on the site, right, Mr. Cope? That's correct. And so, when the uh, land is acquired for the uh, site for stormwater retention for the whole cell, then at that point, then there's a possibility they'd be able to use that land for development at that point. The other point is that the uh, uh, access by road, of course, the contract is out right now. Construction is underway on the building of Métis Trail and of 80th Avenue, and that it will be a divided um, road. Uh, 80th Avenue will be as of this coming year. 
Uh, so what has to happen now is <clears throat> we give them the temporary access right in and right out, but with the motion arising that I'm going to bring forward, uh, we, it'll be the first step towards us actually developing the road network for the entire cell D. You just see the bottom half of cell D there, but the rest of it will all be incorporated in uh, uh, an amendment to the area structure plan. So thank you, Your Worship. Closed. Thanks, Alderman Stevenson. So on the recommendations then, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Just, there we go. On proposed bylaw 17D 2011, first reading, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Second reading, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Authorization for third reading, are we agreed? <coughs> Any opposed? Carried. And third reading, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Alderman Stevenson, you have a motion arising. Thank you, Your Worship. Yes, uh, the, if the clerks could put this up on the screen. Um, there we go. So with the respect to CPC 2011-022 uh, and the bylaw, Council requests that administration be directed to investigate the project requirements and impacts, including estimated land purchase costs, construction costs, and cost recovery strategy for a permanent stormwater retention facility within cell D, and report back to uh, through a, a land and asset no later than June. This would um, be the, uh, the uh, um, securing the land for the uh, big uh, storm retention, which would take care of the entire facility, or the retire, entire cell D. So uh, um, planning has uh, put this together, so this is the first step in bringing this forward. So thank you, Your Worship. Second. Stevenson, seconded by Alderman Jones. Uh, Alderman Lowe. <clears throat> thank you, Your Worship. Uh, Mr. Watson or Mr. Cope, do we have to purchase this land for the for the stormwater retention for the whole area, or will it be dedicated? Your Worship, through the Chair, um, as can, perhaps we can put the uh, the area map back on, or if we can fl flip back, not the uh, showing the the whole. That's right. This whole area, is, as you can see, there is made up of small parcels. Uh, there needs to be a comprehensive decision made on how stormwater is going to be dealt with there. The report that will come back will out, lay out those options. I mean, if this was all owned by one owner, uh, the developer would be building the pond. And that's, then that's the genesis of my question, exactly Mr. Right. But if we don't find some way to build it in advance, I would suggest that each one of these parcels are going to have to come up with their own stormwater management systems, which is what is happening on this parcel now is a terrible use of land, frankly, if each one of them has to use about 5 or 10% of their site for stormwater retention. Well, that's my point. Um, so what would we're, not a, we're not aware of any consolidation of these lands at this point? We've had several meetings with, and in fact, we were working on a, uh, a plan to, to look at this whole cell to make it, uh, in terms of transportation and, and land uses, that's coming forward to Planning Commission. But in our conversations with the landowners, uh, there's no appetite to get together and work together on it. What we would do if council chooses to buy the land and put in a permanent stormwater facility is that we would then, there'd be a bylaw put in place and everyone as developed would have to contribute to the bylaw to pay it back. But that could be over a long period of time. So we're gonna outline all those pros and cons for uh, land and then ultimately council to decide whether or not they want to do it. And when would we see that report? Well, the first step would be in June when we start outlining the, the sort of the uh, parameters of it. If council then says, no, go ahead and try to acquire the land, of course, we'd have to need the instructions to do that. That would be the second step. And what would be the source of funding if we had to acquire it? It would probably have to come through the utilities. Through the utilities. And that is not... I'm not either That's recommending or suggesting that at this point. <laughs> I'm seeing winces from some of my colleagues around the table, yeah. Mr. Watson. No. I mean, it, it's a problem we've got in several, if Your Worship, I'm going on here, yeah, but sorry. in several places in Calgary where we have these small parcels, you either wait and don't do anything, and, and that and I, I heard, and Alderman Stevens is absolutely right, this took two years in the process. 
and in fact probably took even longer in terms of buying the parcel. But either we say we are not prepared to do anything until someone comes and buys all the land, or everybody agrees to work together. And in neither case have we got any appetite either for one by somebody <coughs> to purchase all of it or for the individual owners to work together. Thank you, Mr. It's a dilemma. Thank you, Motion. Thanks, Alderman Lowe. On the stormwater motion, Alderman Carra. Um, thank you. I just want to reiterate General Manager Watson's um, statement that it would be extremely unfortunate if we required site-specific stormwater management. And as a preview of coming contractions to my sort of uh, notice of motion interrupt us, it would be nice if we had a uh, system in place that could uh, compel in a very positive way landowners to work together and find collective solutions. These small partial issues are something that, you know, come into play in Greenfield growth, but really incapacitate inner city redevelopment. And that's what my notice of motion will be support will will be addressing as an innovation project. But in the meantime, I think it's really important to at least lay out some possibilities for how these people could work together in a way that makes dollars and cents for everyone, them, the surrounding communities, and the city. I'll be supporting this motion. Thanks, Alderman Carr. Alderman Chabot? Oh, just very simply, Your Worship, I wanted to see the motion uh, on the overhead, if we could, so that I can read it over again. Thank you. Just bear with me for a moment before no you problem. call a question, if you don't mind. Uh, you still got the floor. Thank you for that, Your Worship. So cell D, I, I can assume, is that entire parcel there with like, I don't know, 10 or 12 different landowners, is that correct? 30 cells? 36. 36. Okay, so it's looking for a, uh, a comprehensive strategy, right, to dealing with stormwater. Excellent. I think this addresses uh, the issues that were raised by Alderman Carra. So, thank you. Thank you. Any, any further debate on this item? Alderman Stevenson, did you want to close? Close. Close. Very well then. On this motion arising, are we agreed? agreed. Any opposed? <coughs> Carried. That now takes us to item 7.8 in your agenda, disposal of reserve on Saddle Ridge Industrial, CPC 2011-23. Mr. Cope. Thank you, Your Worship. Madam Clerk, can you? Can you switch back to his? There we go. Thank you, Your Worship. Proposed redesignation and disposal of reserve is in, affects the lands outlined in red and actually is affecting the area bounded by 76th Avenue and 72nd Avenue Northeast, Metis Trail on the east, and 42nd Street on uh, northeast on the west. Proposed uh, disposition of reserve affects the entire block except for that portion uh, located in the extreme northwest corner which is the current site of the former Saddle Ridge Community Hall. The disposition will allow the lands to be redesignated from the current uh, SSPR district to SCRI district to allow for the construction of a stormwater uh, detention facility. The lands affected, which was the location of the uh, stormwater area, are shown in blue. The area along Métis Trail, shown in gray, will be used for road widening for Métis Trail. And there's a small portion in the very corner uh, of the uh, remaining SSPR, which will be disposed of to allow for road widening in that location to provide access to the internal parcels. In considering the application, CPC noted that there will be compensation uh, uh, to the uh, reserve fund for those lands being disposed of and uh, in that respect are supportive of that uh, with the redesignation to SCRI to allow for the uh, stormwater retention facility. In that respect, they are recommending that Council adopt by resolution uh, the uh, disposition of 8.938 hectares of land uh, from uh, Community Reserve 
removing that designation at land titles and are also asking that the council direct a designated officer to ensure that that is undertaken at land titles. Secondly, they are recommending that council adopt the proposed redesignation of 7.88 hectares uh, from the existing SSPR Special Purpose School Park and Com Community Reserve District to SCRI Special Purpose City and Regional Infrastructure District to allow for the construction of the uh, uh, stormwater uh, retention facility and that three readings be given to bylaws, uh, to bylaw 18D 2011 in that respect. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Hodges, on a question of clarification. Yes. Thank you, Worship. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Cope, uh, on page one, right-hand column, second paragraph down, there's reference to a, a stormwater management system, not just a stormwater pond, but a stormwater management system. What's being contemplated? I do not have the details. I'm not sure if there's anybody from urban development here today or not, but I believe this pond will be servicing an extensive area between 36th Street Northeast and Métis Trail and will be serving all those uh, currently uh, former acreage and current uh, acreage industrial type parcels as a comprehensive facility. Well, I could have assumed that too, uh, but unless the water's coming overland, I take it there'll be a piped stormwater system or pumps to get it over to this site? I don't have the details on the mechanisms involved. Do we know how big the proposed pond or the proposed system will be? I mean, just on this site alone? Uh, it'll uh, occupy the majority of the area that's outlined in red in this location map. There is activity on the site right now doing stripping and grading, uh, which is essentially using up that entire area. And it's only a short distance south of the uh, application we just dealt with, uh, 17D 2011, which uh, calls for a pond and for a on Alderman Stevens' motion arising, a study of the stormwater issues for 36 parcels just northeast of this site. That's I correct. Think, I think Mr. Watson may mile. have an answer for you here. Through the chair, if I could help Alderman Hodges, we did investigate that. But part of the problem is in this northeast area, the land is very, very flat. There's very little gradient anywhere. Because of Metis Trail, we did investigate the idea of maybe we can somehow get it from one side to the other side, but it just, it just does, isn't going to work. This one will deal with the land. This is both west and south from the previous site, and this pond deals with all the industrial land on this side. You're absolutely right. There is some. There is a distribution network to get it to the pond, but we can't so use but, it. But, Mr. Watson, to reflect a bit on your previous comments, who's ultimately going to fund all of this? Who's, sorry, who's going to fund? Who's going to, this is a major project. Well, no, the, this is being done through the utilities, I believe, and this one will be uh, the landowners that are going to benefit from it as that industrial land is developed. They're going to be contributing to it. So we'll have the a system of uh, local benefit bylaw or acreage assessments, one or the other? I would imagine so. I, I can certainly get the details on it. We are if not, I was a landowner up there, I'd be rubbing my hands in glee. Well, no, I don't think there's Here's too many landowners rubbing their hands in glee. At least the ones that talk to me at, when they come into the counter aren't rubbing their hands. But I can certainly find out the details. <coughs> about, and certainly this one has been planned for some period of time. And the benefiting landowners will be paying for it. There's, there's no facility for the city simply to build stone ponds for free for anybody, frankly. Well, if an appeal arrives at the SGAB on these this or related issues, you'll you, will be, you will be the first person I'll, I'll, I will tell you about it. I'd love to come to SDAB. We can arrange that. <laughs> oh, Alderman Marr, you're putting the cat among the pigeons yet again. Alderman Keating. Thank you, Your Worship. I wonder if you could just clarify some uh, <laughs> differences between community reserve and municipal reserve, what the uses are and what is the difference? Uh, yes, uh, Your Worship. The uh, community reserve was a uh, terminology that was used prior to, I believe, 1976 in the Municipal Government Act. It performs the same function as what we now call municipal reserve. So therefore, the same criteria for disposition is required under the current act. 
So these are basically exactly the same, just different terms? That's correct. Okay. And the uh, money in lieu, uh, where is that coming from, compensation? and? Uh, um, maybe I'm not sure whose pocket that is coming from. Uh, part of the requirement, uh, I expect any arrangements would be negotiated through our corporate properties group. So I'm clear we're actually disposing of municipal reserve land for a different purpose than what was originally intended? That's correct. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman Keating. Alderman Chabot? Yes, thank you, Your Worship, and uh, thank you, Alderman Keating. Actually, you picked up on a point that I had some questions about specifically, and that's in regards to that money in lieu. Exactly where is that pot of money coming from? Who deposited to this money in lieu? Um, it does make reference here that the approve the request by corporate properties and buildings and transportation, which kind of suggests to me that they're the holder of this money in lieu, I would assume. That's correct. And um, so then that raises the question about the appraised value at, of 280000 I thought we had a specific number that we used for acquiring and disposing of, of uh, road right-of-way, and that seems high to me. I'm presuming that the uh, the amount that has been arrived at here is based on a um, independent uh, appraisal, which is done within 30 days of the application being made, similar to what we would do for cash in lieu of reserve at a subdivision stage. Yeah. No, I, I and I don't disagree with the appraised value, based on that it was developable lands. But when we're talking about road right of way, typically, and correct me if I'm wrong. Um, your worship or Mr. Watson or whomever, typically when we acquire road right of ways or dispose of road right of ways, we have a specific number that we use to make that determination. And this goes far beyond that. To the chair, that's not my understanding. Sorry, Alderman Chabot. My understanding is that there is an appraisal based on location, based on a number. I mean, the each piece of road right away that is purchased from a private individual is negotiated and it's not mm -hmm. one particular number and when we dispose of it, the same thing happens. Yeah, well, you know what, honestly, um, respectfully, um, I would certainly like to get some feedback from corporate properties on this issue before, before voting on it. So if possible, and I don't know if anybody's willing to uh, back me uh, as a seconder on this, I, I'd like to table this matter if possible until after the lunch break so we can possibly get some clarification from corporate properties on what we typically do for disposition and acquisition of, land, of road right of way. This, in my opinion, this is higher worship. So I'd like to make a motion to table I, this. I, I wonder if there's anyone lunch. in the room who can answer that question. I'm looking over at the chairman of the joint use. She's shaking her head. Okay. <laughs> um, so we have a motion then to table this one until Thank immediately you. after. <laughs> It was very subtle, very subtle, Alderman <laughs> Chabot, <laughs> until immediately after lunch. After the, Park Hill after the Park Hill matter, why don't we do it after Alderman Chabot's notice of motion after lunch? Does that sound good? Absolutely. Okay, right. seconded by Alderman Kali Urquhart. Are we agreed? Yeah. Yeah. Are we agreed? Agreed. Any opposed? All right, so this we'll deal with after uh, Alderman Karaz's notice of motion immediately after lunch. So that then takes us to, where does that take us? Uh, CPC 2011-024, 7.9 in your agenda. Mr. Cope. <coughs> Thank you, Your Worship. Proposed redesignation affects the lands outlined in red, which are accessed from Rivercrest Crescent, uh, uh, just off of Glenmore Trail Southeast. There is no access to Glenmore Trail Southeast from the subject lands. Proposed redesignation will take the lands from the existing RC2 Residential Contextual One Dwelling District and SFUD Special Purpose Future Urban Development District and redesignate the lands to MCG with a density of 50 units per hectare uh, to allow for multi-residential contextual grade oriented development. The uh, parcel in question is uh, a leftover from the River Bend development. Uh, future development to the west will be for four park areas and 24th Street. Uh, therefore, this has been an isolated residential parcel. This will allow for the area to be cleaned up and developed in, conjunct in a similar vein as the existing development within the River Bend residential community. Parcel is showing up, they're showing you the current condition 
of the subject site, uh, which could use some, uh, obviously, uh, renewal prospects. In that respect, uh, Calgary Planning Commission is recommending that Council adopt the proposed redesignation from the RC2 and SFUD to MCG D50 multi-residential contextual grade oriented district and that three readings be given to proposed bylaw 19D2011. Photos above uh, showing you right now are the actual location of the future Glenmore Trail alignment and development area. Thanks Mr. Cope. Uh, any questions of clarification? All right then, are there any members of the public who wish to speak in favor of this proposal? Your Worship Council members, my name is Tom Forzani and uh, I'm the owner of uh, Calbion Properties and is here to answer any of your questions. Thanks Mr. Forzani, any questions for Mr. Forzani? Gosh, we're letting all the applicants off easy today. Thank you, sir. Anyone else wish to speak in favor of this proposal? Anyone wish to speak in opposition to this proposal? All right then, anyone care to move the Alderman Carra? Hi, this is a uh, process that sort of has gone back and forth with the community association. I know there are people who live on the street who are dead set against it. Um, but we've endeavored to make the community association the place where they could engage in these conversations um, and the community association has been extremely um, proactive in addressing it. So, I mean, was the discussion, was there, Mr. Cope, was there any discussion of the community position at CPC and did that play in any way into CPC's decision? Uh, my memory, there was no specific discussion uh, with respect to uh, the input from the community. Of course, their information was presented to Planning Commission. I think it was accepted uh, at face value. Okay. Oh. Excuse me? Yeah, I will move the recommendations of CPC. Thanks very much. Uh, and three readings of the proposed bylaw. Great. Um, and Alderman Chabot is seconding. Any further discussion on this item? Very well then, on the recommendations, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Proposed bylaw 19D 2011, first reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Second reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Authorization for third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. And third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Thank you. That takes us then to 7.10 on your agenda, CPC 2011-25, Royal Vista. Thank you, Your Worship. The proposed redesignation is to take 0 0.9 hectares of land located in the Royal Vista area, an existing uh, parcel, and redesignate lands from the existing direct control district to a new direct control district, which will allow for a wider range of commercial type uses, including a building supply center. The parcel itself is located at the intersection of Royal Vista Drive Northwest and 112th Avenue Northwest. The area you see in gray is the uh, uh, Spy Hill uh, landfill site. Uh, lands to directly to the south of the site are currently not developed. The uh, one parcel in from that, uh, shown in white, is currently developed and there is a building finish being developed on the subject site uh, with a number of bays located in it. The uh, direct control incorporates a number of the items that were in the original direct control with the additional uses of building supply center and in addition to the uh, available gross uh, floor area for display incorporated. And in that respect, Calgary Planning Commission is recommending that Council adopt the proposed redesignation and that three readings be given to proposed bylaw 20D 2011. Thanks, Mr. Cope. Any questions of clarification? All right, are there any members of the public who would like to speak in favor of this proposal? Your Worship, uh, members of Council, Greg Donaldson with Brown and Associates. I'm the applicant. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Any questions for Mr. Donaldson? 
So building supply center is the proposed use here, Mr. Donaldson? Well, that would be one of the tenants we hope to get into the building. We're not certain who would move in there, but we think there's a demand for tradesmen and uh, their supplies to other tradesmen. Okay, thank you. Anyone else wish to speak in favor of this proposal? Anyone wish to speak in opposition to this proposal? Very well then, Alderman Lowe. Uh, Your Worship, I'll move the recommendation to Planning Commission in three readings of the bylaw. And uh, Mr. Donaldson pointed out the, the essential change to this is to provide, uh, if you will, a tradesman's place where a tradesman can also have an opportunity to display and, and uh, market tradesman supplies or the goods he produces. It's, uh, it's, it's a gap in our bylaw that we're filling this way. It does not alter the... Uh, the direct control bylaw with respect to the architectural controls as you saw by the building. Thank you. Great. Thanks, uh, Alderman Lowe. And Alderman Marr is seconding that. Terrific. Any further discussion on this item? Very well, then. On the recommendations, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Uh, first reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Second reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Authorization for third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried and third reading the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. That takes us to CPC 2011 7.11 on your agenda, West Hillhurst. Thank you, Your Worship. Proposed redesignation of 0 0.31 hectares in the community of West Hillhurst. It's located at the intersection of Kensington Road Northwest on 19th Street Northwest and encompasses the entire block along 19th Street uh, or face block of uh, 19th Street. Proposed designation will take the lands from the existing RC2 residential district and redesignate the lands to DC direct control district to allow for a multi residential development with associated uh, limited support commercial uses. Commercial uses will be limited to facing onto 19th Street and will be of a uh, neighborhood support type variety. The uh, land is currently occupied by a number of single detached houses. Air photo showing the uh, area right now. Lands to the north of this block are, is a local commercial district that has been there for many years. And the lands directly across the street on Kensington Road Northwest are also, also the location of a local commercial complex. Uh, in that respect, uh, the uh, area does comply with the uh, um, policy documents for the area. Uh, site photos showing uh, from the south on uh, Kensington Road, existing development at the intersection. Keep going. The existing development on the site along the face of 19th Street. Keep going. This uh, next photo will be uh, showing the north end of the site uh, at the northern extent of the proposed redesignation. As I mentioned, there is a commercial area located directly to the north, photo showing that along 19th Street, and this is a photo of the commercial land located directly to the east. In that respect, Calgary Planning Commission has considered the items uh, and is recommending that Council adopt the redesignation from RC2 to DC Direct Control with the guidelines as attached, and that three readings be given to Bylaw 21D 2011. I do note, I believe there is a uh, public submission objecting to the proposed redesignation that form part of your agenda package. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Mr. Cope. Questions of clarification, Alderman McLeod? Oh, you want to? Why don't we wait a second until they're settled? <laughs> uh, questions of clarification for administration on this one? All right, then, is there anyone here who would like to speak in favor of this proposal? Good morning, Your Worship, members of Council. My name is Tracy Beeling of Nora Architects Planners, and I'm here to address any questions you may have on behalf of the applicant. Thanks very much. Any questions? We really are letting people uh, 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 Well, Your Honor. Oh, Your Worship. sorry. Alderman Putmans. Thank you. You didn't put your light on, Alderman Putmans. Oh, I hit the microphone. <laughs> microphone. Um, 
Yes, I noticed the community association's letter was dated November 29. Have you had a chance to address some of the issues they've raised? Uh, we have. We've had several meetings with the community association, and um, particularly to address some concerns associated with traffic and um, and shadowing impacts. And those have those have been addressed. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? Thank well, you. Just to follow. Oh, up. Alderman Hodges. Yes, Your Worship. Just to follow up, Ma'am, how did you address them? This application is not tied to plans. No. Um, with respect to a specific issue or? Well, say shadowing. Um, the, DC, the, the DC was crafted to um, address the building setbacks and building step back. That's why um, in the CPC package, there's a diagram illustrating the, uh, the setbacks specified in the DC. And that we've tested the shadow impacts and those setbacks will, uh, will address any concerns. And parking underground, I take it? Yes, there is underground parking. And does it meet the bylaw? It does. And visitor parking, same? Yes. Thank you. <coughs> Thanks, Alderman Hodges. Alderman Farrell? Thank you. Perhaps you could go through some of the, the processes you went through with the community. They initially um, weren't happy with the envelope that was was originally proposed and there's been significant work on behalf of the applicant and the community to come to uh, to some agreement so perhaps some explanation in that area would be helpful sure uh, an original uh, the original application uh, called for um, higher density and um, and there was some discussion with the uh, community association several meetings with the community association particularly with respect to the traffic impacts of, of this higher density infill development. And um, although the city transportation department did not require a traffic impact assessment, um, we did complete a traffic assessment and uh, sp which specifically addressed some of the community's concerns related to access and uh, trip generation rates. So the uh, traffic impact assessment looked at a very conservative, um, a conservative analysis based on suburban rates and it was deemed that the local road network would handle the uh, handle the increased traffic. Um, there was ongoing. We had several meetings with the community association and um, and contacted adjacent landowners, and we didn't we didn't have any uh, opposition. So beyond the traffic impacts, though, you've changed the envelope considerably. That's right. Yeah. So help me out here. <laughs> okay. the, the, um, there's been significant movement on behalf of the applicant in fine-tuning the application to address the specific concerns of the agreement or of the, of the application and the community. That's right. Um, the building envelope on the, uh, on the west side, for example, uh, the setback is, is very clearly defined. It, there's a... Actually, maybe if I take a... So this diagram illustrates uh, the, the requirements of the DC in terms of the building step back and uh, setback. And the purpose of this envelope was to prevent any shadowing on the adjacent property to the west. So with this, uh, this building envelope is very clearly defined in the DC. Uh, so the intent is to, is to achieve this. So the building step backs quite significantly on the west side to avoid uh, the shadow impacts on okay thank you and you've you've tested it out with some schemes um, although they're not in the application because we're talking about land use you've tested out this envelope to show what what a, a, a finished building could look like based yeah. on uh, on the land use not that we need to see them today it's well, there we go. Um, but yes, so you work with the community. I want to thank you for your work because it initially started out where the community was quite concerned about about the application, and I think you've you've done a lot to uh, to um, help them with their concerns. So thank you. Thanks, Alderman Farrell. Alderman McLeod.
It's my privilege today to introduce City Hall class for this week. There are 24 grade six students from Corpus Christi School, accompanied by their teacher, Alana Karpchuk Park. And their focus this week is what does it mean to be a responsible citizen? It's a great topic, so welcome, thank you. Welcome to all of you. Stand up. <laughs> Nice to see you all, and as Alderman Farrell always reminds us, you've just been on TV. Alderman Keating, I think you had something to say. Thank you, Your Worship, and, and I do at this time um, ask for Council's uh, patience, um, because it's not often that we're able to <clears throat> tell some stories about the students standing here, and, and I've asked Alderman McLeod if I could help her with her introduction. So as uh, ex-principal of Corpus Christi School, uh, I do have some stories, and, and the, uh, so I have a few stories and then there will be a question of a test at the end, <laughs> just to make it encompassing. So, <sighs> unfortunately. Principals don't give tests. <laughs> so I would like to talk about the, um, the first time I, I stood in front of Corpus Christi and we had an assembly. And we're talking about welcoming all new members, <clears throat> uh, much like you did, uh, Your Worship, at our first council meeting where I stood up and I welcomed all the new students to the school and all the new staff, and I happened to be one of them. Uh, unfortunately, in uh, honesty and openness of being a responsible citizen, one kindergarten student stood up uh, quite serious and said, you're not new, you're old. <laughs> so here I am um, standing there uh, and then of course we go through that and the uh, librarian happens to have a trivia contest on a weekly basis and she comes up right after me and the trivia question today was, what's the oldest thing on the world? And of course, immediately 300 eyes all shifted to me standing off to the side. So, you know, open and honesty is one thing, but then we can go to the next story um, where I had a young girl in my office who was having a bit of a difficulty on that day uh, and we're descaling, you might say, and working through some issues and I gave her a picture, an eight by 10, with 100 plus uh, principals and administrators in the picture, so each of our heads are, you know, this big. Uh, and I said, please find, you know, see if you can find me in the picture. Um, so she looks at it and, and quite surprisingly quickly looks up with a puzzled look on her face. And she asks, uh, what would you look like when your hair was dark? And so again, open and honesty is another question that we would like to go forward. Uh, there was probably the last year that I was there that we had uh, some very bright green shirts that said Corpus Christi Talents Under the Sun and uh, these sorts of things. Uh, and I was wearing mine in the hallway and a young child uh, stops me and looks at and she says, you know, you look like a turtle. And I wasn't quite sure if she meant the color or, or the shape of the shell, but either way, we had some great times. So the question is, um, I gave up all that for this. Is that a test for my sanity, Your Worship? I'm not quite sure, but uh, I do want to welcome them, and it's great to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Keating, depending on how the rest of the, rest of the day goes, you and I both, both may be back in the classroom sooner than, uh, sooner than later. And thank you for your patience with that, ma'am. Any other questions for the applicant? All right, anyone else who wishes to speak in favor of this proposal? Mayor and Councillors, Aldermen, my name is George Trutina, and uh, George Trutina with Roman Development. I don't know if I need to be in favor of it, but I'm, I'm in favor. Let's hope economy is there. Let's get this built. Thank you, Drew Farrell, for a big support. We worked quite a long time on this, made lots of changes, accommodated the neighbors, last few units on it. I appreciate your help. So I look for your support. Thank you. Thanks. Any questions for Mr. Trutina? Thank you very much, sir. Anyone who wishes to speak in opposition to this? Oh, I should say anyone else who wishes to speak in support of this proposal? Anyone who wishes to speak in opposition to this proposal? Your Worship, Council, my name is Peter Leonard. I'm a resident of 
19th, uh, 19th Street. Um, I and some of my other neighbors who chat about this are concerned about the precedent that this might set. The image that we saw earlier had a four-story building. Most of the buildings around there are two stories. Um, and while this, this building might not cause shadowing on nearby properties, further development in that area might uh, might eventually move down the street to affect other people. Uh, and we're, so we're concerned very much as to, uh, also concerned to all the, uh, all the increased in parking that might, there's not an overabundance of parking on 19th Street and with 50 or 60 units put on that street, it might, uh, people might start parking a lot more on the street. A nearby house has a, uh, that's for rent, uh, that the, the owners rented out. They all of a sudden, they, one house has parks several vehicles on the street. And while this, while this residence might have uh, enough parking for one stall for most of the units, it, a lot of people own more than one vehicle and that could crowd the street. Anyways, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm not sure I caught your surname. Leonard. Leonard. Thanks, Mr. Leonard. Any questions for Mr. Leonard? Alderman Moore? Thank you, Mr. Leonard. And that was actually my first question, Your Worship, as well. I didn't catch your name either. Uh, could you indicate on the map, by any chance, where, where you are in uh, relationship to the site? If mm -hmm. you don't mind. Further north. Uh, probably closer to the West Hillhurst Community Center. Closer to Fifth Avenue, then? Yeah. Okay, so you're, like, off the map, then? Yes. Right. Okay. So you're you're really concerned about this being the thin ed edge of the wedge. Yes. That's that's what I'm hearing. Yes. Um, and are you a member of the community association, or did you attend any of the meetings at all? Uh, I att I've attended one previously where they were discussing designs for the building. Mm -hmm. uh, I work out of town, so I don't often get to go to things that I I want to go to. Right. No. I mean, obviously, there's demands for time, and mm -hmm. and and, uh, and I appreciate that. I was just curious. Uh, now, Planet Calgary, which is the, the new municipal development plan that we've implemented, or sorry, we haven't implemented, that we passed, and this is sort of a test of that scenario. Should we be densifying in the inner city? Should we be looking at a nodes and corridor strategy? And this is exactly what we're talking about when we're talking about a corridor. Kensington Road, which is a, um, a, a large development, or sorry, a, a large major thoroughfare, the development here talks about also having a mixed use as well as having all of the parking self-contained and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So it should be, in theory, uh, something that not only supports itself in terms of the parking, but also supports the neighborhood. And what we heard from the administration and also the applicant, that it would be something like a coffee shop, a barber, things of that nature, which would... We have a coffee local. shop and a barber just for there are just further down the street well i i'm but i mean yes i understand I, but th those types of supportive uses is that something that generally you're supportive of or are you um sort of opposed to densification in 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 this area i can see the benefit of densification if, if that's a real word uh but it's uh i mean that could be accomplished with townhouses and the houses that are there are suitable for small starting families, whereas condo developments are generally for single individuals and young couples. And this is a nice neighborhood for families that are starting out. These mm -hmm. small little houses are, are good starter houses for young people who have children or are planning on having children. Mm -hmm. Well, my first test was very similar to those ones that, that, that are uh, in the picture. So I, I understand what you're saying about affordability and, and what you're saying about uh, trying to maintain that, that neighborhood character. But I was just curious as to what your thoughts were with regards to, to densification of the inner city as well as where you were in relationship to the site. I, I don't have objections to densification and I, or small businesses. I just, I, I, well, you know, I just don't want a four-story condo building going up next to me uh, uh, next year. Mm -hmm. And it, so it's... It seems to seems reasonable to. You're concerned, you're concerned about creep, and I appreciate yeah. that. Uh, those are my questions. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alderman Marr. Um, just keeping an eye on the clock here. I'll remind Council that we've got five minutes, so do keep your questions short. Alderman Carr. 
largely asked and answered. I mean, I appreciate your concerns. As a citizen, you're seeing densification, but you don't understand what it's part of and how it fits into a comprehensive plan and how it impacts your neighborhood. And it's just, I guess, a uh, another teaser for my notice of motion interrupt us, but we'll be getting to that. And thank you for coming out today. I'm not sure I heard a question mark there, Mr. Leonard. So, uh, Alderman Farrell? I said asked and answered. Thank you, thank you for coming today, sir. I, I, um, I wanted to assure you that if you're, if you're up by where the West Hillhurst Community Association, um, if there was any attempt in the future to upzone that area, there would have to be an extensive um, consultation. This has been going on, this consultation, for at least two years that I recall. And so it, it wouldn't, um, I, I don't see it as the thin edge of the wedge. So I just wanted to uh, assure you that that wouldn't be the case. But I, I appreciate your concern. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for taking the time to come out, Mr. Leonard. It's important that citizens have their voices heard, so thank you for being here. Anyone else wish to speak in opposition to this proposal? All right, then. Alderman Farrell. Thank you. Well, I will um, move the item and three readings of it. And I, I wanted to thank the Community Association and the, and the applicant for working together and keeping an open mind on both sides for a very important corner you look at Kensington Road, it, it has tremendous potential. Um, that is unrealized at this time. And I think the, um, there's been a pretty good compromise. What we're seeing on 19th Street is actually something quite exciting, which is a really successful, burgeoning local retail. And the community is quite excited about the potential of 19th and the potential of West Hillhurst as far as planet is concerned. But I want to assure the, the residents who came who were concerned about that, that there will be a, maybe even a laborious process if we want to move forward with any other changes. I also want to assure the community that the applicant has agreed to, the, to sign the developer code of conduct. I think that was one of the concerns from from some of the letters is what's the um, what's the construction going to be like and what's the impact on construction to our community so the code of Con conduct helps address that and um, I'm looking forward to uh, moving forward with the DP thank you thanks Alderman Farrell uh, as someone who walked on that particular street corner every day for all of my high school years uh, I certainly agree with you about the importance of getting it exactly right uh, on that corner Alderman Moore just Briefly, Council, this is exactly what we were talking about when we were saying that we believe in Planet Calgary or we don't. This is a corridor. This is uh, not necessarily something that we should be afraid of. We are moving forward for density because we know that we are increasing our population, probably doubling our population in the next 25 years. Uh, we need to find creative solutions to house people. We need to also respect the neighborhood and the character and understand the implications that this density has. But I'm going to support this because I believe it is the right thing to do. I believe it will enhance the neighborhood. And I also believe that if we're going to move forward on the strategy for Planet Calc, we need to do it courageously and without looking back. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman Marr. Any further discussion on this item? Very well then, on the recommendations, are we agreed? agreed. Any opposed? Carried. On first reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Second reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Authorization for third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? agreed. Any opposed? Carried. And third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? agreed. Any opposed? Carried. I'll take a motion to recess now until 1.30. Thanks, Alderman Stevenson. Second, and Alderman Putmans. All, are we agreed? Carried, we'll see you back here at 1.30. And we're back. So uh, according to our earlier tabling, we are now take, 
excuse me, item 10.1.2, notice of motion re Mission Road Neighborhood Main Street Project, Alderman Carra. Uh, it was under notices of motion and you will have had uh, an additional, you would have had an additional document on terms of reference <coughs> distributed to you before the lunch break. Uh, just before you jump up, Alderman Carr, Alderman Collier Cart, I just see your light. Uh, no, Your Worship, it's asking questions on this item. On this item? All right. Why don't you introduce it, Alderman Carr? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, oh, oh, and I should say I'm sorry. We have a small procedural problem with your notice of motion. Okay. Um, because there are two um, items, two uh, recommendations. Thank you. After lunch, I have trouble with English. Two recommendations, and the first one is a recommendation to table, which is a non-debatable recommendation. So what I'm going to suggest is I'll let you introduce the topic, uh -huh. and then um, perhaps we will take the recommendation separately, but you'll put the second one first so that we can have a debate about it. I think that's a brilliant idea. Okay. I think there's also an amendment to uh, to this notice of motion that uh, Alderman Keating will be bringing forward. Okay. Just a couple of minor adjustments. This thing's been very fluid. We've been putting it together quickly. All right. All right. We'll play it fast and loose and try and get through this uh, while staying on side with procedure. All right. Well, first off, to my council colleagues and to uh, people in the gallery, I apologize for not having the terms of reference in front of you. That was my mistake as a newbie alderman. Um, you have it in front of you now, and what this uh, terms of reference, this notice of motion, this request for tabling all represent is an exciting uh, draw, a potential draw on our innovation fund to really challenge and potentially change the way we do inner city development and potentially how we do development across Calgary. Now, I come from an urban design background, and what I've found is that you have to get the design and the process by which you achieve that design and then the rules and regulations that allow that design to take place into a level of collaboration that we don't currently achieve. Um, my terms of reference uh, takes a look at this uh, section of Mission Road and it's a historic it's a historic corridor. It's called Mission Road because that's where the uh, First Nations people actually traveled to the Oblate Fathers in the Mission area. And it today is a place where two neighborhoods meet. It's, it's technically all within Park Hill, but structurally it's where Earlton and Park Hill come together, much like the 19th Street corridor where different neighborhoods within West Hillhurst meet. Um, and so wherever you go in North, uh, wherever you go in Calgary, you can see this sort of at those active scenes where Mission and Cliff Bungalow meet. You have the main street of 4th Street where Sunnyside and Hillhurst meet, you have the main street of Kensington. Um, and so the big question is how do we get this idea of an active street in a walkable neighborhood in line with something that makes dollars and cents for the development industry, in line with a vision that communities can get behind. Um, and what this innovation project, what these terms of references are attempting to do is basically achieve four potential benefits. Uh, find a way to streamline inner city redevelopment. Number two, streamline inner city development while also maintaining a meaningful and even more meaningful public process than we have right now. I personally find it a little bit frightening that our attempts to streamline involve cutting community voices out rather than empowering them. And what this does is it puts them at the front of the process and then streamlines the back end when, when decisions are being made. Um, it addresses the issue that was also addressed today of how do you take disparate parcels owned by multiple owners and achieve a vision that works collectively while also respecting individual property rights. And it sort of achieves the holy grail for both the development industry and communities and that is it establishes a great deal of certainty in terms of what you're going to get but also allows uh, flexibility and that addresses the uh, question I asked earlier about uh, um, uh, uh, I'm spacing on the term, but discretionary uses versus permitted uses. So what this terms of reference asks is that we take this particular part of the city, this seam of Mission Road, and we examine its potential for upzoning within the context of a main street. And we're looking at a three-part process. We're looking at a design charrette process to bring all the players together and achieve a design 
uh, very collaboratively. Um, it talks about establishing a smart code to regulate it, which is a different alternative form of land use regulation that's being adopted across North America by cities that really want to empower inner city development. And then it also has a component that's a financial market study to figure out a way to, A, to make sure it's pencil, it pencils out, and then to figure out a way to do public realm improvements in a way where everyone pays an equitable share. And uh, we're looking at doing this over the course of the next year. The history of this, of course, is that we tabled uh, CPC 2011-02 in January till now, and we took that time to put together these terms of reference and work extensively with the community, with the landowners being affected, and with administration to establish a terms of reference that everyone can get behind and is willing to gamble on. And this is, this is contemplating a year-long process that potentially could replace our current multi-year process. Um, and then the other thing that we did was uh, two Saturdays ago, we ran a World Cafe visioning session with the community. It was a very, very snowy Saturday morning from 9 till noon. I was worried that no one was going to show up. We had a tremendous amount of people show, show up and a tremendous amount of enthusiasm about addressing their neighborhood in a proactive and collaborative way. So I really believe that this is the future of planning. I believe that we have the opportunity to draw the ask $300,000 from the Innovation Fund to hire a consultant team who's well versed in doing this kind of work and then work through with the communities and administration and working out the bugs. And, and hopefully, I'm very confident that this will lead to major transformation in how we address redevelopment issues. But. Um, my motion should hopefully be on the screen at some point. And no, it's not, it's in our agenda. Yeah, did you revise it from the notice of motion in the agenda? Yeah, so we don't have the notice of motion up, just so we have something to talk to. And I think Alderman Keating is willing to uh, make a couple of minor adjustments to that in keeping with the discussions we've had with the community and the uh, landowners. All right, hold on, hold on, hold on. Don't sit down yet. Let's just get this right. It says July 26th public hearing. Um, I noticed that the, uh, the actual terms of reference suggest December 5th public hearing. Or is it an, oh, it's an interim report in July. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's actually, that notice of motion is the revised one. So if, if that's what's up there, that's, okay. that's the amended version. Okay. So procedurally, we were going to just, I was going to put the original notice of motion up, and Alderman Keating was going to move the, the amendments. And then as per his worship's suggestion, I would be interested in uh, putting whereas number one, second. You know, because it's a notice of motion, Alderman Carra, it's, it's procedural funhouse today. Okay. Because it's a notice of motion, uh, you, you can just put the revised version. Okay, I'm going to do that then. All right. So then the changes are the, the third whereas has a minor change, whereas it used to read, um, whereas the community consultation has demonstrated that there is a desire to undertake a more comprehensive planning and design study to determine the feasibility of creating a mixed-use main street along Mission Road prior to rendering decisions or prior to rendering a decision on individual development applications, we're changing that to say along Mission Road as a potential alternative to rendering individual decisions on individual development applications. And then the second thing is we've asked for an interim report to come on July 26th to um, that it returned to council on July 26, 2011 with an interim report to council through the SBC on LPT uh, about July 20th. Could you, could you just change public hearing to combined meeting, please? By because all means. You probably don't want this to go to a public hearing if it's an interim report. Yeah, by all means. Can but I, the, the, the point is to allow the communities and the landowners to weigh in at LPT to make sure that we are on track and everyone's still incredibly supportive of this and that we haven't gone off the rails. Okay. Alderman Carroll, while you're standing, could you just say a little bit more about the amount for which you're asking? It seems awfully high to me for um, a small street. So. Okay. Is, is your thought that this would help the city develop skills in this area, or would every small street need a three hundred thousand dollars? No, study? no, no. The idea is that I think that this is this is the sort of ballpark to do a full neighborhood rollout, and I think that what what this is is this is really an in-depth 
exploration and skill development session. This is an attempt to go all out and bring in the best consultants from across North America to, to really teach us how the cutting edge planning is being done and to work extensively with administration on this. So yeah, I agree, it's a very small chunk of, of real estate. And I will say that the terms of reference have been amended slightly over the last week because at the public, at the public uh, visioning session, there was a lot of talk about the connection to the LRT station. And that has to be part of the uh, scope of consideration as well. So yeah, it's, uh, it, it, is, it is a chunk of change, but it is a very small chunk of change that could have transcendent impact. Your Worship, can we just confirm the date? Uh, there is no meeting on July the 26th. Okay. Uh, it's a regular meeting on July the 25th. And the combined July meeting is July 4th. Let's do the regular meeting on July 25th because this doesn't have to come to a public hearing. Yep. Regular meeting on the 25th? Okay. Is that all right with you, Alderman Crow? Absolutely. Okay. Thank you Thank, for thanks, participating in Fun House Day with me here. <laughs> every, <laughs> time, Alderman Crow, every time, Alderman Crow, every time. Alderman Collier Card. Should I sit? Yes. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Well, uh, oh, hold on one sec, Alderman. Call your card. Sorry, I didn't get a seconder for that. Alderman Keating, thank you. Please go ahead. Thank you, Your Worship. The uh, actually, I had uh, Alderman uh, Kara join me at um, the Fish Creek Lacombe uh, TOD initiative that Council approved to look at future development around that site. It was very helpful, and that's when I first heard of this uh, of this big idea. And it is exciting. Um, but let me, this is my problem. The, uh, we came up with the innovation fund. And uh, right away, uh, and I'm looking at the engagement for business planning and budgeting, uh, Alderman uh, Lowe and DeMong uh, directed a withdrawal of $2.5 million from the innovation fund. Now, the closest we've ever had to an innovation fund, as I recall, was the strategic initiatives fund that uh, we've managed through AOCC for communities and various groups to come forward with, with, with ideas that they have. I think it started out uh, at a million dollars, then we cut it down to 500,000. Uh, some referred to it as a slush fund, uh, which was somewhat disparaging. But what's lacking for me here, Your Worship, are the terms of reference around this innovation fund. Um, I've already been approached, uh, I'm sure Alderman Marr as well, by the Calgary Police Service who have a lot of really innovative ideas that they would like to apply to, to this fund. So now uh, I think the terms of reference that are presented here uh, are an excellent start for this project. But uh, who gets at this money? Uh, uh, is it first come, first serve? Uh, and, uh, and is there going to be a period of applications when they're received and when they're reviewed uh, as, as part of a screening process to comply with terms of reference? So this is what I need to know. I can answer that a little bit. Um, when the fund was initially designed, it was deliberately designed without a lot of process around it because the overall thought was that it was for innovation as per the name, pilot projects, and redesign of existing city processes. So we, council had agreed to set aside $5 million um, for that, for those purposes, of which we immediately took $2.5 million and put into the redesign of the business planning and budget cycles. There's two and a half left. I don't believe there's been any other draws on it. Um, so the idea was that it was deliberately left to council to make those decisions so that individual members of council or frankly people in the administration could bring forth ideas uh, that council could then debate on their own merits without having too many guidelines directing it, given that it's meant to be for innovation. We didn't want to presuppose what that innovation might look like. Um, so that was really the thinking behind it. And as a result, it would need to be first come, first serve, because the innovation is coming. Um, if you want to redesign the elements of that, uh, of the innovation fund, you know, you're welcome to do so. Council is welcome to do so. Um, but the idea was to keep it loose on purpose so that we could see what would, what would start bubbling up. So it's $5 million, Your Worship, is a lot to be loose with. Well, council still has to agree, right? Council still, they all have to come to council. There's no one else who can make the decision. So what do you think the terms of reference are around this? 
like my own personal feeling yeah yeah as i say i think that if it's for anything that is some if i can be very uh very blunt anything that is something that hasn't been done before that's really what i'm about so it's about experiments about pilots about trying new things so in my mind this particular proposal um you know without biasing the, the vote on the proposal itself but this is exactly the kind of thing that I would imagine would come up to the Innovation Fund. Other examples might include, um, you know, one thing that's been tossed around is piloting a downtown express bus service to the airport mm -hmm. for a few months and seeing how that works, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So to me, I, I was very hesitant to put more details around it precisely because I don't know what innovation means because the whole idea is to experiment, to try things that are new. Right. I, and I appreciate uh, the, the whole transformation and the innovation piece, but um, innovation is probably different to each and every one of us. And, you know, what I think is unfair about this is that, um, that we don't have a cutoff period for receiving these ideas to come forward. Um, like, if you want, uh, do it quarterly and then have a deadline and have all these come forward and then we we know, we look at all of them, and uh, so I, I'm really at a loss. I love the idea, mm -hmm. um, but um, if, and I know it's inappropriate with all these lights on to refer this back to try to have some general terms of reference, because this is so much money and half of it's already gone, and we're only uh, one month into the year. So yeah. that's the reservation I have. I, I actually quite like your idea of having an application deadline. Yeah. Um, quarterly or maybe semi-yearly, given, sure. the, given the rate that we go on. What I, you, you may certainly make a motion to refer if you like. Um, I may do that, that Just because it has a tabling motion in it procedurally, it's a bit weird, but we can do it. Um, I, I, I will wait to okay. hear other, maybe okay, I'm so the only one that has this concern uh, just because we didn't get off the mark to get something in here to be considered. Uh, I, think, I know however, how hard I had to work for the 50,000 at Fish Creek Lacombe, yeah. and now I'm being told it's not near enough to do the kind of innovation and blue skying that this area needs. So thank you. So, you know, Alderman Collier, Cart, let's, um, let's, let's hear how it goes, and I'll recognize yeah. you again if you want to make a referral motion after we hear a few more lights. But let's work together on a notice of motion to flesh this out a little bit more. I do hear your concern. I think it's a good one. Uh, Alderman Pincott. Thank you. Um, yeah, no, this is great. Uh, you, you, I'm, I, I like the terms of reference. Um, I'm quite familiar with this, as uh, that was in my ward prior to to the election. So I'm I'm aware of uh, the issue, and I, this looks like a good process. I do have uh, concerns with the amount. Certainly, three hundred thousand um, dollars is a lot of money to to be spending on 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 this project. So I would like to know, uh, just from the mover in his clothes, where. Where that number comes from, and uh, and if it is actually uh, amendable, um, the the other question I had was as I looked at the timeline within the terms of reference, it was it, it was interesting to me that the information session open house followed CPC, and I would be curious as to the rationale for having. Uh, the open houses following the item being at CPC, uh, it seems like it's a little bit backwards to me. Um, so uh, if, if I could have those two questions answered by the mover in his close, I'd appreciate it. Uh, thanks, Alderman Pincott, and I'm sure uh, Alderman Carra has taken note of those questions. Alderman Chabot. Well, I have similar concerns that... Uh, my colleague to my right has, Alderman Collie Urquhart, in regards to this fund. Um, and I find it kind of strange. This council has made reference to um, our current reserves and how they're not clearly defined enough, maybe in regards to what the money is for, how it's allocated, uh, what, the, what the cap is going to be on the fund, et cetera, et cetera. They're questioning a number of different things related to our to our current reserves, and yet we have this innovation fund that hasn't any clear definitions around what it's intended to be used, although I, I understand the mayor has a good understanding of what it means. I, I, until this very moment, wasn't sure exactly what it was intended for. There's been a lot of community associations that have fought hard and 
long and hard to try and get some money out of council for a number of different initiatives, and many of which were, in my opinion, very innovative. Um, had to go through a process. As was indicated, Council Strategic Initiative Fund is one avenue that they've pursued to get some funding for different initiatives. And of course, in most cases, when there's a community involvement, there's also an expectation that there will be a, a uh, community contribution. This doesn't clearly define exactly how this $300,000 applies to all that. Is that all of the funding? Is that part of the funding? Where did the number come from, as was indicated by Alderman Pincott? Is that going to be sufficient? And to suggest that three hundred thousand um, dollars is just a small amount. Um, well, I I don't know about you, but I don't have three hundred thousand dollars to throw around personally, so I don't think we should be spending council's money in that fashion either. So I'm likely not going to be supporting this this proposal, and look forward to hearing Alderman Collier Cart's uh, referral motion. I'll just point out one thing, um, which is that just to clarify for members of council, I uh, do recall that you did pass this innovation fund with the uh, terms of reference as sketchy as they may be um, during the budget debate. So it's not that this is brand new to council. Uh, the debate was certainly had at that time. I think Alderman Lowe moved it, as a matter of fact, if I'm not mistaken, um, who is next on the list. So he might actually agree with me or not. Um, so that's, you know, we have had that. Council, of course, has every opportunity to re uh, review those decisions to add more criteria if they would like, but uh, the debate was had at budget time. Alderman Lowe. Well, thank you, Your Worship, and uh, I think you summarized uh, our discussion pretty well before we put that money out there. I think it is appropriate, though, Alderman collier -Cart, as we move into this, and I guess as the coal light of dawn sort of comes on the on the euphoria of in the just after an election that we do put some put a frame around this so uh, but I, I think separate and distinct from this would be my suggestion the uh, my first observation listening to uh, Alderman Carra is uh, I when he talks about you know the the small street vis-a-vis -vis a whole community turnover I suspect the cost for doing a small street and a whole community is probably pretty close to one and the same when you start rolling the resources in. It, we, it more speaks to using your resources efficiently, in other words, looking at larger areas rather than these little areas to subject to a whole function like this. Your Worship, I have no difficulty what we're, what we're saying here, as I said, but what uh, the difficulty I'm having is I, in my mind, it would be appropriate to table this matter now to hear the, the CPC report because there are questions arising from the CPC report. For example, I have a significant amount of difficulty uh, tying this process up over almost a year. And I would like to know what the applicants have to say about that. So, Madam Clerk, is it appropriate then that I table this matter, bring forward the CPC report, and then uh, at the end of that, when we deal with that, we then uh, rise and deal with this one. So moved. I, I don't see a procedural bar to doing that, Madam Clerk. Is that all right? Do I have a seconder for that then? Second. Thanks, Alderman Chabot. So what the motion on the floor is, uh, just before we vote on it, because it is non-debatable, just to explain, the very next item on the agenda is a report from the Calgary Planning Commission dealing with these same issues. Um, Alderman Carraw's notice of motion has embedded in it a tabling of that report uh, pending this process. However, what Alderman Lowe's motion is suggesting is that we deal with the report now. We can still table it um, and come back to this one depending on what's in that report. Okay, is that clear? All right, so all in favor then of bringing forward the CPC report and tabling this item. Are we agreed? Any opposed? Alderman Hodges is opposed. Very well then, so that moves us then to, somebody knows the number of this report, right? Yeah, um, CPC 2011-002, item 6.3 in your agenda.
Thank sure. you, Your Worship. The proposed uh, bylaws that are before you are an amendment to the Park Hill Stanley Park uh, Area Redevelopment Plan, as well as land use designation affecting the lands outlined in red on this location map, which front onto Mission Road Southwest. The proposed redesignation is to take the lands from the existing RC2 Residential Contextual 1 and 2 Dwelling District and redesignate the lands to DC Direct Control District to com accommodate a wider range of residential densities and possibilities. Essentially, the direct control bylaw that is before you will retain the opportunities under the current RC2 residential district and also allow for a comprehensive redevelopment for uh, lower density multi residential development to occur on the site, providing access issues and parcel sizes are properly addressed. The reasons for the uh, zoning uh, are to maintain the development rights uh, from the existing low density residential uses um, while still allowing for long term possibilities of redevelopment on a comprehensive basis. And this is, reflects the fractured ownership of these lands. Um, the ARP amendment is intended to create a new district within the ARP to recognize the uh, change from the low density character of the RC2 to a new policy area called low and medium density grade oriented multi-residential district. The district uh, or the areas in the ARP uh, provide a set of rules and guidelines on how this particular area could potentially be redeveloped. It would also support the proposed land use as described. In that respect, Calgary Planning Commission is recommending that Council adopt the amendments to the ARP uh, and give three readings to bylaw 6P 2011. And secondly, to adopt the proposed redesignation from RC2 to direct control and give three readings to bylaw 2D 2011. Thanks, Mr. Cope. Any questions of clarification for administration? Everyone's lights are on, so just wave at me if you have any. Alderman Craw. Yeah, Mr. Cope, I would really appreciate if you could sort of give us the discussion that took place at CPC. I mean, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to belabor this point because I think the whole point of having a Calgary Planning Commission is to have a different set of eyes on these issues, to discuss them at length, to go back and forth over the pros and cons to have a fulsome discussion and then to bring that discussion and the recommendations coming out of that discussion before this council so we can make a final decision. What we get is a, re a pretty stale recommendation a report. What I would love to hear from you is what the discussion was, how it was informed, how it fits into our high level planning uh, objectives like Planet Calgary and where we're going from there. I'd also like to know what the community felt that this is occurring in and why and the position of planning council on that. I believe most of that information is actually contained within the CPC report. Yeah, but However, we, we, with all due respect, you are paid to come up here and talk to us and present in a public venue. So I would like to have a report. Your procedure, really. The information that Alderman Carra has asked for is in the report. There's no reason to berate staff. Maybe I can take a shot at it, Paul McCraw, if you wouldn't. If I might, I, I apologize for, for berating. No but, issue. You know, I've been, I've been asking this, I've been asking for a full report like this, and I think it's important for a public process like this. I agree that it is in the report. Um, the report does not um, necessarily uh, give us the full depth of the conversation that took place at CPC, and it doesn't deal with, with nuanced issues. And I think that's the whole point of having a CPC. And I've, I've endeavored to make that point before. And I, again, I apologize for, for, for lashing out. I, it was untoward. Mr. Watson. Uh, let me frame this, I guess. Um, as chairman of planning commission, we have certainly heard all of Kerr's concerns. And he's absolutely right, the reports there if something happens at Planning Commission and then you get a recommendation and there's not a lot more beyond that, although there's myself, generally Alderman, well not generally, almost all the time Alderman Farrell and Alderman 
role are on planning commission and certainly I, I think part of their and my duties are to respond to sort of the comments that you're making we have just so you understand uh, have been listening and we are I have asked Mr. Cope and others to start looking at our reports and think about how we can make them either fulsome or well, fulsome. nuanced I think is, is and then find a way that we can can transmit that on this particular one uh, as I remember it now this is going back a number of planning commissions and into last year there was a discussion it wasn't uh, on and on and on I certainly asked Alderman Lowe and Alderman Farrell to help my memory if I get off base on this but there was certainly a discussion it was felt that this area of property given its geographical location although in Parkdale but down in the hollow as you were between the two communities and given the state of it needed something to expand the uses and densities along there to actually see anything happen and the application that was before us gave us that opportunity uh, we I remember discussing what was being proposed in terms of the DC's in terms of whether that would provide the land use envelope we had no plans in front of us and we had not done the design exercise that was being contemplated to uh, the charrette process and the work you're, you're talking about but given the how we handle these applications which is to view them on their merits within the context of the land use by law we thought this we planning commission thought this was a, an appropriate step forward we we're well aware that the two communities had concerns but planning commission uh, I believe certainly understood the concerns but felt that this was not an unreasonable land use to put on the site and recommend to council and of course it's council that will make the final decision whether you think that is there needs to be much more design work being done but because this was a land use and that's the process that would have to wait until there was actually permits brought forward by either comprehensively or individual landowners and that's sort of where we got to uh, Mr. Cope if I missed anything or? no I think uh, the, the questions that did come out of uh, the discussion that are not in the report uh, also dealt with the fact that there is a gap in terms of the land use uh, in ownership uh, which was not included in the land use but it is included in the ARP amendment uh, and there's also some discussion on the options for actual access to the sites if it was developed as a comprehensive uh, development scheme and I'd leave it to Alderman Lowe and Alderman Farrell to add anything else if there was something I missed. Thanks, Mr. Watson. Uh, Mr. Cope, any other questions of clarification for administration? Again, I'm just looking for waves because all these lights are on. Alderman Chabot? Yeah, sorry. Mr. Cope, the lands on the, uh, on the south side of the street there, were those not subject to a road closure that we dealt with last year where there was yes actually just to the west where it says Secor 2 uh, that is a laneway which was undeveloped and not developable uh, so those lots up to uh, actually about lot 39 were all affected by the road closure and I believe the plan number there is 0811454 so that laneway has been closed yeah it's the one on top I think you're pointing to the wrong one there Mr. Orr, yeah, on top. That's closed, right? That's correct. So between 37 and 39, is there not a lot there? Uh, 37 and... Yes, the ye yellow is a lot. Is that, what does that signify? City-owned? Uh, no, it's just uh, developed with a single detached residential. They're simply not part of this land use application. What? Can I ask why we wouldn't have included that? Um, we would have liked to, however, you need authorization from the owner. And my understanding is they were not willing to participate in the process. Sorry, I might be missing something. I thought we had the ability to redesignate property without approval from the land landowner. If there is direction from council to do a city initiated uh, redesignation, uh, we can do that. Uh, it's usually in response to a uh, direction from a new area redevelopment plan or amendment plan to inform to bring that plan into effect. It just seems inconsistent that we would have a specific land use and exclude one, just one property. Okay, thanks. Thank, thanks for that answer. No further questions. Thank you, Your Worship. Thanks, Alderman Chabot. Any other questions for clarification? 
Alderman Lowe. Well, thank you, Your Worship. And I'm, I'm just going to uh, say I think Mr. Watson's summary of the conversation was very thorough. It's also important to note, Council, that Planning Commission, this is a land use. We're dealing with a land use and an application that was before it at the time. So what Alderman Carra is suggesting is a, uh, a step beyond that into another range, which of and is itself is not bad. But, but it, it's uh, important to note that Planning Commission deals with the issues and matters it has before it. Now, when you look at the vote, uh, there were five to two with uh, two members who abstained, and if I recall correctly, um, I think their, their issues were around the built form that may arise rather than, than the land use. So, uh, and, and I guess it's, it, Critic, you've heard me say this before, Your Worship and Council, when we have a land use, that's all we're dealing with, it's just the land use. So, uh, having said that, I do know that uh, the applicant will be here, and Your Worship, I, the only question I have with respect to uh, the, mo the notice of motion that's before us, it's, it's a question that I can only put to the applicant when they come up in this process, which allows me to ask the question, are they upset about taking their land use out of circulation for a year? Gotcha. Any other questions of clarification for Mr. Cope? All right, is there anyone in the public who would like to speak in favor of this proposal? Anyone who would like to speak in favor? Well, welcome back to Council Chambers. Thank you very much. Madeline King, consultant for 95, 99% of the uh, property owners. And I'm here with Steve Sparks, who um, is one of the property owners and can answer any further questions that, uh, that I can. I don't think in the circumstances I probably need to say anything about the land use application that's before you but I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Ms. King. Questions for Ms. King. Alderman Lowe. Well, thank you. Uh, Ms. King, you've heard my question. We're, we're taking this land use and effectively putting it in abeyance for a year. Yeah. Uh, may I have, do you have any indication of what your, your uh, client's view is of this, given that they paid a lot of money to get this land use? Yeah. Um, well, obviously, it hasn't been an easy question for them. It's been a long process. I see in the package um, something talking about my first presentation to the community in March 2008. So we're almost three years now. Um, so to delay it still further is difficult. And um, I had wanted it to be until July so that we could see that this process was going in the right direction. Um, I, I certainly, Alderman Kara has been able to generate a great deal of um, enthusiasm and energy. Um, the um, visioning session was amazing. There were more than 50 people, I think, there. And um, so at the moment, the property owners uh, although I have to say that the group is getting sort of split in bits, as you can imagine, because different property owners have different um, requirements from this. But on the whole, um, it seems okay to uh, table it so that we can see if this um, process is going to be a success. Um, but we had hoped that it could at least be on a council agenda um, immediately at about the same time as LPT, so that if the charrette process, which we hope will happen in June, um, has not been a success, then it would be possible for the property owners to continue and finalize their land use application instead of doing the rest of it. But we're hopeful that that won't be necessary and what would happen at that time would just be a tabling. Okay, so long story short, we're sort of okay with it, but we'd like 
to have this end in June of this year, one way or the other, or at least have an indication in June of one uh, this year, one way or another. And I believe our Alderman Keating has uh, indicated to me he that's uh, his amendment. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you. And just for clarification, Alderman Lowe, I think the dates in Alderman Keating's initial amendment are now reflected in, in the notice of motion that will be back in front of us. Uh, any other questions for Ms. King? All right, thank you very much, Ms. Could King. Could I? Oh, oh, sorry, Alderman Chabot. No, no, I, I just want some clarification. I thought I heard you say June. Um, well, no, actually, that was what Alderman Lowe said. So the charrette is hoped for for June. And um, so it would need to be after that. But I don't know whether the land use application needs to be tabled to a public hearing or whether it can be to a regular meeting of council. And I thought that there was a public hearing at the end of July, but there isn't. Um, so um, it, it, it will be the last of whatever would be appropriate for the land use application to be tabled to before the summer break. I do have an answer for you on that one, Ms. King, because Ms. Flone and I asked the same question, or I asked the same question to Ms. Flone. Because we're having the public hearing today, yeah. if the land use must come back to council unchanged, <laughs> then there is no need for a further public hearing and it can come back to our regular okay. meeting at the end of July. Okay. If Lovely. there's going to be major changes, then it would have to go to another public hearing. Yeah. But if there's going to be major changes, yeah. it means the charrette process is working, yeah. right? So, yeah. so I, think, I think it's clean the way Alderman Carr has put it. Good. Thank you. Alderman Chabot, sorry. No problem. Um, so you're okay with the July 26th date as long as there's a potential opportunity for this item to move forward unamended in July of yeah. the same month? Yeah. Yeah. But and the idea of it also going to LPT in July would be so that members of council can see that the process is working to the benefit of the greater city. And, and if community members wanted to come and speak to it, there would be that opportunity there. And that would be separate from the land use issue. So through the charrette process, if there was other areas within that sort of entire strip that indicated that there was probably some higher and better uses for other properties, but didn't necessarily impact those properties, that could be then vetted through LPT and potentially not impact this development or this proposed. Uh, yeah, amendment. yes, absolutely. Um, the challenge with this application has been that each individual property owner has had to agree to be part of it, which is an unusual situation. But we had always understood that the ARP amendment covers everything and therefore gives a more generalized idea of what should be happening. And in the same way, I believe the charrette process will enable changes to a greater range of the properties. Mm -hmm. Now, it seems to me that... Oh, can I just add the, the, the one remaining property? They're not against what's happening. They just didn't want to pay into the process. Ah, uh, I see. They also fairly so, Excuse me, don't, don't I have the floor? I'm sorry, Alderman McCraw. Respectfully. Thank you. Um, so it was just that they didn't want to participate and they didn't want to, okay. But they are aware yeah. of what's going yeah. on. Yeah. And they wouldn't have an issue if council took it upon themselves to decide to redesignate. Now, my question would be then to GM Watson, if I may, Your Worship. I'll pass it along. <laughs> um, whether or not, well, actually, probably me, be to Miss Flown, and that would be a, whether we can include that last house. Yeah, or whether it would have to go through a new public process. Miss Flown, did you catch that, Miss Flown? There, there's one excluded property there that you can see. Um, that particular landowner has not been participating in the process. Alderman Chabot's question is, does council have the power to include that piece of land in what we're talking about today, or would that be a separate public hearing? Your Worship, that would be a separate public hearing and subject to advertising. Okay. Yeah. But, but it would, uh, Mr. Watson is just saying, but the intent is if we go through the charrette process, that piece of property would be included. Whether the 
land owner would be supportive or not. It would be city initiated redesignation at that point. Mr. Sorry. Watson. Sorry to try to clarify. The charrette process or the process being uh, proposed by Alderman Carr is like a policy plan or a community plan, although on a smaller scale. And we don't go out and solicit whether people want to be part of that or not. It's only the redesignation where either council tells us to redesignate or the owner of the property says they want to redesignate. So, so we basically it's just set direction saying that these types of uses, if an applicant came forward with a land use, app, land use change, it would facilitate it. Well, depending what comes out of this process, and, and the terms of reference talks about at the end we're going to a form-based code, we would then, uh, you know, presumably council would say yes, do it, and then we would include and notify the landowners that that's what we're doing. That we were changing the land use designation, so they and wouldn't have would not have to incur any kind of fee to go through the process. No, no. Get away free. We'd be absorbing that cost. If we approve it. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, Madeline. Uh, Madeline. I'm so used to calling you Alderman King. I almost called. Thank you. Um, yeah, no, I was just curious as to whether or not that landlord had been in, involved in the process and uh, and whether or not we could make that amendment. So, just wanted that clarification. All right. Well, I appreciate you coming forward. And, Voicing your opinion on this issue. Thank you, Worship. No further questions for the uh, current Alderman presenter. Alderman Carob and Alderman McLeod. Thank you, Ms. King. Um, and this is a question that might uh, also require uh, Mr. Sparks' expertise, but you started fleshing this out and approaching the community in March 2008, and now it's you know, January 2011. We're like, two and a half years into the process for just a land use. And that's not unusual, unfortunately, in inner city redevelopment. And I mean, if we are believers in the planet process, we have to find a way to make the ideals of planet actually be achievable within a time frame that's, that's remotely reasonable. Because my question is, through that long process, um, not collaborative, probably uh, involving compromise that was unsatisfactory to definitely the community association how satisfactory are the compromises to you guys the landowners and how buildable is what are you looking at in terms of, of, of your the buildability of what you get out of this land use is it where it could or should be or is it is it sort of the best you've been able to get and not 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 as good as you'd I like I think certainly at the time when it went to planning commission, the property owners did feel that this was the best use of the land. They did? Yeah. Okay. Um, that it was um, um, what, what had started off originally was the idea of um, condo buildings or apartment buildings, and the major compromise was that it would be grade-oriented, so there would be... Um, numerous um, front doors facing onto the street to uh, try and develop the community sense. Um, and, uh, and also a lot of work was put into the AIP amend amendments and um, they seem to be like a good idea. So, um, yeah, but um, the property owners have been open to the possibility of um, what you've raised and the um, enthusiasm in the communities has been, uh, I think it's taken us all by surprise. Um, there's clearly a lot of uh, resident support for the mixed use concept, the possibility of the mixed use concept. Thank you. Do you have anything to add, Mr. Sparks? Or? No, I think uh, 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 Steve Sparks, I'm uh, one of the property owners. Um, yes, to uh, try to answer your question uh, as I understand it, uh, we were dealing with um, some specific land uses that were outlined in the land use bylaw. Uh, so we were confining our 
uh, expectations or aspirations to what might be achievable uh, under the existing land use bylaw. And um, we felt that uh, uh, the land use that we had applied for uh, would work for us and was appropriate for that location. Uh, since uh, that land use was uh, approved by the uh, uh, CPC, uh, we have been presented uh, by you with the possibility of a more flexible type of land use uh, that would incorporate some other uses. And uh, we think it's a good idea. So uh, we would be okay. We'd be fine with what we originally applied for. But uh, we're excited about uh, the possibility of uh, uh, something else. So there you are. Well, thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, perhaps my question has um, just been answered, but I'm, I'm framing it differently. Um, to go through this additional process, uh, we'll have an opportunity cost of at least six months and perhaps 12. Um, I'm assuming that you see some benefit in this process, that it's something that you're open and willing to do. And so there's, there's a potential for some economic advantage there as well. Um, can you just comment on that for me so that I understand this better? Um, well, I, I think that you've expressed it, if I might say so, really well. Um, it's, uh, it's not been an easy decision, and I think the complexity of that choice is something that's um, not easy for a, a group of dis disparate property owners. Um, but it's always been clear that this stretch of the road looks as if everyone forgot it. And um, just by changing the land use can go a long way, but it's not as far as anyone felt needed to do. Um, and for instance, the more northerly part of Mission Road had a really successful traffic calming process that very much made it read as if it was part of a neighborhood. Um, this part of Mission Road somehow missed out on that happening. And uh, so it looks quite derelict. So if I think there's a lot of hope from the, both the communities and the property owners that this process might aid in uh, rectifying that. Thank you. That's, that's very helpful to me. Um, just a follow-up question on that. Um, and perhaps uh, given the process, I mean, I understand what we're looking at here is trying to change the process fundamentally, but um, do you perceive that it would be um, the city's role to advance this um, as opposed to the property owners? Um, so in other words, we're being asked to put a fair chunk of change into, into this. It's, it, it, there's an opportunity cost, but a pen, potential benefit. Um, but we're, we're the ones putting up the money. Um, is that what you perceive the city's role should be in this, in facilitating this kind of thing? Um, yes, I, I have to say that I do. There's a lot of um, public space issues involved in this particular stretch of the street. And um, we've tried for three years for the property owners to be champions of some of that change and it just hasn't the process just hasn't been there it hasn't been possible for us to achieve uh, what we wanted to and I think that's why there's so much community excitement of what Alderman Carr has managed to do um, because it, it it feels as if it's uh, addressing something that has been requested for a long long time Thank you. Um, my last question, how many property owners are there? Oh, about 14. Uh, I can't remember, 10, oh, 10 just or 12. A, just, is there two or is there 20, sort of, yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah. 
Can I, can I add something to that, please? Um, I am not only a property owner on Mission Road, I'm also a real estate developer. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I'm a resident of Park Hill. Uh, I've been active in real estate development in Calgary for over 40 years. And uh, uh, I've had the usual uh, uh, complaints about the approval process uh, and uh, difficulties with working with uh, regulations and so on and so forth. Uh, and I just see this uh, as a uh, wonderful opportunity to change uh, how things are done. Uh, almost inevitably, under the present system, uh, you wind up, uh, a developer winds up in an adversarial position uh, with the community. Uh, and so you kind of negotiate your way uh, to a, a settlement uh, that nobody's really thrilled with, uh, but is the best you can do under the circumstances. Uh, it would just be so uh, refreshing to be involved in a process uh, that would uh, lead to consensus uh, instead of um, uh, a settlement. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman McLeod. Any further questions for the applicant? Alderman Lowe? You, you already had your go, but you can... I'm sorry, that. I'll address my questions <laughs> to uh, the other presenter, if I may. The... Uh, <laughs> oh, jeez. Splitting hairs. <laughs> the... Uh, and I'm thinking about, you know, the, the process is, is limited to the land use. The proposed process that Alderman Carra is bringing forward is limited to the properties that the land use is directed at. Was there any discussion of extending that process around the corner on the McLeod Trail into that uh, Secor 2 area or up and down? It seems to me if you, if you want to create a, a Main Street-like atmosphere, maybe you need some anchors in the end of it. That's just sort of off the top of my head. Uh, th that uh, uh, question did come up at the visioning session. Uh, and uh, I think the conclusion was that uh, yes, uh, some of the possibilities for uh, neighboring properties should be uh, addressed at the same time as we look at the uh, specific uh, location uh, under application. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Alderman Lowe. Any further questions for the applicant? Okay, thank you. Anyone else wish to speak in favor of this item? Anyone wish to speak against this item? Anyone in opposition? All right. So that takes us to the end of the public hearing. Alderman Carra, if you would like to move to table this item, you may do so, or yeah. you can move the item, or you can do whatever you like, really. I would like to move to table this item until uh, after we address my notice of motion. Is that possible? Which may or may not table it massively. Yes. I can do that? I think so. Our, our counselor is looking at me with a scrunched up face. <laughs> <laughs> We've had the conversation already. Okay, so I mean, I mean, I could, I could move to table it completely, but I think I would rather bring You'd the rather notice of motion, in. discuss that, I hear you. And, then, and then move forward. I hear you. So we'll table this item. The motion then is to table this item pending consideration of the notice of motion again. Do I have a seconder? Thanks, Alderman Putmans. Are we agreed? Any opposed? Opposed. Alderman Chabot is opposed. All right. So now we've got the notice of motion back up again. Now I can go back to all my lights. Alderman Lowe. Oh, I think you spoke on this one already. Uh, you were the last one. Well, I'm sorry. The only question I have would be to administration or to the mover in its close. Was this, it's the last question I asked of the, the last presenter was, and again, I'm looking at the efficiency of use of resources. Was the any consideration to expanding it out onto McLeod Trail and anchoring it? So you can answer that in his close. I'm ready to answer a bunch of things in my close. So please throw some Mr. more. Mr. Muller is there. Do you want to take it? Yeah. Through the chair, yes, the, the terms of reference is that terms of reference includes all the parcels from McLeod Trail west towards the escarpment. So it would include those lands that you referred to. Okay. Do we then get ourselves into a position of having to uh, encourage further landowners into the process? Or are they there now? Well, through the chair, the, 
the charrette process would involve everybody, and I think the charrette process would you'd get a sense of who's interested and who's not. The objective, though, is to bring forward a comprehensive land use for that entire corridor in one go, so that we don't do it on an application by application basis in the future. Okay. That's that's the objective of the process. Has that been communicated to the landowners outside of the area? Not directly. That's the, those that were invited to the uh, the Vision Cafe, the World Cafe that we held last Saturday was widely advertised, but there were no direct notices sent to landowners as part of that. Okay. But when the charrette process were to be undertaken, the consultant the consultant responsibilities would include notification of property owners for involvement. Okay, and, I, and then, then I'm going to assume that during the charrette process, if they were unhappy, did not want to or have anything to do with this thing, they, they could make that position known directly or indirectly. Correct. Thank you. So back to the, the motion on the screen then, Alderman Putman's. Thank you, uh, Your Worship. Um, perhaps uh, some questions that I'd appreciate if Alderman Carr could address in his closing. I'm, as I'm sure a number of my colleagues are quite intrigued and tantalized by the opportunities to have this as, as potentially very transformative in the process. I'm looking in particular at the third bullet on page one of four, the milestones where city administration input and support is required. Um, a question or perhaps an observation. It strikes me that for this to have the kind of potential to be transformative that city administration might want to be engaged at a level beyond this, perhaps almost in a partnership or at some level, and I'm wondering if you might address how you see engaging perhaps beyond even LUP and other departments to, to, to sort of the more, I put it bluntly, for the investment of 300,000, excuse me, to put it bluntly in terms of um, the um, Objectives, but also some of the results we might get. I would like to think for three hundred thousand dollars, we might get a, a broader um, engagement from the from administration, and, and indeed have them um, gain insight and knowledge beyond just providing um, input and support. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman Putman. Alderman McLeod. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I have several questions here. Um, one of which gets back to Alderman Collier-Cart's questions about um, the process. Um, it would seem to me we do need some guidelines around this innovation fund, and I would suggest that there must um, be demonstrated uh, citywide value, because if we degenerate into ward-specific issues, we're going to have trouble, because we might as well just divvy it up between the 14 wards. Um, so I, I would put that out there that um, every project that comes out of here needs to be um, clearly demonstrate how it has a citywide process and in, in so it inherently what is innovative um, about this. So Alderman Carr, on your closing comments, if you could address that. Um, I'm also very concerned about the uh, budget detail here and the, the lack of detail for 300000 um, the charrette process, it's in and of itself, is not a new process. This is something that uh, I have um, been familiar with for, for many years. So I need to better understand how this is actually innovative. And you talk in the um, terms of reference about a smart coal, um, the National Charette Institute, NCI, um, and the smart code uh, regulatory framework. I can find NCI. I can't see anything particularly unique um, on that website, but I don't see anything about the smart code. So maybe you could address that as well. What exactly it is, because I don't under I don't um, don't have any, a frame of reference for that. Um, and, and encompassing in that, if you could also. Um, I answer, and I, I think this is part of the same question, um, how this differs from the existing planning process. Um, and it, again, that gets back to the innovative piece. Um, and then finally, um, my, I guess it gets back to the process again, but um, 
prioritizing projects. So if we do have a time frame or a timeline on some of these things, then it allows us to prioritize so that we don't end up at the end of the year or in the second half of a fiscal year having run out of money on things that would have inherently been less important than something else. But I, I, I want to go back to my original point. I am concerned about this being of citywide benefit. It must, because this looks very much um, ward specific. And I, I think there, there I, I like the idea. I think there's some good ideas, good uh, potential here, but I really, really need to see the, here um, demonstrate that it does have citywide benefit to uh, garner my support. Thank you, Alderman McLeod. Alderman Farrell. Thank you. I think my comments or questions are similar to Alderman McLeod's, but Mr. Watson, do you see this as something particularly innovative? I know that we've talked about Smart Quote before. W would this be a, a benefit to your department to explore a, a street of this nature in, in sort of the Smart Code lens? And, I, and do you see using the learnings from this to assist in other areas? And another question after that. Thank you, Your Worship. Alderman Farrell, uh, we have participated in charrettes before, so I, I'm not going to stand here and tell you that a charrette is innovative. I mean, and we don't use it a lot, but we have. We, we have a number of staff that are fully trained in it. Um, what we believe with this particular piece of work that's being proposed by Alderman Craw is it is a good pilot to see if this is a good way to deal with some of these nodes and corridor things, which we are moving into more as we start taking forward the new municipal development plan where we will probably be emphasizing less community plans and more edges of communities or nodes or corridors where we want to see intensification over time. So to that extent, we think this is a pilot that we'd like to... Uh, <laughs> something I said or... No. Uh, it is something that we would like to try and, and certainly support it. Uh, we can go into some detail on the cost of it if you want to talk that, about that. That's um, my next Zach question. Worthy or Alderman Carr may have that detail. It is costly in the sense that we do not have staff to do it, which is why we're saying we have to hire people, not because we don't have staff that's trained to do it. We have a fully loaded work program right now. But to answer your question, Alderman Farrell, we believe this is something we'd like to try. Okay. We're going to measure it. We're going to see how much it costs, how much time and effort it takes what the value at the other end is. Smart codes, we do not have smart codes in the City of Calgary. It's certainly something that we've looked at. It is something our uh, consultant who's looking at the land use file has commented on. Again, this could be a pilot to see whether or not we think this is something worth pursuing further citywide or in some specific parts of the city. I'm, and Alan DeCarrer and I may disagree on this, I'm not convinced smart codes across the entire city is the way to go. I don't agree. There but may be locations where this might be uh, of some value. So to that extent, we're prepared to participate. But the problem is we need a source of funding to do it. We, I do not have money in Saxworthy's budget or as a staff except to participate. While well, we are participating, you see, in the terms of reference, but to launch this whole thing. Okay, so then the $300,000, Mr. Watson, um, do you s that was a recommendation by Alderman Kara. But based on your experience, it seems like a lot of money to me. But um, <laughs> sort of a few other things. The the uh, I, I'm just wondering if you think that that's the right number. That that fund will will evaporate pretty quickly. Mr. Mahler can give more details, but I know we looked at it originally. I think we were talking about 250,000, and we've got a look at both the timelines and the level of detail we're going into. And there's a number of studies and consultants that are hired through the terms of reference that we have to source and participate. But Your Worship, if you'd allow, Mr. Mahler can provide more detail. Mr. Mahler? Now, through the chair, I think that the difference between a typical community plan study or some of the other charrette-based uh, exercises we've had is the intent here to get to a smart code as part of the charrette includes a lot of front-ended uh, studies and technical studies that we would do subsequent to that through land use or development permit applications. That would include some of the geotechnical analysis, some of the retail market analysis, which we typically don't do on a, on a frequent basis, um, and also the traffic 
traffic, any traffic impact studies and design of this also includes a design of Mission Road. The fact that Mr. Watson indicated we don't have staff to do any of this work ourselves, therefore we want enough money within that fund that for our departments who are going to be evaluating this as part of the process are able to ask for further clarification and enough work that we can get to some answers through the charette process. So that's why it is front loaded. Okay, and so do you see this little road as a good candidate for this type of exercise? Not too big, not too small, just right kind of thing? Through the chair, I think it is a manageable okay. area, probably more from the standpoint of engagement. Mm -hmm. um, when we go into a much larger area, the engagement and the number of stakeholders involved becomes much more uh, complex to work a process. This, we've already got a sense of who the key stakeholders are and we think the charrette process can be better managed in a smaller area as a pilot. Okay, thank you. Then I'll, um, I'll move into debate then. I, um, we don't have a terms of reference for this innovation fund, but it's there and it's for us to use and I wanted to commend Alderman Shira for, um, for um, exploiting the fund that may have benefit for all of us. And if we're going to have a successful planet document uh, and, and take it into reality, then we need to figure out a different way of, of planning, something that's a bit more elegant. And so I'm happy to, uh, to support it um, with the expectation that we develop a terms of reference soon for um, future projects. But then I'm looking forward to seeing the results. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman Farrell. Alderman Pincott. Thank you. Coming out of the uh, presentation, actually, some of the last questions were uh, um, other questions that I had coming out of this, sort of understanding the impact on our on our own staff and and whether this can be accommodated within their work plan to do this. It sounds like it has been, even even though it's it's not budgeted, it has been contemplated the overall management of the project within city work plan okay and uh, just to clarify as well this this will be city staff sort of leading the process as the whatever I, I don't know what you through the chair certainly the city staff will be coordinating it coordinating we'll be hiring a consultant who we will expect will sub consult probably on some issues but we'll be coordinating them okay Good, good, thank you. My other other question, I've been reading this and looking at this, and given that we were just looking at the other land use, is there, there are actually no boundaries included in this. Uh, so maybe, I mean, certainly knowing the area, um, knowing that, uh, say, the NMAX building, uh, it, and, and it, it sort of says roughly ending at 34th. Would the NMAX building be included in this? How far down on the south side does it go? Does it go to 34th Avenue on the south side? I, if if uh, Alderman Kara could also just sort of talk about what the boundaries are for the area um, uh, in his close as well to all the other questions that he's got, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Alderman Kara, do recall that you do have a five minute limit on that close. <laughs> Be efficient. Alderman Marr. Thank you. Um, okay, I do have a couple of questions, and I know that, that Alderman Carr is going to, um, to address them, but I do have a quick question for s staff. Well, no, Mr. Cope is fine. Thank you. Um, so, Mr. Cope, if we're looking at a, a scope of operations and doing a design shred. We've done those types of things before. I remember that uh, that uh, Mr. Mahler and, and, and uh, Ms. Axworthy have done these before. Is $300,000, um, is that high, low, in the range? Do you know? Maybe, you sorry, maybe Mr. Mahler. Probably got the wrong Mahler. person up here. I see Mr. Mahler's on his way. Through the chair, the number, the number 300,000 is not high given the fact normally when we do these things, administration is responsible for all aspects of public engagement. The consultants that we hire do the technical work mm -hmm. and they, they, were, they work at the charrette. The expectation in this terms of reference is that the consultant would do all the logistical information and, and uh, sides of the, the charrette that we would t typically do, including advertising, booking of halls, um, ad uh, notifications that are required and facilitating the entire event. 
So often we will just hire the architectural expertise mm -hmm. to work at it and we engage the rest. The expectation here would that they would be undertaking all of the other ancillary things that normally administration would do. Okay, so what we're, do, we're effectively doing is we're cutting the administration out and we're just going out and tendering it, having somebody, well, I'm assuming we're tendering it, uh, having somebody else basically do the job that normal city staff would do. Is that correct? That's correct. And to address any questions that come up during the process that administration would normally evaluate. So the way the, the terms of reference was worded is that this would be a competitive bidding process. Mm -hmm. may not require the full 300000 I haven't done a terms of reference like this uh, that goes to this extent. Uh, right. At least in my career here, so I don't know that 300,000 is absolutely required, but I think it's it's certainly in the ballpark of what might be anticipated. Okay, 300,000. Okay, I, I do have one other quick question, and I'm, Mr. Mall, I'm pretty sure that this isn't going to be in your section, but uh, when we did the public engagement on the West LRT, was that done by city staff or did we have, I know we had a, um, a contractor go out and assist us. Uh, but I'm not sure if uh, most of the engagement was done by, by administration. And I see that uh, Mr. Logan is not, no, he's, he's not. That was a total fake out. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, that was, yeah, Oscar performance. Okay, uh, do, are you aware of, uh, yes. could you enlighten me? Through the chair, the, through the West LRT, there was a full-time consultant hired to manage the public engagement process. However, there were still considerable staff resources um, that supported that, that individual. But there was certainly additional help that was brought in in order to undertake that, that resource. The dollar value, I, I can't speak to specifically. No, and you couldn't even take a guess as to whether or not that was higher or lower. Okay, uh, that's my question for now. Uh, I would actually make an amendment, though, and I know it, you guys love it when I make these one-worders. Uh, I would just say up to rather than of, of a specific $300,000. Yeah, just just because, yeah. See, you guys like... Less than three words, Uber? He agreed. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. Your Worship, I've spoken to this item, but I, I would like to propose an amendment. And uh, the amendment is in keeping with the beneficiaries and, and their contribution to this whole experience based on some of the input that I've received so far. I'm not going to dispute that the overall cost for the charrette may very likely uh, come close to that figure. Um, I do think, though, that there are going to be a number of property owners that will benefit from this process and should somehow contribute to it. Most of the charrettes that I've been involved with have uh, included community involvement and community contributions. Therefore, my proposed amendment would be to change that number from 300,000 to 100,000. If I can find a seconder. Thanks, okay. Alderman Hodge. <laughs> the right hand's not working quite as well, Alderman Sorry. <laughs> it's these nerves. It's this pain I have in my back. If I do these kind of things, you'll have to forgive me, Your Worship. <laughs> um, anyways, um, just to uh, add a little bit to that, um, as was indicated, if we go through a redesignation, there won't be a requirement for people to then make application to redesignate their properties, and, and as such, we'll be saving a significant amount of dollars by having to go through that process as well as as uh, potentially some significant amount of time in regards to what the typical process is for redesignation. Therefore, I think somehow the community should come together and come up with some additional dollars to to offset the costs to us and keep as much as we can in this innovation fund until such time as we can more clearly define the terms of reference and guidelines. All right, so we have an amendment on the floor to change 300,000 to 100,000. Um, Mr. Watson, uh, you whispered something in my ear about costs that folks have already incurred. Maybe I can ask you to say a bit more about that. Your Worship, through the Chair, what I was mentioning was the fact that the applicants have already paid a redesignation process. Now, you could suggest that might have been their contribution at the front end of this. Now, when you say the communities, I'm not quite sure. Alderman Chevalier, maybe in your close, you could help us or help me understand. You're talking about community associations, you're talking about property owners, you're talking about passing the hat. I will caution council, $100,000 is going to be, if that, if we are unsuccessful in passing the hat. 
um, if we are unsuccessful. Hundred thousand bucks isn't enough. Sorry, Mr. Watson. <laughs> um, on the amendment, Alderman Collier Cart. Well, you see, that's the part of the problem here when you don't have a detailed budget in front of you and you don't know the the, the breakdown of the three hundred thousand. And it's interesting to hear that that uh, key stakeholders have already put in some money. So I think I'm going to try to refer this uh, to the meet next meeting of council on Monday to come back with a detailed breakdown of the budget. Second. And uh, and let's see let's see how this money will be spent, rather than me sending it to PAC. Because my I was going to do a mo motion arising, and I can wait till next Monday to do that, Your Worship. But the motion arising was going to be if this passed. Uh, that administration be requested to consult with members of council on drafting a terms of reference for the innovation fund, and further, that no further projects be approved until the TOR have been adopted by council. So uh, I can wait a week, but I really think that okay. council is, I think we're owed to see a, a detailed budget on how this 300000 would be spent, or 100. Now we're getting into the Dutch auction. Yeah, all right. So you are, so two things. One is, um, you can bring that, um, oh geez, we're going to run out of time. Tell you what, Alderman Collier card, on the second part, on the motion rising that you may not get to do, right. how about I just take it under advisement since I set the agenda for PAC, okay. that I'll just put it on the agenda. Thank you. Um, because I think that it does make sense to do that, because okay. otherwise we're going to miss the next PAC meeting by the time council comes. That's true. Um, but you are now currently making a motion to, you said refer, but I think you're tabling this to the meeting one week from today. Right, because I think a week, and we'll I give think Alderman Carras Carras has to give an idea of how this money would be divvied up and, 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 and what the evaluation process is. I hear that administration is going to be involved, but I don't see that clearly laid out in the terms of reference to that extent. It's, it's kind of unclear. So if I had a seconder, yeah, uh, oh, okay, thank you, <laughs> then Alderman it Mark, could thanks. be uh, tabled till next Monday to come back with a detailed budget. Thank you, Your Worship. <laughs> My motion arising is it's time to change the seating plan in here. <laughs> People's arms are going to get sore. Um, all right, then. So we have a motion to table this for one week. Um, and, uh, well, we're just tabling it for one week in the motion, but the idea being that we would have some more information and a better budget at that time. So that's a non-debatable motion. So on the motion to table for one week, are we agreed? Agreed. Any opposed? Uh, Alderman Carra and Farrell. Oh, oh, no, you'll have to call the roll, please. Alderman Collier Cart? Yes. Alderman DeMong? Yes. Alderman Farrell? No. Alderman Hodges? Alderman Jones? Yes. Alderman Keating? Yes. Alderman Lowe? Yes. Alderman McLeod? No. Alderman Marr? Yes. Alderman Pincott? Yes. Alderman Putmans? No. Alderman Stevenson? Yes. Alderman Carra? No. Alderman Chabot? Yes. Mayor Nenshi? Yes. It's carried, Your Worship. All right. Um, we still have the. It is procedural funhouse in here today. Mm -hmm. We still have the um, the CPC report then on the table. Your Worship, I... on a point of order, were we not going to deal with the other item that was tabled previously? Is that what you're talking about? Well, we, we have to get rid of the um, the CPC recommendation because we tabled that to after consideration of this. Oh, I then see. we get to the one that you tabled okay. before lunch. Thank you for that. Okay. Um, so I think it would be appropriate at this time um, to table this one to next week as well because the public I hearing so is closed. So we can and I apologize right? to uh, members of the public for getting dragged along further in this process. All right, so um, move to table. Um, oh, what the heck was the number on this one? 2011-002, thank you. CPC 2011-002, we've already finished the public hearing, so we can table it to I'll the next meeting of council, Alderman Hodges. On that, are we agreed? agreed? Any opposed? All right, carried. Now we bring back, I believe it was 7.7 .7 in your agenda, was it? 7.8, 7.8, CPC 2011-23. Um, Alderman Chabot had had a question about how the 
amount for the disposition had been calculated and from whom it was coming. And hopefully we've had a chance to get an answer to that question. Uh, Mr. Cope? Uh, yes, I did talk to uh, Corporate Properties Group. Uh, the uh, appraisal is done independently, and that appraisal finding is based on the requirements of the Act and is vetted by the uh, Joint Use uh, Committee. Okay, so Your Worship, then what's suggested that is that if we're talking to a developer on undeveloped lands, we typically apply what's called sector rates. So would these not apply to these lands, being as they're undeveloped predominantly, or for the majority? There's a small little structure on there, but that site, that corner, is undeveloped. Uh, you stand correct. I don't know if Ryan may have a, a uh, answer for that. What perfect timing, Mr. Stevens. I think that uh, Alderman Chabot may have a question for you. Perfect. I think, uh, did you, I'm not sure if you heard. We, uh, when we talk about sector rates, we talk about undeveloped lands, and when we're dealing with a, just with a land developer, um, we typically trade at, you know, back and forth at what we call sector rates. These are predominantly undeveloped lands, although it may not be owned by a specific developer. They are obviously owned by somebody, and just because it happens to be us, why don't we apply sector rates? Um, Your Worship, the arrangement we have in place is just primarily just for undeveloped road right of way where there's a transfer back and forth between uh, a developer here. There is specific requirements under the Municipal Government Act that it be handled in a certain way, that there be an appraisal, that it be transacted at uh, market value and that's what's happened here is the independent appraisal uh, was uh, received and uh, that is the proposal that's before you. I'm, I'm a bit confused, and forgive me for asking, Your Worship, but typically when we require a road right-of-way and we don't own the road right-of-way, what's, what's the process? Do we not designate it as road right-of-way or road right-of-way requirements, at which time then it's transferred back and forth at, mark, at sector rates? So why couldn't we do that with this piece of property? This is, as my understanding, this is not, this is, the, this is a disposition of municipal reserve. That's what the item that is before us. There are specific provisions in the Municipal Government Act that must be uh, followed, and that's what's transpired here. This is not just a transaction in order to, to obtain rights of way. That's not the item that I understand that's before you in the, in the public hearing. Somewhere else that we don't. Well, typically we don't see dollars associated with these uh, reports from CPC specifically, Worship, and that's why the reason it's what's given rise to my questions and, and why we assess the specific value that we do to these. I understand that that's market value based on developable lands. Ms. Flone has tried to explain this to me as well. I think I got it now. What we're asking to do today, it's not really a sale of land because we own it. So it's left hand to right, left pocket to right pocket of the city. But what we're doing today is we're actually removing the reserve. That, that's all we're doing. But when we remove the reserve, compensation has to be paid to? Joint Use Coordinating Committee. Herein lies my difficulty, Your Worship, transferring money into that department from corporate properties. Uh, hence the reason why I'm not overly happy with this uh, transaction at this price. Ms. Sloan? Your Worship, um, it, maybe this will help. These lands are designated as reserve. In order for the city to do anything with these lands, a long-term lease, a sale, use it for some other purpose other than what's listed in the Municipal Government Act, council must dispose of the reserve. You require a public hearing for that. That's not the sale, that's not the transfer, that's just simply taking off the label of reserve. If there is going to be a subsequent sale, if there's gonna be something else happening, presumably it would go through another committee. For example, if you're selling it to a third party, it would be going through land committee and then to council for approval. Or if, if it was something that would have to come to council. In this this is just- you're selling it for transportation yeah. and utility. This, this, would just, this is just simply taking off the label. This is not approving the value of the land or anything of that nature. Well, there's a specific dollar value included in this, in this report, Ms. Flo, and that's part of my challenge. I, I don't, I don't, I, I guess, object or question um, your, your um, 
an analysis of uh, the Municipal Government Act in regards to disposition in that we must dispose of the lands. The, the question at hand here is that what, at what price? And that's, that's my question. And I'm just still don't fully understand why we can't transfer it at, we at, the at lower sector, sector. sector rates that we typically use for road right of ways. But I see Miss Brown over there just nipping at the bit, looking to <laughs> There's a couple of Browns. Mr. possibly Watson, saying, that adding, Mr. Some, adding some value to <laughs> if this he feels like discussion. It. Let, let me start with the process. I mean, the, the purpose of the Joint Use Coordinating Committee is to provide then, we're taking, we're taking parkland away, let's put it that way, in order to then buy parkland in order to make ourselves whole, we want to have enough money and a fund that then goes out and buy parkland somewhere else. So there's, I, I can't speak to the price. I'm going to let Mr. Stevens speak to the price. But it's in order that we get enough money in that reserve that then we can, and we do, we buy parkland and school land across the city based on the monies that we have in that reserve fund. So we have to keep topping up that reserve fund. It's also important to make sure we have enough in that reserve fund because quite often where we have a deficiency, we're buying at market rates. So if you top up that reserve fund at less than market rates, you're going to have not enough money to buy the land you want to have in the future. In terms of sector rates versus the independent appraisal that was done, I believe, to get to this price, uh, I've always understood it's the independent appraisal approach, but I'll let Mr. Stevens speak to how one versus the other. I'll try this again, Your Worship. When, um, when you dispose of reserve, it must be done on the basis of an independent appraisal. Okay, that's what's happening here. I understand you're trying to equate the process of selling reserve that's done in very, and the process of um, using our sector rates. Our sector rates are used in very confined circumstances when you've got old, when you're in an outline plan a developer's in on something more than 160 acres that's when the sector rates the the semi-annual sector rates that are approved by council kick in when under the municipal government act when you're disposing of a reserve it must be done on the basis of an independent appraisal that's used um, to on a highest and best use basis and that's why this was done on that basis so that you could look at other similar industrial land in the area that arrived at about 280,000 an acre. Using comparables. We don't have any comparables included in this report though, do we, Mr. Uh, no, I think that would have been in the background report that would have been would have been part of it, but that's 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 we don't have any problem using that number for this basis. So you're comfortable with this? Yes. Thing? Yeah. And that so would we would have been consulted, corporate properties, my area would normally be consulted in the preparation of the report that goes to planning commission. That also ties into my, my question earlier about how the value seems uh, quite high. Is that considering serviced lands? I'm not sure. Unserviced? Unserviced. Okay. Thank you. Well, I appreciate you uh, providing me that latitude, Your Worship. Um, although it's been said that this fund is, this money is going to be going into the Joint Use Coordinating Committee Reserve. I don't have the level of confidence in the JUCC maybe that other members of council might have in regards to the redistribution of those funds. I'd rather see them staying in corporate property's hands and if there was any way that I could amend this amount to reflect what I think could be a little more appropriate um, and without having comparables, of course, it's kind of difficult to assess what exactly that number would be. But in lieu of that, Your Worship, if you could call recommendation number one as I will be voting against it. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman Chabot. Any further discussion on this item? Now, Madam Clerk, I must admit that I can't remember who moved and seconded it. Alderman Stevenson, was it? And Alderman Jones. Okay, good. So it was moved and seconded. All right, then. And did you want to close, Alderman Stevenson? <clears throat> yes, Your Worship. This, um, although it uh, seems like it's similar to what we went through with cell D this morning, this cell F has a similar number of um, uh, acreages of most of them at around 4.7 acres and about, uh, again, 35 to 40 of them in this one. It'll be, uh, in this situation, we have, it's that uh, we, we own the property um, and as, as uh, your worship, as you said, we're moving uh, deed from one group to another, but really it's our property and as a result, we're willing or we're able to go ahead 
Uh, there's not the requirement for road designation, or at least I don't think there will be on this one. On the other one, because it's residential, on, it's on the east side of Métis, so it's going to be uh, primarily residential or mixed use. This side here will be industrial, and it's likely the road structure that's in there uh, will handle this. I'm not, I haven't discussed this with anyone, but that's my thinking on it. So, Your Worship, I uh, would encourage uh, my colleagues to support this. Thank you. And they'll have a chance to do that very shortly, Ms. Alderman Stevenson, except I made a mistake. Uh, I thought that we were in questions of administration when we tabled this. In fact, we were in questions of clarification, meaning we haven't had a public hearing yet. First mistake, right, Alderman Lowe? Very, very first one. Um, <laughs> so, given that, um, we will do that now. Is there anyone in the public who would like to speak in favor of this proposal? Is there anyone who would like to speak in opposition to this proposal? Hi, uh, my name is Oscar Feck. This is city-owned property, so why are we switching or sending funds from another department to another department or corporate Calgary? Nothing makes sense anymore because it's owned by the city and you're gonna send it somewhere else. Uh, like the city of Calgary has so many trust accounts, they don't know what to do with them. Uh, my feeling is when I uh, look into all these things, the city has probably billions of dollars in a trust accounts. So why I were, is this all a cover up or, or n nobody knows what's going on or, or what? And we do try to sort these things out here at council, which well, is what we're getting through now, Mr. Peck. No, but... Uh, Corporate Calgary owns so many properties, they have 20,000 land holdings, they own 15, 20,000 condos, apartments, and trailer courts. Uh, does the public know all this? They don't, because it's all hidden. The, corporate Calgary is worth at least maybe 100, 150 billion dollars. So why isn't the public aware of all this? Mayor, uh, I'm not uh, uh, trying to blame, for, uh, blame you for anything, but I think you should look into all these things and, and let the public know what's going on. The, uh, most of the aldermen know what's going on, but, but there's nothing being divulged. The new aldermen, they, they probably don't have a clue what's going on at this point. La, uh, I just want to give you one example. There are three hotels that sold uh, from, uh, from private companies to the city, they were worth maybe two million each, but the city paid 10 million for them each. You're getting so, a bit off topic there, Mr. Fack. No, Your I Worship, know. on a point of privilege, mm -hmm. the no, speaker but, has has um, made reference to the new members of council and, and not knowing anything. I, I think that's being disrespectful. No, I shouldn't put it like that. I should, they don't know as much, maybe, I should say. Well, Your uh, Worship, you know. I, I do believe on a point of privilege, I'm entitled to ask the presenter to either apologize or, or step down, Your Worship. Thanks, Alderman Chabot, and I think I did hear a bit of an apology in there, Mr. Fack. Well, apologize uh, uh, that way, but, but city council must be accountable to the tax base. Then it should apologize to me if they aren't, and to the, and to the tax base. Look, let's not call the cattle black, okay? Mr. Fack, I have to remind you, you're at a public hearing on a particular no, I know. item. No, but and I'm bringing out... Restrict yourself to that item, please. Yes. Yeah. Well, I'm bringing out an issue that, that this has been done all the time, but have never spoken out on it. But I've got some land not too far away from here, from this piece, and... Uh, Careful. No, no, I'm just saying, and... Uh, and, uh, and the city pays one department, another department, 300000 They don't want to pay me that. You see, uh, Mayor, I've, uh, I've mentioned these things before at the uh, at city council meetings. So let's check into these things and keep everything above board. And if we're not, it will come to haunt us. We will it, it will come to bite us. We will certainly try to do so. Thank you. Good. Thank you. 
Anyone else wish to speak in opposition to this item? All right, then. Stevenson, you're moving the recommendations. Alderman Jones, you're seconding the recommendations. I don't think you want to close again. <laughs> All right. On the recommendations there, we're going to take them separately. So um, I'll just do number one separately from the other three, if that's all right, Alderman Chabot. On recommendation number one, are we agreed? agreed. Any opposed? Alderman Chabot is opposed. On the other recommendations, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. On the bylaw then, bylaw 18D 2011. First reading of the bylaw, are, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Second reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Authorization for third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. And third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. All right, that takes us then uh, to C uh, item 8.2 in your agenda, CPC 2011-028. On one of my favorite topics, I might add, driveways. Driveways. Good afternoon, Your Worship and members of Council. The proposed amendments I am introducing will clarify the rules in the land use bylaw for a landowner to retain a legally existing driveway in the developed area. When bylaw 1P2007 was adopted, Council directed administration to grandfather legally existing residential driveways in developed communities so that when redevelopment occurs, they can be kept at the choice of the owner. Accordingly, on July 23, 2007, Council approved amendments in the land use bylaw to read that, in the developed area where a parcel contains a legally existing front driveway and the parcel is the subject of redevelopment, such driveway may remain on the parcel provided that is, it is in the same location and has the same width. I notice a motion at the July 19, 2010 regular meeting of Council directed administration to report back through LPT to review both the rules for driveways in the land use bylaw and policies for driveways in the low density residential guidelines for established communities. On November 10th, 2010, LPT approved by resolution amendments to both the land use bylaw and the low density residential guidelines for established communities to ensure that legally existing driveways can remain. Amendments to the land use bylaw were directed to be brought forward to the Calgary Planning Commission and amendments to the low density residential guidelines for established communities were approved on December 6, 2010, Council Consent Agenda. The recommendation of Calgary Planning Commission is that Council adopt the proposed amendments and give three readings to bylaw 13P 2011. This will ensure Council's original intent to allow residents to retain le legally existing driveways is realized and it will align with the amendments previously made to the low density residential guidelines for established communities. Your Worship, this concludes my presentation. Ms. Moorhart, I have a question of clarification. I could have sworn that at our very first meeting of this Council, we also talked about front driveways and changed the contextual guidelines. Is this the bylaw that makes that real? It would. Um, I'm not sure if you're referring to the consent agenda that was on December 6th when they changed the policy. Maybe that was it. And that's that's actually on the overhead right there. Okay. So these amendments will align with the changes that were made to the policy. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. Alderman Hodges on a question of clarification? Uh, no, Your Worship. I guess you have to call a public hearing, but personally... I've heard enough about this is chapter 15 for me. <laughs> enough is enough. This, this should wrap it up. This That's should be debate, Alderman Hodges. This should be the conclusion. I guess you need to. How about we let me call the public hearing? Okay. And if we can do it in the next minute and a half, then we might be able to finish before our break. Anyone in the public who would like to speak in favor of this proposal? Anyone who would like to speak against this proposal? Alderman Hodges? Uh, unless a member of planning commission would like to move, I'll move it, Your Worship. Okay. Uh, this, this is a conclusion of a long, long chapter of debate on uh, front driveways.
Great. Um, and Alderman Marr is seconding. Any debate on this one? Alderman I'll just Lowe? agree this will take one of the driveways off of our agenda. Alderman Hodges. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? All right, then. On the recommendations, hmm, we just did. <laughs> no one came. <laughs> People, any further debate on this? On the recommendations, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Oh, I'm sorry, where, where, where? Oh, there you are. Sorry, Alderman Farrell. Um, on the bylaw, then. First reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Second reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Same division? Agreed. Okay. Second reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Same division? Alderman Farrell is opposed. Authorization for third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Agreed. Any opposed? Seeing none, carried. Third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? agreed. Alderman Farrell, opposed? Any other opposed? Carried. Thank you. We are recessed until 3.45. Yeah, I know, but someone else might have changed their mind. 3.46. And we're back. Final item of the public hearing today, item 8.3 in your agenda, CPC 2011-029, amendments to the Beltline ARP. Well, hello. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, Your Worship, members of council, my name is Matt Rockley, and I am a planner with the uh, Centre City Planning and Design Group. Uh, the proposal that I've brought before you today is a bylaw to amend the Managing Transportation Demand section of the Beltline Area Redevelopment Plan. The proposed amendment provides clarity that new temporary surface parking lots should not be permitted in the Beltline uh, Area Redevelopment Plan area. The map on the overhead is just outlining the, the uh, Area Redevelopment Plan area. Uh, the Beltline area, uh, as can be seen uh, on the uh, north, is the, the CP rail tracks. To the west is 14th Street Southwest. Uh, to the south is 17th Ave Southwest. And to the east and southeast is uh, the boundary is the Elbow River. The intent of the existing policy in the Beltline area redevelopment plan is to restrict temporary surface parking in the Beltline area. The wording of the existing policy has not achieved the intended out outcome. <clears throat> New temporary parking lots in the Beltline since 2007 uh, include approximately 1,800 stalls. The revised wording for the policy, which is policy 7.6.6 of the Beltline Area Redevelopment Plan, uh, uh, has been revised to, to strengthen the policy direction. And I'll go over the, the, the new policy uh, for you now. And the new wording is that the development of new temporary surface parking lots within the Beltline should not be allowed. In no case shall the term of renewal for an existing temporary surface parking lot extend beyond three years. When renewing an existing temporary surface lot, surface parking lot, sorry, special efforts shall be made to minimize the visual impact of the lot through the provision of interim landscaping or screening elements that can be reused in other applications or locations. Administration is confident that the revised wording is clear that the policy intent is to restrict development of new par uh, temporary parking uh, surface parking lots and that permits for existing temporary parking will only be renewed on a three-year period. The recommendation from the Calgary Planning Commission is that Council adopt the proposed amendments to the Beltline Area Redevelopment Plan in accordance with the Land Use Planning and Policy recommendation and to give three readings to the proposed bylaw, 8P. Uh, 2011. That concludes my presentation and I would be pleased to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Thanks Mr. Rockley. Uh, questions of clarification. Remember we're still in public hearing. Uh, Alderman Stevenson. Your Worship, I just want to uh, congratulate Mr. Rockley because he hasn't been here since the election. He's a, now a councillor in our neighbour to the south. So 
Congratulations, Councillor. I heard that. Congratulations. Thank you very much. May Thank you do you as good work for them as you do for us. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Alderman Hodges. Uh, through the chair, uh, Mr. Ruckley, the way this is worded, it doesn't uh, talk about uh, uh, new applications other than um, should not be allowed. Do you mean should not be allowed? To me, there's a difference between that phrase and will not be allowed. The uh, uh, the wording, it, it, uh, it has been stated as uh, new temporary surface parking lots should not be allowed. Um, and the intent there is that uh, the policy that that statement be complied with and that uh, new temporary parking, um, that it should not be allowed. Uh, it has been worded that way so that if there, there was a, a very exceptional circumstance where it served the, the best interests of, uh, uh, of the community and of the city, um, in a particular instance, um, it does allow that latitude, but the policy intent is that it should be uh, complied with and that there should be no new uh, temporary surface parking lots in, in the area. Mr. Rockley, I'm full aware, fully aware of what you're trying to achieve. However, the next time one of these comes into SDAB, <laughs> I shall I'll send you a personal invitation. And you can hear all the humming and hawing that goes on from one foot to the other from the applicants who say, you mean I have to pave this thing? There's no intention to do that. You mean I have to landscape it? post and cable fence do and on and on it goes so they you end up with the SDAB as the approving authority is what I'm saying you you do know that <clears throat> and if I could re could speak to that thank you your worship um, <clears throat> um, and we believe that the the wording that we have put together here uh, it, it does strengthen the position the policy intent uh, for the SNDAB um, the pre the existing wording um, it does, uh, uh, right in the policy itself, it, it really speaks to, um, you know, special allowances. And that just kind of became the, the rule rather than the exception or that, that argument became the rule rather than the exception. So uh, we do believe that the revised wording is, is stronger. Um, and uh, uh, hopefully it, 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 it provides that extra um, direction that, that we're looking for. I'll, uh... I'll make sure you get that invitation. Thank you, Worship. Thank you, Alderman Hodges. Again, we're on questions of clarification for administration. Alderman Farrell. Thank you. Why would we allow a renewal of parking, surface parking lot at all? <clears throat> uh, a, a renewal would be a, allowed if uh, it had an existing uh, temporary approval mm -hmm. uh, and if there wasn't any um, immediate redevelopment of that site uh, that was happening and it was the uh, the applicants interest to continue that use they could apply for another three-year renewal uh, the city could then evaluate that at that time see if it still makes sense you know as an interim to have uh, that parking lot there or if the site is needed for um, for for redevelopment so that's why there's so, uh, the allowance for three-year renewals of the existing lots so at one do they get to renew after that three years? And when does temporary become kind of a permanent fixture? I know lots of them that have been around for decades, and the econo e economies of a, a surface parking lot are such that there's really not a lot of incentive to redevelop, which is exactly the opposite of where we want to go. So are we still being too lenient? It's an excellent point. Um, I, I don't uh, believe that at this time we're being too lenient. Um, I think that uh, um, this policy change is, is you know, taking another step towards uh, uh, stronger regulations for, uh, for the new lots. And then the existing temporary surface lots, um, the notion is that, you know, at, in three-year intervals, the city gets to reevaluate uh, if that's working for that site. And... Uh, the intent is that over time that those temporary surface parking lots would be phased out and uh, the ultimate vision of the Beltline Area Redevelopment Plan uh, of ultimate development there would be would be realized. So have we ever turned down a renewal? Uh, I, I'm not certain. I don't have that information. Um, 
at my fingertips. There's been lots of applications over the years, so I can't speak to every single one, but uh, um, it's any. in the realm of possibility that yeah. there, there has been one turned down. Here's dreaming about yeah. it. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Alderman Farrell. Reminder that this is time for questions of clarification. There will be time for more substantive questions of administration after the public hearing. Alderman Carra. Would this be an appropriate time to ask uh, for sort of a uh, synopsis of what the debate at CPC was? Or if there ever were a good time to ask that question, this would be an all right time to ask it. I'm not sure I like the uh, <laughs> the way you turn that phrase. <clears throat> yes, uh, at, when the uh, the report was before the the uh, Calgary Planning Commission, uh, there was some debate on the item. Uh, specifically, um, one uh, um, one uh, commission member uh, was concerned that uh, um, es essentially what uh, Alderman Hodges had picked up on that we were using the word should rather than shall. Uh, so there was uh, uh, that discussion, um, and that uh, that particular commission member actually uh, voted uh, against it in the end. It, it was a a split vote. Um, there was discussion about um, potential interim uses that could happen. So, if we're not allowing temporary parking lots, you know, what other types of of interim things um, could happen um, while ultimate development is is uh, is uh, is uh, forthcoming. And uh, um, so, some examples of interim uses that uh, have been utilized in urban uh, vacant lots. Uh, were provided. Those were kind of the, the highlights. There was some debate, or some, not debate, but comment um, about uh, um, whether parks could be uh, an interim use, open space, green space, recreation types of uses. Um, so, so that was also brought up. But those were the main points that I recall from the, the uh, Calgary Planning Commission uh, debate. Can you give me your professional opinion on should versus shall? And the appropriateness of this uh, versus I, I, I think that would better be a question for the council. Okay. And in fact, she's just written me a note. Okay. Which I will share when we finish the public hearing. Okay. Other questions of clarification? Alderman Keating. Thank you, Your Worship. I think my questions somewhat have been asked and answered, but uh, when I first read this, I, I sat here and said, why are we worried about temporary parking lots with the emphasis on the word temporary? And that's where I'm going is, is um, what are we to do with the land as it sits vacant, I guess. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, if I could, to, to help with this answer, if I could put another um, exhibit on the overhead. So, um, I guess to answer the first question, you know, why are we concerned with, with a temporary use? Uh, I've, I've put together a, uh, just a synopsis of um, some of the pros and cons of, uh, of this use uh, in the Beltline area. So um, I'll just go through them, and they're not meant to line up one for one uh, horizontally, but you know, some of the pros of, of uh, temporary surface parking is that uh, it does provide temporary improvements such as landscaping and lighting, uh, brings site activity to a vacant lot, uh, you know, it does accommodate a parking demand and it, there's a temporary business opportunity. Now, in terms of cons, uh, there is a disincentive to redevelopment, um, hindering the realization of the, the Beltline Area Redevelopment Plan. Uh, a site isn't as uh, likely to redevelop if it's already generating um, an income for, for the owner. Uh, decreases transit ridership with the Beltline Area being immediately south of the, the downtown. Um, uh, so there's an inconsistency with the Centre City Plan uh, that, is, that speaks to achieving uh, transit vehicle modal split uh, to 60%, limiting the creation of new permanent or temporary long-stay commercial parking facilities. Uh, also inconsistent with the key direction for land use and mobility number four, link land use decisions to transit. Uh, temporary parking in the Beltline is also inconsistent with Calgary Transportation Plan Policy uh, 3.9. D uh, that speaks to using time restrictions and pricing and those types of things to uh, address parking demand issues instead of increasing supply. 
Uh, there's a reduced business tax for um, uh, a temporary um, surface parking lot as opposed to C-class office. And the, the, uh, the argument there, the, the notion there is that um, in the Beltline there are, there are some C-class office buildings and depending on the office uh, market, demand for office, it might get to a point where it's more uh, economically viable to, to take down that old office building and put a, a temporary parking lot. Um, but that creates problems in the, the neighborhood and gaps in the, the street face and that type of thing. So, uh, and it also results in a, a, a lower tax base. Um, the parking lots detract from the urban mixed use and res residential character of the Beltline area, draws additional commuter traffic to the area, and again, the premature building demolition concerns. So, uh, those are kind of some of the thoughts as to why we're um, replacing this, uh, we're strengthening the, the limitation on, on temporary parking. Um, and uh, I'm not sure if that answers all of your question or not. Or not. Uh, if you could refresh my memory, please. No, I think it does. Uh, I, w I sat down because I wasn't. I was just wanted an explanation. Unfortunately, after hearing that, it it seems that the we're being restrictive and coercive in some of our reasonings. That's all. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman Keating. Again, questions of clarification, Alderman Marr. Thank you, um, Mr. Rockley. Why three years versus some other number? Is that an arbitrary number that we? that we had or was that something that uh, was negotiated between the property owners and the community and so on? <clears throat> for the purposes of this amendment, that's the, the length of time that uh, is in place now for, for temporary permits. So it's just continuing it's that. Continuing on that, the existing the, policy. The existing policy of three right. year renewals. Okay. There is a couple of buildings or lots in the Beltline that have approached me. Uh, one of them is a charitable organization, which I'm sure you're aware of the one that I'm speaking of that has uh, asked about extending beyond that time frame. We would still have the opportunity to do that, not necessarily through council, but uh, uh, my office coordinating with, uh, with planning. Is that not the case? They could put forward that, uh, that proposal with their, their application to, to have a, a longer length of time. Um, and uh, also there is um, the, this, this uh, is obviously the difference between the should and would will wording. Is that correct? <clears throat> well, if uh, so, sorry. Would this be a brand new temporary surface parking lot, or is this they've it's got existing. an existing and they're, existing. they're renewing? Yeah. So, yeah. so it would it would under this policy it would fall under the um, the the three years mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, deviation from that three years. There's really two things that could happen. Uh, they could proceed with the, the three year. Uh, permit and then renew after three years mm -hmm. uh, if that's their uh, if that suits them and and the city the other is they could um, uh, apply for um, a longer permit knowing that it is against this this policy um, stipulation of three years and then that could be um, decided on by the the approving authority and would the approving authority decide upon that at the counter in about two seconds, or is this something that would actually go through a process where there is some discussion and debate, preferably with the ward alderman? <clears throat> My, uh, I'm not that involved with the uh, the applications, um, but uh, um, a deviation from from policy. Um, my uh, my inclination is that that would be something that would go forward to uh, the planning commission and not dealt with at the counter. Um, that's, that's my um, understanding of, of what would happen. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, uh, so we would, I want to be able to be assured that there is some discretion, obviously I'm talking about the United Way here mm -hmm. and, their, and their parking. It's something that I'm, I'm very, very concerned about in the event that we decide, hey, it, that's it, and all these volunteers that are donating their time uh, are now looking for an alternate Mm -hmm. place to park so uh they can go to another temporary they can go to another temporary lot and then we you can also uh discuss that at sdab then too <laughs> by the way the invitation to sdab is uh, you can rescind that or you can refuse it at any time <laughs> thank you those are my questions for now your worship thank you thank you 
Did you have something you wanted to add? Just in case there was some confusion, Alderman Marr, through the chair, if I could, the wording of this would suggest, you're absolutely right, an applicant can apply for anything they want. We have no restriction on it. If this is approved, though, anything beyond a three-year renewal would be refused. It says no case can you renew beyond three years. So they came in and asked for six or nine or 20, and they said they wouldn't change it. You can apply, but if they say, well, that's what we want, That'll be a refusal, and then Alderman Hodges can deal with it at the TAB or somewhere else. The wording of this would not allow a renewal beyond another three-year term. Thanks very much. Um, we're still on questions of clarification. Boy, there's a lot of them for this one. Uh, Alderman Lowe? Oh, thank you very much. Um, the, the issue of uh, removable leaseholder improvements, do we have a way of, of making sure they don't fall into this repair? <clears throat> the, uh, the, the best process uh, in, in this uh, uh, approval uh, um, process is, uh, <clears throat> is the, the three-year renewals mm -hmm. uh, because it, at that three-year renewal, um, if there's a, a, an item of uh, the approval that uh, isn't being upheld or maintained to the same standard as, as when it was uh, uh, installed, then uh, those so we'd, could we'd, be addressed at the three-year renewal. We, we would rely on the complaints process or bylaw enforcement during the three years? Correct. Okay. Thank you very much. The, uh, and for uh, Alderman Farrell, I think at least two that I heard in DAB. And uh, for Alderman Karav, fundamentally, you just heard the debate at Planning Commission twice. And if you note, I sent it back once because I didn't like the language. So thank you. Alderman Putmans. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. Um, a couple of quick questions, please. In the event of a suspended construction site, and the goal to, for public safety purposes would be to raise the, uh, or to finish to grade, and I think the debate in the past has been should we have a parking lot or green space? It's typically a distressed situation. There are not a lot of options on the table. What would the implications be of this? It's, of course, never been consistent with the ARP, but isn't this handcuffing some of the options to a certain extent? <clears throat> this policy speaks specifically to uh, uh, temporary surface parking lots at grade. Uh, with, a, with a suspended uh, development site, um, there's a if they've built the the structure uh, oh, actually well okay we can go that there's several ways it can go but okay start with okay. that so if there's a structure involved um uh, this policy doesn't speak to to those those structures so that's Maybe a separate um and uh um so this i guess this policy is is specific to the the temporary surface at at, at grade so well, just the lot at grade I know in, in a few cases what was contemplated was uh, actually f just simply filling and packing the, the site for safety purposes and then leaving us without any kind of um, structure below grade, so filling it just with soil. Would, would this pro um, make it more difficult to install temporary parking as an option? Yes, yes. This policy, uh, if, it, if the site was just reclaimed back to grade, uh, to grade uh, and then there was, there was a proposal for a, a temporary surface parking lot, um, at that location, um, this policy would, would restrict that. And, and in fact, it says that, uh, that that should not be allowed. I noticed there's a comment about the uh, Victoria Park Business Revitalization Zone's comments on this. Was the 17th Avenue BRZ uh, asked for a comment on this? Uh, the, the 17th Ave, uh, Uptown 17th BRZ, uh, the, uh, uh, the 4th Street and the Victoria Crossing were all uh, requested, uh, asked for comments, and we received comments from the, uh, the Victoria uh, BRZ. And not the 17th, Uptown 17th? No. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman Putmans. Uh, we'll open the public hearing now. Are there any members of the public who would like to speak in favour of this proposal? Anyone would like to speak in favour? Hamilton. Thank you, Your Worship, members of Council. Uh, my name is William Hamilton. Uh, 
I happen to be in the neighborhood this afternoon, so to speak, and uh, in the absence of any other voices uh, in favor of the amendment proposed by administration today, I would like to uh, lend my voice in support of this amendment, and I would hope the council would support this amendment. Uh, I, come to, I come before you this afternoon as a uh, Beltline resident and small business owner. I have passed a few of the uh, temporary surface parking sites, and uh, although they have made some strides toward uh, beautifying the spaces, making, making the uh, temporary surface parking lots a little bit less than bare tarmac, I think it is important for council to uh, understand, certainly from, certainly from my standpoint, that fun fundamentally it is tarmac. It does little to, uh, it, do it does little to address my, my experience of uh, residing and uh, doing business and uh, undertaking recreational activities in the Beltline. It doesn't give me any particular incentive uh, to partake of the amenities in the neighborhood when I walk past uh, a foes, an airsat cedar fence and still see parking stalls behind, beyond them. I, I, I would ask council to support uh, this amendment before you, uh, your worship, and I, I would ask council to uh, remember that uh, e even under certain, even under whatever uh, clear and present exigent, exigent circumstances might exist, I, I would ask council to consider that uh, these temporary surface lots should remain temporary. With that, with that, I will leave council to its deliberations and uh, thank you for this opportunity to present today. Great. Thanks, Mr. Hamilton. Uh, Alderman Moore, question for Mr. Hamilton. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hamilton. Uh, Joelle says hi. We're well. Uh, okay, so I also wanted to mention that you are also a member and executive of the Beltline Community Association. You'd forgotten to say that. And also that uh, the Beltline Community Association president is speaking out in favor and sent a note that he couldn't arrive, something about snow, and uh, was also in support of this. So thank you for coming down and braving the cold. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Hamilton. Anyone else wish to speak in favor of this proposal? Anyone wish to speak in opposition to this proposal? Mr. Feck? Yes, Mayor Alderman. My name is Oscar Feck. <clears throat> I find this very discouraging, almost embarrassing. Here's a landowner, bought a piece of property, and he can even rent it out as parking. Are we living in a democracy or are we heading towards dictatorship? Part of the problem is the city is creating towards more control, like the Calgary Parking Authority is not making as much money as they used to because there's a lot of parking everywhere. This is partly why LRT, LRT uh, uh, transit is making less because people can park in the Beltline and only pay maybe $8 um, uh, uh, or 5 $6 a day in the next six months. That's why they use the cars. We are living in a democracy, I hope. Why are the government so against private enterprise? Because private enterprise pays your wages. You are getting paid through the taxpayers. Why do you want to control them and get rid of the middle class and create more poor, homeless, needy? Uh, no, it's not funny. It's, uh, it's the truth. This is what's happening. Look, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, the city didn't say anything because they hardly controlled any parking. But since they took over, they got the mo more parking spots than any company here in the city. Why are we doing it? You're hurting your own taxpayers. That is feeding you and your kids. Mayor Alderman, let's get rid of all the shenanigans. Just look at the taxpayers. They're the absolute power and should be, but they're not anymore. But let's get back and analyze everything, Mayor Alderman, and, and also the 
city officials, all the managers, the 120 managers uh, that apparently we have. What I'm saying about all this, we have created a monster of a bureaucracy and nothing is working, it seems. So let's get back, create the good common sense, because we all are all equal, not just a hierarchy. And I'm not knocking anybody, but that's where we're heading towards. That's what happened before the Roman Empire collapsed. We're heading the same direction. So let's stop all this. Analyze everything. It's supposed to be a democracy. So Mayor Alderman, Mayor, you start first. <laughs> You're a young guy, you got full of everything. Alderman, Alderman, a few of the aldermen around here would say I'm full of some things. Um, so thank you, Mr. Fack. I actually, I actually think this is a, a very valuable contribution to this uh, to this discussion, and I thank you for making it. Thank you. Take the bull by the horn and go to it. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak in opposition to this proposal? I'm Helen Mowat, and um, I'm very concerned what I've, I've seen today in council. And uh, as a citizen, I do not like it. And I do know the geopolitical politics that are being played. And I want uh, democracy, and I, dem I, I, I want democracy, and in, in addition to that, I want truth and honesty, and I want our councillors to stand up for the right intentions of the people, rather than for corporations or, or, or um, other, other groups in the world that, try, that can perhaps control us, or in the, that we're in a matrix. We have to be free citizens and be able to express our truth and we can only do that with proper education and a mind that goes beyond the left linear to the whole mind-body-soul connection. Ms. Mowat, on, on the issue, please. And I'm, I, we can only make proper decisions when we, we, uh, we, we go from right intentions rather than from evil, evil parameters. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mowat. Helpful for all of us to always remember. Anyone else wish to speak in opposition to this? All right then, um, do we have someone who would like to move these I'll, recommendations? I'll move the item in three readings, Your Worship. Thanks, uh, Alderman Lowe. Do I have a seconder? <laughs> Moved by Alderman Marr, seconded by Alderman Lowe. Any further discussion on this item? I actually do have a question for administration myself, but anyone else? I actually, um, Mr. Rockley, find it interesting that we are aiming for this blanket is exemption rather than looking at this case by case in terms of the various elements uh, that are that are you know uh, the the various elements of each particular proposal. Can you just say a word about why the blanket uh, prohibition, I suppose, on these temporary lots rather than a guideline or a policy uh, to put this right into a bylaw? <clears throat> Uh, we've we've taken the the approach uh, with with the revised wording um, <clears throat> because uh, uh, the existing policy um, it was it was meant to um, it was meant to to really limit the the temporary surface parking lots and uh, um, you know with with uh, 1,800 stalls of temporary surface parking um, being developed in the the Beltline since the approval of the the uh, area redevelopment plan, we felt that we did need to uh, to strengthen the intent of that policy, and <clears throat> um, we didn't uh, feel that it was appropriate to go to um, a shall uh, policy statement if we uh, if we said that the development of new temporary surface parking lots within the Beltline uh, shall not be allowed. Then then that's really the the blanket prohibition. Um, the approving authority can't. Um, can't decide on a on a on a very valid and and beneficial um, instance, 
So uh, we've taken this approach with, with the should, uh, should not be allowed um, to keep with um, the, the vision of the city for uh, redevelopment and the wishes of the community to, uh, to you know, do more uh, community building type of developments and, and not uh, parking lots. So um, if there is an instance where you know, a site can be uh, made safer um, uh, through, uh, through this, um, you know, there might be exceptional circumstances that, that can, that can uh, make sense. So that was why we took this approach. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Rockley. Thank you. And Ms. Flown, would you mind uh, just t uh, talking to us a little bit about Should and Shawl? Absolutely, Your Worship. This is one of my favorite topics, as many people know. There, um, there is a reason you went to law school, Ms. Flown. <laughs> um, Your Worship, can council put a must or a, sh or a shall into a policy document? Absolutely. Um, the question is, is it appropriate? Um, because the difficulty is the limitations contained in the Municipal Government Act when it comes to policy documents and the apparent, and I say apparent because there isn't any recent case law deciding this, um, lack of the ability of the development or subdivision authority to relax any mandatory requirements contained in policy. There is an ability to relax or vary from the requirements in a land use bylaw. The Municipal Government Act and the land use bylaw clarify that. However, there is some case law dating back many, many, many years um, and some slightly modified wording under the former Planning Act that suggests that perhaps a, um, a, plan, a policy document can be read down and perhaps can be relaxed. However, they were very unique circumstances and um, in the context of a direct control district and I think should be limited to those circumstances and it really creates um, a drain on resources particularly in the law department when we get in when we get involved in this protracted and arguably unnecessarily uh, unnecessary litigation for example uh, last year we had a policy and I don't know if, if many people are aware of it but there was um, a must buried in a definition in the parks open space master plan as it related to some improvements in uh, North Glenmore Park. And as a result of that little word, it, uh, it led to quite a few complications from a legal point of view and quite a bit of resources being, turned, uh, being uh, consumed in the courts and, and the legal process. So my recommendation is that in policy documents, unless you are absolutely adamant there will not be any exceptions to that rule, that you do not use the word must or shall, because the only way arguably that you can deviate from that is to come back to council and have a public hearing to modify that policy document. I hope that's helpful. Very helpful. Thank you, Ms. Flown. Any further discussion on this item? Very well then. On the recommendations, are we agreed? Any opposed? Call the roll, please. Alderman DeMong? No. Alderman Farrell? Yes. Alderman Hodges? Yes. Alderman Jones? Yes. Alderman Keating? No. Alderman Lowe? Yes. Alderman McLeod? Yes. Alderman Marr? Yes. Alderman Pincott? Yes. Alderman Putmans? Yes. Alderman Stevenson? Yes. Alderman Carr? Yes. Alderman Chabot? Alden collier -Cott? Yes. Mayor Nenshi? No. It's carried, George. All right, then, on the bylaw 8P2011, first reading, are we agreed? agreed. Any opposed? Alderman Chabot, DeMong, Keating, <coughs> opposed. What happens when I say same division? <laughs> oh, same division. Thank you. Second reading, <laughs> second reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Same division? Yes. All right. Eh, that's very handy. Authorization for third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Third reading of the bylaw, same division? Are we agreed? All right. Thank you. Something new. I like learning new things. That takes us to the end of our public hearing. Um, portion of the agenda that takes us to agenda item number 9.1 city manager reports we'll wait for the musical chairs to occur here thanks Jeff.
Alright, we good to go? All right, so now we are at 9.1.1 C201105 Airport Trail Underpass. I understand we have a presentation from administration to get us started. Um, Alderman Stevenson, are you going to wait till? Okay. Uh, can you go mm -hmm. shift it? Yeah. <laughs> Believe it or not, it was on today's agenda. I know no one noticed, but. <laughs> Mr. Thank you, Your Worship. We're just trying to get. Uh, there we go. Excellent. Thank you. Ready? Thank you. Let me, just before you start, Mr. Logan, let me suggest um, a potential path for us to deal with this issue. Um, we'll listen to your presentation. We'll have questions of clarification for you. Then I believe Alderman Stevenson is going to move to table further consideration of the item until the discussion of the in-camera portion. We'll do the in-camera portion, then we'll come back into public. That's all subject to council's decision, but that's sort of the overall thought of how this may move forward. He'll do his presentation. We'll ask any questions of clarification out here. Alderman Stevenson, I think, he'll nod, is going to move that we then table consideration of the public item until after we deal with the in-camera report. We'll go in-camera, talk about the in-camera report, come back out here and have the debate. Make sense? Alderman Lowe? Well, Your Worship, I would like to suggest a slight alter, alteration to that. And this, okay. we, we hear uh, Mr. Logan's presentation in that, then go in camera because, quite Be frankly... Before the questions? Yes, quite okay. frankly, because I, I can't separate two All reports right. of my questioning. Okay, that's fine. I'll, 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 uh, I'll recognize Alderman Stevenson as soon as Mr. Logan is done. Mr. Logan. Thank you, Your Worship, and good afternoon, members of Council and... Um, I will be making certain comments in my presentation. They're taking into account that there are people that are watching this via the TV or internet. Today's report is reporting back on Notice of Motion 2010-42, and that Notice of Motion instructed administration to come back with a business case for a roadway to be built at the same time as the fourth runway at the Calgary International Airport. As part of that Notice of Motion, we were instructed to conduct an analysis of the network and the links currently under construction and future links that would be coming. We were instructed to review studies um, of roadways in the area. We were also instructed to analyze options, specifically cost estimates and how it could be staged. We were instructed to look at funding options. And finally, we were instructed to report back on the impact of this project on the 10-year capital plan. If I could start the presentation with a little bit of a uh, a history or background on where we've come with this subject. In the early 1990s, 1992 to be specific, the Calgary Airport Authority took over ownership of the Calgary International Airport from the federal government and were tasked with uh, operating maintaining that infrastructure. As part of their management of the airport facility, they undertook an airport master plan in 2004. A sub-study of that master plan was to look at the airport trail and that 2005 study looked at the east-west link that was contemplated underneath the fourth runway and exactly what that piece of infrastructure would look like, how it would integrate into access to the terminal, and approximately how much it would cost. That study was done jointly between the city and the airport authority. In 2006 and 2007, the City of Calgary's Transportation Department undertook our Transportation Infrastructure Investment Plan at which time we, didn't, we did not have a firm timing for the fourth runway construction, which is, um, answers a question we're often asked is, why wasn't this a priority previously? In 2008, the, uh, the airport was moving forward with their plans on a very firm note, and by early 2009, we were under uh, detailed discussions about how we might be able to construct the airport tunnel as part of the airport's project. Um, in 2010, the, uh, the airport authority proceeded with securing the team to build their new facility. And in 2010, we also had a civic election whereby the discussion of the airport project and the airport runway was an active topic of discussion in the civic election. And finally, we're here today 
to discuss the plans on how we might be able to move forward or not. In 2004, the airport master plan identified a new international arrivals and departures facility as well as a fourth runway to support increased movement. The, the long range plan at this time was for about 27,000, uh, 27 million passenger movement through the airport per year. And it looked at about a 2025 horizon for that type of passenger movement. The 2005 study that I have an exhibit of in the bottom left was the airport arrival and departure roadway network that was contemplated to tie into the airport master plan from 2004. And you'll note that that does take into consideration expansion of the terminal area to the southeast, which is currently the project underway, and how we would tie into a free flow airport trail as well as the industrial commercial areas north of the airport on City of Calgary lands. Uh, it's important to note that the uh, Barlow Trail closure, which was, which was contemplated as part of the fourth runway construction, takes place on a roadway that the city does not own. And I think there's members of the public that aren't aware that airport trails sitting on federally owned lands that are controlled under the lease by the Calgary Airport Authority. And the city does not have discretion as to when those when that runway, or when that runway construction would go ahead and when the roadway would be closed. The airport trail connection has been part of our long range transportation plans for quite some time. Uh, it has been, um, it's also part of our primary transit network, specifically linking the Northeast LRT from a station contemplated north of the Saddletown station at approximately airport trail westward underneath the runway, going through the terminal area in some manner and tying into the future North Central LRT line with a stop contemplated just west of the Deerfoot Trail tying into the regional commuter rail, future high-speed rail and the aforementioned North Central LRT line. It's estimated in our long-range traffic forecasting that about five to 10,000 um, passengers per day would use that east-west primary transit linkage. Airport Trail was also considered to be a primary goods movement corridor connecting through the large industrial commercial complex which surrounds the airport. As you may be aware, um, development in the vicinity of an airport and its runways is, is restricted due to the noise emission or the NEF corridors which restrict residential development on the approach and departure areas from airports. So there's going to be a large commercial industrial complex associated with this airport and airport trail is contemplated as a primary goods movement corridor in and out of that area. Airport trail is also, has also been planned to tie into the primary highway network for the province. And this uh, slide illustrates the ring road complex in the northeast shown in light blue. That roadway is now open and in operation. And as part of the construction of the northeast ring road, the province constructed an interchange at the 96th Avenue or airport trail location, which is shown in the lower left part of the slide. That interchange has been built and is sitting there waiting connection to our overall road network. Just a quick overview of the airport's development plans, which are, which are um, dictating the timeline that we're working towards. The airport has two major plans as part of their airport development program. The first is the International Facilities Project or a large extension to their terminals to handle increased uh, traffic to and from the United States and other part of the world. That's approximately a $1.4 billion undertaking. And supporting the overall <coughs> airport complex is the runway development program, which is a new 14,000 foot runway to be built approximately one mile east of the existing runway. And that's about a $600 million undertaking. This facility would handle, as I mentioned before, about 27, 27 million passengers per year and uh, should easily accommodate the population growth in the region to the 2025 horizon. I, I suspect beyond that, but that was just the information that I saw online. Uh, this exhibit illustrates approximately where the runway is relative to the airport trail. Uh, the dashed red line represents the, the alignment of airport trail underneath the runway. And uh, this helps to illustrate the length of tunnel required to go on the west end underneath the two taxiways on the west side of the runway, 
carrying underneath the, the runway to the east side or the what's called taxiway tangle, which is shown on the lower left side of the runway. Um, in prior studies done in support of council directives, we did look at a segmented or continuous tunnel. We've also met with Transport Canada to discuss that topic, and it's been made clear to us that a segmented tunnel would not be deemed acceptable to the Airport Authority or Transport Canada. So all of the planning that we did with respect to building a link underneath the tunnel takes into consideration a continuous tunnel. Where we sit today is the airport trail will be closed on April 3rd by the Calgary Airport Authority in conjunction with the construction of their runway. They've been asked to look at deferring that. We've been briefed on why that is necessary and it relates to the movement of earth from the terminal area and in relation to the, the movement of earth on the airport side. They need to do this work in 2011 so that they can start constructing the runway in 2012 and be ready to operate on that runway in 2014. Again, I wanted to point out that Barlow Trail is not a public road for those that are not aware of that. It's part of the airport lands and as such, it's, it's governed under the, the lease that they have with the federal government. The city is investing in infrastructure to handle the immediate traffic changes as a result of the Barlow Trail closure. But those are the short-term traffic needs, not the long-term traffic needs. And councils asked administration to review uh, the impacts of this closure, which gets me to the last part of the presentation. We looked at three macro options. The first option was the typically called the do nothing option and that would be to abandon the airport trail alignment underneath the fourth runway and to accommodate the shift in traffic on the area road networks. What we anticipate is this would add approximately two interchanges that we hadn't previously planned on Country Hills Boulevard at 36th Street East and at Barlow Trail. Uh, we would also need to maintain the plans for our interchanges along Métis Trail, north of McKnight Boulevard, 64th Avenue, 80th Avenue, 96th Avenue or Airport Trail and up to Country Hills Boulevard. And at some point in the future, there would be, there would be grade separations in and out of the terminal area, but that's not included in the cost estimate in the upper left. And that's sort of a today dollar figure of what it would cost to build these uh, grade separations in the area. We would have the opportunity to um, probably downgrade 96th Avenue east of the airport lands, and I would suggest change that from an expressway to a major and change the access considerations along with that. I believe that this would have land use implications along Country Hills. We would have Country Hills Boulevard needing to handle quite a bit more traffic. Um, we have previously approved commercial development along that corridor along with multiple points of access, and it would be difficult to try to handle significant increase in traffic flow as well as multiple points of access so there will be an impact on the land development as it comes in over time and and finally we will lose our ability to have a primary transit corridor from the east lrt into the terminal area and and beyond, and further to the west over time on the positive side it does eliminate a lot of the risks that council is going to have to discuss in more detail later today and it also preserves our current capital planning the next option is the build later option, which would see us boring um, probably two or three tunnels underneath the runway over time. We'd certainly have to bore um, a fairly large tunnel to handle the projected traffic, and we could possibly bore a separate tunnel for LRT. The exhibit shows a dashed line south of the alignment uh, for LRT, but that's really just for clarity. It would be in the roadway alignment. That's just to make this slide a little bit clearer in the report. Uh, this plan also preserves our current capital plan as the, as the incremental road improvements would occur over time. However, I would advise Council that due to, due to the traffic congestion that would occur over time, I suspect that there would be a tremendous amount of pressure from the public to make incremental road improvements, um, which will effectively cause us to build the do-nothing option because the bore, tunnel boring option is so expensive that it would take quite a bit of time before we would get to a point of congestion that was so severe that the public would demand that we go ahead and bore these tunnels. Uh, there's a significant risk involved in, in tunneling later because we would be going underneath an active runway and we're not certain that that would be something that would be permissible to either the airport authority or the federal government. Finally, option three is the build now option, which is the option that we have been discussing to a large extent over the last two years. Uh, we believe that at the end of the day, it represents the lowest cost option in that 258.8 million 
is our construction cost estimate for a roadway from Barlow Trail through to Stony Trail. It does not include the finance required, the finance charges required. Uh, we believe that there's a potential by pursuing this road network to eliminate future interchanges along Métis Trail, which would have a cost savings at some point in the future. Um, we believe that it provides a, an excellent east-west connection between Deerfoot Trail and Stony Trail. Uh, Country Hills Boulevard would proceed as planned as an arterial, commercial arterial corridor with a, um, with a more urban corridor in nature under the new Calgary Transportation Plan. We would protect our primary transit link and we would, at the end of the day, end up with a better overall transportation network in the Northeast. This slide illustrates how we would, uh, Council asked us to come back with a opportunity to phase the construction or to have incremental construction of the facility. So section A is the section that's on airport lands and that's the section that we would absolutely have to build in conjunction with the tunnel. Um, section B would extend from 36th Street to Métis Trail to the first sort of arterial or expressway linkage in the area. And finally, section C would connect from Métis Trail over to 60th and create a continuous connection through to Stony Trail. On the right-hand side of the exhibit, you'll see the portion of Airport Trail or 96th Avenue that we were building in 2011 as a connection to the Ring Road, which we have, um, we have an obligation to the province to complete that work. And farther to the west, we also have construction underway for the linkage from Deerfoot Trail over to the Aurora Business Park across Nose Creek. Construction of interchanges along this corridor would be planned for, but would not be undertaken until a later date. There should be a diamond shown on the 36th Street alignment. We would anticipate that there would be a, a, at least a partial interchange at that location. Um, cost breakdown for these different phases are, the first portion on airport lands is approximately 198 million, just under 200 million. And then the further extensions to the east are an additional 10 million and an additional 14 million. This information is all included in your uh, council report under attachment one. In response to council's request that we try to uh, minimize the cost wherever possible, we took a, a further look at the cross section in the design standard. We had to balance a um, building a very long term facility and allow for flexibility with trying to reduce the initial cost. Uh, we came up with a design that has two, um, two cells, so there'd be separate pieces with connections between the two sides, approximately 16 meters wide each cell. It would be a 615 meter long uh, section. There would be a provision, the dimension within these, this tunnel would allow for either a dedicated busway or a dedicated rail-based transit system. As a, uh, from a design point of view, we used our existing LRT cars as a uh, sort of a benchmark. They're probably larger than the transit vehicles that we might see in the future if it was a hot rail versus an overhead power line. Um, the initial phase would see at least two lanes of traffic in each direction tying into the, road, uh, the roadway at either end. There would be an opportunity to add primary transit or an HOV lane in each direction. We would use standard shoulder widths and there would also be sufficient room to add pedestrian and cycle facilities on one side. Um, however, as I've stated before, we don't necessarily recommend that. The overall project cost is comprised of the, the tunnel section with the roadway at top, the extensions farther to the east sections B and C as I previously illustrated, which gives you a total road cost of about 222 million. We then have to add additional costs which have been identified by the airport authority for redesign, um, delay costs and other costs uh, to modify their project as well as special insurance that we would have to carry on this project which we typically don't have to carry on a construction project. And that brings us to a total construction cost estimate of about $258.8 million. That, construction, that cost estimate has been reviewed by our engineers at least three times and has also been reviewed by an independent engineering firm uh, to vet that number as instructed by council. And I would, I would say that the, uh, the variation in the number is becoming very small 
And interestingly enough, it is, um, it's quite similar to the number that we presented to council about two years ago. So I'm pretty confident that the construction cost is, is in this order of magnitude. However, as council knows, we don't have a tremendous amount of excess capital available at this time. And we will need to finance um, a good portion of the monies to build this project now. Building now is dictated by the airport's uh, timeline, but other commitments have been made. It's, it's not dissimilar to building a house where uh, you know there's the cost of the house and then there's the cost of the mortgage on top of that. We took a look at how would we finance this construction cost based on the funds that we have available to us today. We had a, identified MSI funding. Uh, we have contingency funds which have previously been identified for this project. There's the innovation fund which was discussed by council at an earlier meeting in the order of $123 million, which is not currently committed to a specific project. Uh, transportation does have a, um, a small amount of MSI monies which are not currently committed. Additional funds are needed. Uh, we took a look at other projects which are not um, at the contractual obligation stage. And our program 543, which is allowing for the provincial ring road connector, specifically um, the tie-ins on lands outside of the provincial ring roads and our obligations to tie our network into the province's ring road. We still have funds available there that are uncommitted. Even after taking into consideration all the links that we have committed to, uh, specifically on the southeast portion that's under construction now. And we'd be required to find at least another $31 million to uh, bridge the gap, if you will, your, uh, your worship. And finally, there, uh, <clears throat> we're suggesting a allocation of $25 million for the reserve, from the reserve for future capital, totaling $295 million worth of funding for this project. So in conclusion, Your Worship, um, as instructed by the notice of motion, we've, in, we've investigated the technical aspects of this project, and we find that there will be substantial investment required in the Northeast Road Network, regardless of the decision on an airport trail, that the airport underpass results uh, in the best overall transportation network, including primary transit access to YYC. The projected cost is approximately $295 million for the recommended design, and the project can be phased. However, the airport vicinity section must commence immediately if it's to be built in conjunction with the new fourth runway. Uh, the recommendations that are outlined in the covering report um, are designed around proceeding, uh, specifically their authorization to commence detailed design, authorization for the city manager, GM transportation, and GM of corporate services to commence detailed negotiations on a preliminary agreement with the authority based on information which will be presented to you in, in the, uh, the following in-camera report, and to proceed only if satisfactory preliminary agreement can be reached, uh, to approve a budget allocation of $294.8 million, and to give first reading to the borrowing bylaw. The specific wording of those recommendations is is on the first and second pages of your report. That concludes my presentation, Your Worship. Thank you very much, Mr. Logan. And before we get into all the details on this, I just want to make sure that uh, I express my thanks, and I know I speak on behalf of all members of council for the work that's been done across city departments in a remarkably short period of time uh, to bring us this report in your own department, in corporate services, the city solicitor, uh, and in finance. So I just wanted to say thank you to all of the folks around the city who put in a heck of a lot of hours uh, to get us to where we are today. So thank you for that. Alderman Stevenson. Thank you, Your Worship. Well, there are, as I've talked to many of my colleagues, a lot of questions, and especially about the in-camera report. And I understand that there are some parts of the in-camera report that can be made public, but uh, I don't think anyone knows which ones can be and which ones can't be. So I, I would uh, like to, I would move that we move into the corporate boardroom for the in-camera discussion and then come back out for the debate. So hold on, so your motion is to table further consideration of this item. Exactly what I said. Until after the yeah. next item and also to move in camera in the corporate boardroom now. Right. Can I reconvene as Madam Clerk will catch all of that. <laughs> um, and we will reconvene as a committee of the whole in camera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, seconded by Alderman Jones. So on that motion then, are we agreed? Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Alderman Chabot. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, 
I, Alderman Stevenson indicated that there are portions of this report that can be made public and portions of it that can't. And he wasn't clear about what couldn't be. And I, I went through it and I can't see what can't be. Can we have that discussion in camera, Alderman Chabot, and then we'll bring out whatever uh, we'd like to make public? Well, the only issue I have with this, Your Worship, is that I'm not comfortable with going in camera on a report that I think should be made public and should be discussed in public unless somebody can demonstrate to me or tell me what it is that's so important that we can't discuss it in public. Uh, I, 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 I can here. certainly try, and the gentleman on both sides of me just said the same thing which is um, what is contained in the in-camera report is negotiating strategy for the further round of negotiations on this project. And that's why administration is recommending that we discuss it in camera, as we always do with negotiating strategies. So is it an obligation that we discuss this in camera? I'm trying to understand that, Your Worship. No, it's certainly not an obligation. Council can do what council wants, um, and if you want to bring it out here, you can. I suspect Mr. Tully would tell us that there would be significant risk in doing so until we've had a chance to talk about it. Ah, uh, so as soon as we get to that line of questioning, then, then at that point, for sure, we would have to go in camera. Yeah, well, I, I can't really support the idea of going in the camera and presupposing a line of questioning, so I'm not going to be supporting the motion to go in camera. And Your Worship, yes. I was going to ask if you wouldn't be you would be so kind as to recognize me, being as I'm up and you've given me the floor. Sure. When we return back, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I will relinquish the floor. No, you can keep it. No, no, no. No, no. I'd rather wait. Right. Thank you. Any other discussion on the motion to now move in camera? Alderman Collier Cart? So, uh, you're, uh, I guess to Mr. Tully, uh, some of us have a lot of questions around risk and the different risk elements. And these are sort of intertwined in the public report and in this private report. So it would be my hope to have an open discussion around risk. And would you deem that to be to compromise the corporation? Mr. Tully? Your Worship, it depends on the nature of the questions. Um, so I think it's appropriate to have the discussion in camera first and then to come out and discuss the matter uh, in public, Your Worship. I think there are some negotiating strategies that are embedded in the text of that report that would be inappropriate to reveal in a public way because we are getting into a discussion uh, with another party about plan values, plan values uh, risk, uh, indemnities, those types of provisions. And in my view, it's inappropriate to uh, reveal what could well be a negotiating strategy to another party that may well, in some, in some of these instances, be adverse in interest, Your Worship. Thanks, Mr. Uh, Tully. Thank you, Mr. Tully. I, That's a much more eloquent explanation of what I was trying to say. I, I think that just shows the difficulty when we can't have an open discussion around risk, but yet we're being asked to support a huge amount of money uh, in relation to this. So for that reason, I can't support going in camera. Thank you. Alderman Marr. Thank you. Um, sounding like a broken record, but I'm echoing my colleagues' concerns about this. We all campaigned on a vigorous input from our citizens. We were saying that we want to have open and transparent government, notwithstanding the fact that uh, what we're hearing from, from law, uh, I think that when we're being asked to spend the kind of money that we are, when we're asked to, to, to make this leap, which has huge implication, implications for us as a municipality for perhaps the next decade or more, uh, I can't support the idea of us not going out and explain to Calgarians the, the predicament that we are in as a result of this, uh, of, of this negotiating strategy. So I will not be supporting going in camera at this time. I will remind all of Council that much as this is an interesting debate to have, Council chooses when to come out of camera and Council chooses what to discuss when we're out of camera. Administration is asking for the ability to present all of the information and then we can have a discussion about what to bring out. So we're, we're being a bit red herring here uh, on this discussion uh, as far as I'm concerned. Alderman Lowe? Well, I don't agree we're being a bit red herring at all, Your Worship. The, uh, the issue of risk is a major subject of discussion at any board. And I'm... I'm I'm very concerned about any constraints and I, I, what I think will happen and I'll, I'll, I'm going to depart from my colleague's suggestion that we and, and support going in camera by fear, Your Worship, my fear 
is that coming out to rise and report on the advice of council and bearing in mind the, the language of the MGA about keeping in confidence those things which are to remain in confidence, which is a rule by which I govern myself around here, that acting on the advice of council on subjects that are cannot be spoken because they may or may not form part of a negotiating tactic will severely limit my ability to really get into the issue of risk in a public way. And I think it's critically important that Calgarians have a view of the risk that we're going into. I spent the weekend on it, and I don't think I'm anywhere near as complete on it as I would like to be. And I, but I think it's important that we have this, because we are, at the end of the day, if you go to item uh, section three, number three on the uh, bylaw we're going to be asked to pass, it says if there's any deficiency, we raise taxes. And without understanding what the cost and the implications of risk on the, co the, the value we're putting on this might be, I'm not sure that we'll have the information before us that uh, would enable us to deal with the matter until the discussions with the airport authority are further down the road. So I'm just looking at the normal business process of dealing with risk at a board level, trying to translate it into our responsibility to Calgarians. And while I will support going in camera, I'm very, very concerned about what we will be allowed to discuss when we come out. So having said that, Your Worship, I will support going in, but I'm very, very concerned about, and I'm going to ask Mr. Tully, when we come out in public, to very clearly explain why he'll, I'm sure he'll explain it to us in, in camera, he always does, he's very good about that. But when, he, when we come out, that again, the instructions he's given to us with respect to the areas that we cannot enter in a public uh, debate are clearly spelled out so that Calgarians understand the constraints we're under when we're trying to make this decision. Can you take that undertaking, Mr. Sully? Very well, thanks, Alderman Lowe. On the motion to go in camera, then, uh, Alderman Farrell. Thank you. Well, this is difficult because I share my colleagues' concerns about the, the uh, in-camera report, and uh, I think we need to discuss it in the light of day, eventually. Perhaps um, there could be a compromise where we don't agree to make any decisions on the, the future of the tunnel until the uh, contents of negotiations are made public, if we're putting the corporation at risk. We can certainly so we can, discuss that. We can assess that in camera, um, but uh, that, that's the direction I would like to go. Thanks, Alderman Farrell. Anyone else on this one? Alderman Stevenson, did you want to close? Thank you, Your Worship. I'm not sure where some of my colleagues are going because all of us are very concerned about the risk side of it, but uh, the thing is that when we come to the uh, uh, the discussion in public here, we're going to know then what we can talk about and what we can't. And so to to actually start this whole discussion in public here without the advice of council on some of the important issues would be, it would just be silly. It would not be, uh, it would not be um, right for us. So please support the go in camera. Thanks. Very well then. I have a request for a recorded vote on this, please. Yeah, I know.
On the recorded vote, Alderman Marr against, Alderman Hodges for, Alderman Farrell for, Alderman Carra for, Alderman collier Cart against, Alderman Chabot against, Alderman DeMong for, Alderman McLeod for, Alderman Lowe for, Alderman Popemans for, Alderman Keating for, Alderman Stevenson for, Alderman Jones for, Alderman Pincock for, Mayor Ninchy for, that's carried your worship. Alderman Jones. Your Worship, I move to uh, rise and report. Thank you. Do I have a seconder? Second. Thanks, Alderman Stevenson. Are we agreed? Agreed. Very well. Alderman Jones. On C-2011-06, Airport Trail Underpass Supporting Information, the Council received this report for the information in support of Report 2011-05, Airport Trail Underpass, and that this report and the attachments to it remain confidential pursuant to sections 23-1B, 24-1B, 24-1C, 25-1C, and 27-1B of the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act. Thanks, do I have a seconder? Alderman Putmans, thank you. Are we agreed? Any opposed? Oh, call the roll, please. Alderman Farrell. Alderman Hodges? No. Alderman Jones? Yes. Alderman Keating? Yes. Alderman Lowe? Yes. Alderman McLeod? Yes. Alderman Marr? Yes. Alderman Pincott? Yes. Alderman Putmans? Yes. Alderman Stevenson? Yes. Alderman Carra? Yes. Alderman Chabot? No. Alderman collier No. Alderman Demont? Yes. Mayor Nenshi? Yes. It's carried, Your Worship. Thank you. So we're back to discussion then of um, 2011 I think was the number. Uh, still on the airport trail underpass, uh, Alderman Farrell. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Um, I have a number of questions. Thank you. To, uh, to Mr. Logan. Mr. Logan, who wrote this report? It was a, uh, a collection of several authors, but at the end of the day, I sign it. You signed it, so yes. I'm accountable for it. It does have your name on it. Um, Mr. Logan, I've never seen a report like this before. The stakeholder consultation overview. Um, what's your thought on that section, page one of seven of attachment two? My thoughts on that section? Yes. Um, one of, the, one of the challenges with writing this report was to respond to council as rapidly as possible on an infrastructure project where we were not going through a normal process. And one of the parts of the normal process that we were not following was public engagement. And we were struggling to try to communicate to council how we had assessed the public's position on this particular piece of infrastructure. So with respect to the, to the first part of this, uh, where we discuss the um, results of the civic election, the intent was to try to represent that this issue had been discussed broadly in the public and that as represented by members of council, some of the members of council felt that that election represented a, uh, a public opinion on that particular issue. Um, we did undertake to disseminate as much information as we could on the web and invite, uh, inf invite comment. In fact, on our website, I think it's the first time we've ever invited people to comment on our blog, on our city news blog on the topic. We, uh, we produce videos and we also held stakeholder events to try to get um, opinions. So I think the intent of including that unusual information was to try to 
somehow assess what the public opinion on this project was. Okay, well, I know that there were many issues discussed during the election. Um, I don't see it as a plebiscite on the tunnel, um, nor do I see the decision today as a vote of confidence or non-confidence of our mayor, as was indicated in the paper today. I see it as a vote on a major infrastructure project. And I was so disappointed in seeing this. I was disappointed because I don't know if we generally include um, newspaper online surveys as a reason to justify a decision. I mean, it's a single question. There's no dollar value. Mm -hmm. um, during the election, there were many numbers thrown out there. A hundred million was what I heard over and over again. So I, I, I hope this isn't an indication of a new way of writing reports. And I have to say, I, I find this so disturbing. Um, so I, I'll leave it at that. Um, at that time as well, we, we were talking about four partners um, at the table, including the airport authority, the feds, the province, and the city. And uh, there was also an accusation that the previous mayor was disingenuous when he went to ask for money. And I think we've learned that any attempts, I'm sure, were gen genuine because they've been repeated. And the answer was the same result. Um, so Mr. D'Antoni's letter that we received, a huge respect for Mr. D'Antoni. Um, I'm trying to find it here. Um, he raises some concerns that the consequences of not doing the tunnel or the underpasses, my husband calls it the tundra pass. I love um, that. Love it. Do you? Good. Yeah. It's probably not new. Um, th that the consequences of not doing it have been inflated, that we don't need to do all those interchanges at this point in time, that that would be well, well into the future. What's your comment on that? Did you I read Mr. D'Antoni's letter? I do not have Mr. D'Antoni's letter. Um, if it's Ed Edward D'Antoni? It's Edward. Yes, okay, yep. yes, I know mm -hmm. that individual. And he is, uh, with his background in, as the former head of the roads department, has a, has a fairly reasoned opinion. Yes. Um, I would share that opinion. I would say that over time, we will have to build um, the infrastructure that's represented in the attachment one would be built over time. Uh, the unusual thing about this piece of infrastructure, it's unlike any I've ever seen council have to consider in that we have to build it. No. We have to basically build it before the problem exists, not after the problem exists. Mm -hmm. And um, so the intent of the, of the report is not to say that we have to build it now, it's to say over time we will have to build as much if not more. Mm -hmm. and, it, and this flies, it's consistent with the, um, the multiple parallel routes theory in, in neighborhood design. If you put all the traffic on one street, it has to be a bigger street. And so what, what he said in his letter is, compared to the tunnel route, the only extra road work to go around the runway consists, consists of two miles of straight road, I'm, he hasn't converted to kilometers yet, and one intersection that was planned in the future. The interchange at 96th and Métis Trail under the mayor's plan can be moved north to Country Hills Boulevard, who will benefit from the tunnel, the future 30,000 homes and businesses in the area. So I suppose that same argument could be made for um, road improvements on the second busiest roadway in the city, which is Crotal Trail. Uh, you've included in your report the cost of congestion. Have mm -hmm. we talked about the comparisons of, of the other priority projects in the city? Um, that one is one from University to Drew uh, Memorial Drive, Twinning Highway 8. Um, have, have, we, have we looked at the cost of congestion in those? And is that how we justify our tips list? And Because this wasn't on it. Correct. The, um, um, thank you, Worship. I mean, that is a, that's an excellent question. And typically, we would come to council with a 10-year infrastructure program taking into consideration all of those various programs and all of those various transit projects and road projects and comparing the cost benefit of each. In this case, no, we have not. Okay. And then uh, how would you see this? Um, 
with with the estimated number of users and how would you see this in comparison with other projects because from what I see we're and we're emptying the cupboard and we've established a set of priorities through planet that talk about a more sustainable future and yet we're um, it, it's like Mildred the plant in the little shop of horrors feed me feed me you, you can't feed that beast <laughs> she's never satisfied so I am um, it's, it's a matter of trade-offs, and yet we're taking all the residual funds that we have available and pouring it, pour it, pour it, in, pour it into one project. And I, I have a problem with that if it's not justified. You, um, Your Worship, I, I, believe that, I believe that this is actually a similar situation that we're looking at 20 years before it happens as what you've described on Country Hills, or sorry, uh, Crowchild Trail. Um, I honestly believe that by having a barrier that is is the the fourth runway, and having the amount of distance that you would have to travel to get around it, regardless of how you're traveling, that you are naturally going to create pinch points, just the same as you would at a river crossing. Mm -hmm. And I believe what we've we are in a situation where, particularly on the north side, we've made decisions, we've made land use decisions, we we have not protected right of ways. And uh, we will be in a very difficult situation to try to build our way out of that. And um, the hard part is, is, is really sensing the urgency without the problem being out there. But um, that, I guess that's my job to, to try to advise council on what we forecast 20 years down the road. So there are benefiting landowners here. There's yes. been significant pressure from those landowners and hoteliers. Why are they not being asked to contribute through some sort of development levy? I know we have given approvals. You can't go back in time, or can you? I don't know. Um, but why wouldn't we ask them to share in the burden, as they will be benefiting? Um, Your Worship, I, I, th I, I would agree with you. I think there are tremendous benefiting landowners by having this in. I do, I do think that it not only protects what we've already approved, but it, it offers the opportunity for more intensive land use. Uh, I would say that the airport is one of those landowners. Mm -hmm. um, if we were to look at a, a benefiting area levy, uh, I would I would need to get advice from the law department as to our latitude to be able to do that. I think it's something that we, if possible, we we should look at exploring. Yes, if I am. Um, move ahead in this. I have an amendment prepared. I do. Thank you. Um, now, the idea of a toll, I, I kind of like the idea of toll roads. I know the first one is painful. They, they make a lot of sense because they assign a cost to a decision. But the justification, and we, I believe the airport authority examined the feasibility of a toll. It's kind of like a 3P. The toll company analyzed it, and they said there were enough alternate routes that people would avoid paying the toll. And so doesn't that in itself suggest that this may not be needed, that we may have other priorities? I, Your Worship, when we, we did take a look at cursory look at a toll and what that would amount to, uh, certainly in the short term, those alternative routes have have modest congestion and they, and they represent an attractive route. The hard part is you have to start paying the bills right away. So, um, I, I would say that out of all the roads in Calgary that we've looked at building, this is probably one of the best opportunities to try out a, a toll. Um, I can't read council's mind as to how what their appetite is to try to do that. Mm -hmm. And I would suggest that we would have to go into it realizing that it's going to take us a while to get that in place mm -hmm. and that and that the uh, the toll would ha probably have to be adjusted up over time and it would have to be much more modest at the at, at this first stage. At the first stage. Yeah. So that's a decision that we could make now and then we could determine whether it's successful if we want to go down the roads of tolls at all. Um, so the city doesn't own the land and that poses its own set of risks. Mm -hmm. Of course, we heard about them in committee and I find them quite concerning. One of them is the issue of security. Now we're seeing what's happening in Egypt. That could be a good thing. It could be a very, very bad thing. I think people are quite worried with what's happening in the Middle East. Um, the idea of airport security mm -hmm. in around the world <coughs> is, um, something I think we're grappling with. So the risk of us not owning the land um, and it being shut down by the feds, 
what is the, I mean, how have you explored the extent of that risk? And do you see that risk changing over time? I suppose we could turn it into an art gallery if we had to shut it down. I don't know. We've got a tunnel underneath, uh, underneath uh, City Hall that's mm -hmm. empty. I don't think it has any air to it. Otherwise, we could use it for something. Your Worship, um, there's two different aspects of that that we, that we considered. First off would be, what is the likelihood that the federal government might come in and ask us to, to close, the toll, or close the tunnel? I think that if the tunnel represents a benefit to the public and a benefit particularly to the airport, it's unlikely that they would be motivated to see us close it. And that I would say is, is consistent with um, you know, some of the feedback that we've had. Now with respect to the security, if, if there was a security incident at somewhere in the world, let's say, would they choose to close all similar facilities? Um, what we found in, in preparing this report was that there are quite a number of these roads around the world under major airports and uh, based on the volume of similar facilities I think it's unlikely that all of those facilities would be shut down there in the United States Australia uh, Asia the Middle East Europe they're all over the world and uh, um, I think it's unlikely that that a, one incident would cause this facility to be shut down so it is a risk, but I think the probability is, is low. Is low. Okay, thank you. I've got two more questions, and then I'm done. Um, uh, do you want to, are you going to put your amendment now, Alderman Farrell? I, well, at your discretion. No, no, no. I, I, I would recommend. Oh, we don't have a motion on the floor, do we? No, we don't. Okay. And yeah, we're still in clarification. Okay. okay. Just two more questions, I promise. Um, so we're making decisions outside our normal process, and that concerns me. Um, these are similar decisions to ones that we have made um, in the past that we have been heavily, heavily criticized for, including criticism from people in this room um, during the election. So um, how do you justify the change of our process, procurement and otherwise, um, in justifying this application? Uh, Your Worship, I guess I would, uh, I'm not, I, I don't think I, I'm really going to try to justify the process. I think I'm trying to respond to what I was asked to do by council and I'm, you know, we typically bring these, these pieces of infrastructure forward to you in TIP. Uh, that's not what I was asked to do. Thank you. Um, now, Métis Trail, it was recommended in the planet document that it be a major it was upgraded to an expressway mm -hmm. at a future cost of 100 million, 120 million, I think. Mm -hmm. um, again, Mildred and the plant that's saying, feed me, feed me. Um, I think it's appropriate that we now take it back to a major. That means that we can defer 100 and some million dollars of future cost where we could be putting that into uh, other priorities. What's your answer to that? Or what's your opinion? Your Worship, uh, one of the things that I, I tried to relate in my presentation was I believe if airport trail, if council does decide to pr proceed with that project, that we could um, revisit the classification of Métis Trail. And if nothing else, uh, remove some of the planned interchanges. Mm -hmm. The reason that I would advise council that is I think that um, the traffic volumes that would result in, in the subsequent network with the tunnel would decrease the pressure on, on Métis and it would allow us to reasonably manage the congestion with the signalized intersection control and introduce additional points of access along that route which would improve the developability of the lands along the corridor and, and I think we would get a better... Um, Transit route. We would get a better regional overall development, comprehensive land use. So that would be smaller land costs and um, eliminated costs for future capital ex expansion of that roadway. Yes, along, particularly along Métis Trail. I think I would, adv my advice would be to continue to protect for a f free flow route along airport trail at a reasonable operating speed, not at, you know, some super highway speed, but Métis at Country Hills, for example, if you, re if you release the lands that we're protecting and you free up opportunities um, 
for access points because you don't have on ramps and off ramps, it could make a significant difference to the property owners along there. All right, more property taxes to help pay for our tunnel. Alderman Farrell, I, um, of course, I realize that I'm, we're not uh, we're not actually in a public hearing, so there really are no questions of clarification. So I must get the motion on the floor. Okay. So but I'm, if I get the motion on the floor right now, ask. and you want to put your amendment, we can do that. So I'm guessing that I can probably guess who wants to move these recommendations. Yes, sir. Alderman Stevenson, and I'm guessing probably who wants to second them. Alderman Jones, thank you. Now we've got a motion on the floor. Alderman Farrell, if you want to put your amendment. I think I left it, the written copy in my office, but it would be uh, direct administration to pursue um, a, a uh, what would that be? A alternative, levy. alternative funding mechanisms, including a levy, uh, funds from other levels of government, and explore a toll. Or do you want to leave the toll part out? Mr. Tober is saying leave a toll out. Okay. I think we should look at the toll. Why don't we do that one but, separate? Uh, and I'm not saying that we should just explore the levy. The I'm saying do it. But the toll, I think we could explore it. Yeah. So um, um, I would say can I, can negotiate I a levy um, and explore other funding mechanisms, including a toll, with other levels of government and a toll. Can I? Sorry? Yeah, yeah. Well, Mr. Tobert is saying you'd impose it rather than negotiate it, which no. I can buy. But oh, I, right. can I can I suggest though that uh, I, I'm very much um, simpatico with what you're saying. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that rather than give them the ability to just impose it when we don't know how many properties are affected or what kind of numbers we're talking about, I think what we can do is ask them to come back with a recommendation on that piece of it. Um, as we move forward, does that make sense to you? Because there's probably going to be some options. Like I'm satisfied with that. Not? I don't think it's a motion arising, really. I, think uh, I don't it, mind it sticking it in as a new number four. Yeah. All right. And yeah, because, I'm and, sorry, and I don't so have why it don't we, can, can I try to work the language out with you then? That would be helpful. So direct administration to explore further alternative funding mechanisms, including but not limited to a levy, Further funding from other orders of government. Other orders of government, because I'm still working on that. And a toll. Correct. And report back to council no later than I'm looking at Mr. Logan. You want it after the Your April deadline? Yeah, we wouldn't be open till uh, open for business until twenty fourteen, but I think the land use one would need to come in as soon as possible. Should we say um, June? I'm pulling that Mr. out of the air. Mr. Tully's kind of squirming in the seat there. Maybe this is this is a pretty significant one, the land one. Just say as soon as possible. We need a deadline, don't we? Uh, All right, as soon as possible. Well, uh, yes, because we're getting applications regularly. I okay. imagine there'll be a, a rush for them now. So as soon as possible. Levy. Yes, thank okay. you. Okay, so do I have a seconder for that amendment? Thanks, Alderman Putmans. Any discussion on that amendment? Everyone's lights are on, so just wave at me. Sorry. Uh, I can try. <laughs> Does Madam Clerk have you have you got were you, did you get that? I'll have it written up in a sec. And that would I think be a new number four then. Uh, I would call it number four, and then Mr. Tully can on number five. Given that that may influence this total amount, could we do an up to? Okay. So let's, um, Alderman Farrell, let's just add in there on, on current number four, which is um, first reading for the borrowing bylaw, we should say up to, because if those negotiations are successful, that number may go down. So just before the 173 million, throw in the words up to in uh, the next recommendation, which is currently number four. And this would be a new number four, and that would be five. All right. So any discussion on this one? Again, just wave at me since everyone's lights are on. Oh, did I? Yeah, Mr. Alderman Putnam's. Alderman Carr? Yeah, I guess my first question to Mr. Logan is to sort of give me an, an indication of what you think of when you hear the, to the term explore the potential of a toll. Uh, Your Worship, I would say, I know the technology is, is ready and feasible. Uh, what I don't know off the top of my head would be what would the overhead be 
involved with uh, do, managing a toll at one facility versus a, a broad number of facilities. Uh, physically, we don't have a, a great deal of room. We haven't allowed for that in the, in the land we've identified, so we'd probably have to do some sort of electronic collection and bill later type process. And, um, and then there could be legalities or with the province around our ability to, to do that um, on public right away. So there's a bunch of questions, uh, both technical and legal, that I want to explore. Okay, I'm just going to sort of blue sky here. Yep. Right? Because, I mean, I, I think that I have heard massively from Calgarians that they support an airport tunnel. But I think that the reasons for different, Cal different sort of sectors of Calgary supporting that are very different. I find that I am very supportive of the idea of an airport tunnel because I see it as the only viable way to realistically be able to connect light rail transit to our airport. Mm -hmm. And, you know, building this tunnel, going into the a kind of financial quagmire that it is, that all of our auto-oriented road infrastructure is, is, um, you know, makes, makes the feasibility of actually connecting the Northeast LRT to the airport that much more challenging, potentially. I, I see the toll, and I'd just like to get your comments of this, as a potential, if we say the whole point of, of tolling is to connect our airport with public transit and to sort of focus some sort of funding mechanism in that regard. And could we toll airport trailer? Could we toll the approaches in order to fund transit to the airport? We certainly haven't uh, given any thought to data around the approaches. We certainly did around the tunnel. Um, the other thing I like about using a toll in this particular case, to be perfectly honest, is consistent with our with the policies that that we work by that say that we should be a user a user pay type of uh, organization and and this is the most direct user pay the other opportunities that that represent some sort of a toll is there is the ability to carry certain utilities through this facility as well um, non-hazardous utilities i would suggest and, and it would create a significant savings of infrastructure for certain companies to do that and i think there's an opportunity to benefit from that as well to offset some of these costs, we haven't factored that into our into our um, uh, financials. But um, I'm not opposed to to what you're saying. I think it, it is a very linear relationship between here's the benefit you get and, and you're being asked to pay for it. Now, is there enough leeway in Alderman Farrell's uh, motion to do that level of exploration, or do you need more? Uh, solid direction in that regard. We can certainly do the exploration with the motion that's there. I think at the end of the day that we would have to come back to council to say, here's what we found out and um, here's what we would recommend. Either it's not feasible or it is feasible and here's the here's the charge that would, would be associated with it. Okay, well, I really, really like the idea of doing everything we can to A, make the tunnel happen, B, make it happen so we can actually connect light rail to the airport and C, uh, actually downgrade as much of the surrounding road network from a flow through expressway to something that can actually be accessed so we can actually have uh, land uses that contribute to the tax base onto which they front. So I will be supporting this motion. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman Amendment, Carra. amendment. Amendment. And hopefully the motion. <laughs> Thanks, Alderman Carra. On the amendment, Alderman Chabot, and he promises to be short. Thank you, Worship. If you'll kindly leave my light in the queue, I'd appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Logan, I, I did a quick calculation based on the, the report here, and it does indicate that 15,000 vehicles per day, $3 toll, generate 5.475 million. And I did a quick calculation at $3, 5,000 vehicles per day, $15,000 per day would generate the 5.4 million, not 15,000. So does that mean then we, we charge $1, 15,000 vehicles per day, that it would cover our costs? I think it, you're going to have one of those those curves, yes, Your Worship. It, the lower the charge, the more people that would pay it. Um, what I don't know is how much is the overhead, so what do you net? Right, 109, 109 million was the net after 20 years. So, of course, there would be some capital costs associated with that and some carrying costs. Which yes will certainly reduce that number significantly. Yes. But uh, nonetheless, just based on 
the report at 15,000 vehicles per day is what's projected as an average, it certainly wouldn't need to be three dollars to recapture those kind of costs. Wouldn't you? We wouldn't did. You agree? Um, <laughs> Your Worship, we did those numbers at a pretty preliminary. I think we were looking at two hundred so, million. Sounds like what you'd be exploring in this report, right? Yeah, including electronic um, type of uh, um, what do you call it collections. I think it's the most seamless. Yeah, I agree. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that, Your Worship. I'm sorry no for, 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 for on the amendment. Anyone else? Alderman Mar. Yes, I'll leave your light on. Microphone. Yes, so I, I'm wondering, I, I, I like the direction, especially the ability to have alternate funding mechanisms, which includes other orders of government. And um, I'm wondering if this should come through committee, which is our normal process, rather than, than going straight to council. Is there a requirement for us to, yeah. to be particularly nimble or? Alderman Farrell suggesting no, so I'm just, if I could get some guidance from the administration. Mr. Tilbert? That's true. There's no requirement for us to, to go through committee, is there? No, council can direct this report any way it chooses. But well, you have to be asking yourself, what's the purpose of it? To go to a committee is, would be to hear from the public? Well, I think that um, if we're going to be as nimble as we can and, and, and talk to other orders of government, I suppose it could, and if we're not interfering in our process at all and we have the ability to go through the council, then let's just do that. Sorry, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else on the amendment? All right, then. On the amendment, are we agreed? Agreed. Any opposed? Oh, I'm sorry, Alderman Farrell, I'm sorry. I, I know you just wanted to point something out in your close, so why don't you just... I'll just do it, do, that, do it after um, the fact. That I see. Well, well, let me just ask if there were any opposed. Okay, I'll just give you the floor. After the fact, um, I, the levy is an urgent one. The others, we have lots of time, I believe. So uh, I see us working on the levy right away. I think it's clear that they don't all have to come back together, Mr. Logan. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Back to the speaker's list. Did you have anything else, Alderman Farrell? You've still got the floor. I do, yes. And um, I'm going to move, and I don't think it needs to be written out, that um, we um, change the designation of Métis Trail from an expressway to uh, major. Uh, I think that one's got to be a public hearing. So I make that recommendation, and then it returned to council on a public hearing. Uh, yeah, Mr. Tobert, Mr. Tully, what would the right way of wording that be? Would it be to direct administration to redesignate Métis Trail as a major from an expressway and doing so avoid future capital expenditures in the area? No. It would have to do with preparing the bylaw and returning it to a public hearing. Okay. <laughs> um, so that would be a new number six that you're proposing, I think, which is to direct administration to prepare a bylaw redesignating Métis Trail from an expressway to a Mr. Logan? Arterial. I was going to say arterial, but I wanted to make sure. To an arterial road and return to council as soon as possible. Perfect. Thank you. Alderman Putman, are you seconding that? Do I have a seconder? I'll second that. Alderman Carra is seconding it. On this amendment, Alderman Putman. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Um, General Not Manager. <laughs> Not a judge. Your Honor. <laughs> General Manager Logan, um, through the chair. I understand Métis Trail has been, um, there have been developers that have front-ended some of the development costs. I understand that there's been a few changes over time as it relates to the scale of that roadway. And I I'm venture to suggest there probably have been a, no small measure of expenses to date on pre-planning and, and I'm not sure what other work. Uh, could you hazard a guess as to what sort of costs might be involved in such a redesignation? Your Worship, um with respect to the expenditures by the developers, the adjacent lands in some cases are developed and have been developed with, the, with Métis Trail planned as an expressway. Therefore, they have constructed, uh, they have not constructed access and they have put up uh, sound walls in the case of the residential boundaries. Uh, with respect to the actual infrastructure, that has been at city costs. And there have been portions of airport trail, specifically between Stony Trail down to 96th Avenue or what you know, would be airport trail that were front ended by the developers to be repaid entirely by the city. So uh, they would not be out of pocket for the actual roadway that's been, 
that's been constructed. Um, in actual fact, by redesignating the roadway, any future development would have to contribute to the road rather than have it covered <coughs> by the city through uh, uh, our capital budgets, including their acreage assessments. So hopefully that's, uh, they're not out of pocket for the road that's been built, but they have planned their developments around it being an expressway and they would need to potentially um, adjust their planning if they so desired. And I think some of them would. And I, if, again, if I made through the chair, and that would imply, I would assume, somewhat lesser cost than the capital project itself, the roadway itself. Um, it's downgraded. We, your Worship, I think I would be looking to the developer to pay the capital costs if they wanted to adjust our our, um, our roadway that's already been built. No, no, I was thinking in terms of the road to be built, if if the roadway is to be downgraded, there will, I assume, be less costs involved with that, with me to, no? Oh, it's 100 well, yes. there's two parties at play here. Two parties at play are paying for roads. If it's an expressway, it's all at our expense. If it's an arterial, it's all at the developer's expense. So you can see this would be a mixed blessing. Your Worship, just one further point. We would basically build, we would finish building what we're building. Um, there's, there's two lanes for one mile, or 1.6 kilometers, that uh, haven't been constructed. So, um, after the end of this year, we would only really have one, one chunk of road. So the standard wouldn't necessarily change. What we would abandon is the future interchange plans in most locations. I think at airport trail we would see, but the other ones we, would, we wouldn't have future land set aside for interchanges. So you, the, I took the tone of Alderman uh, Putman's comment to be, would we change the standard of the road? Not really. We would finish building what we're building now, but we would we would be able to develop the lands adjacent to it and provide new access points differently than we otherwise would. Thank I hope you. That helps. Uh, yes. Thank you, Worship. On the amendment, Alderman Jones, then Alderman Chabot. Thank you, Worship. Mr. Logan, the difference the difference in capacity for an arterial to an expressway is there any difference? Um, now, if you have two lanes of Two lanes of free flow is two lanes of free flow. It, it really doesn't matter a great deal. An arterial has a slightly narrower lane, um, and it has a, say, a major road would have a bike lane in the shoulder versus an, an expressway, which wouldn't. The bike lane would be separate. It would be a separate pathway. Um, really what controls the capacity is the traffic lights. <laughs>
before coming to council, but since it's a public hearing anyway, I think I'm comfortable with the way that it's put. Um, you know, so we, just to be clear for council, we, we wouldn't be making, if we were to pass this, we wouldn't be making the decision to redesignate the road. We would do that at a future time when it comes to a public hearing. Alderman Fincott. Uh, Mr. Logan, I remember when we uh, amended the CTP that was before us to, uh, to change Métis Trail from a, I believe it was being called a mod modified arterial to an expressway. Is, is that what, what, what the amendment was to the CTP, to change it from what we called an, anyway? I, I don't recall the exact wording, but Some, okay. Ms. Gattaford's indicated that's um, accurate. Yeah. And at the time, uh, the difference in the capacity between the arterial that was before us and the expressway was 5,000 cars. Sounds about right. And the other difference was $128 million. That shifting it from the arterial to an expressway came with a price tag of $128 million. We make this change, where's that $128 million? That $128 million is not in our budget. I think the difference would be, Your Worship, that that money would not show up in future budgets. Um, and the difference in the capacity further to Alderman Jones's question was that the signals control the capacity and the more signals you put, you systematically sort of uh, reduce the overall throughput or the efficiency of the, of the road with respect to time. So um, the 128 wouldn't come out of any budget that exists today other than we may have to, we may be able to buy less land than we otherwise would to finish the one piece that we're finishing now. Um, okay. However, it would be future expenditures that would be avoided. Okay, cost avoidance. Now, have we, we've had a number of land issues come before us and I, I think I've asked every single one that has been along there whether this was required or not for mm -hmm. it to be an expressway. To your knowledge, have we done any of those land purchases that we would have to sell? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman Pincott. On the amendment, Alderman Keating. And you too, Alderman Stevenson. Thank you, Mr. I was a little surprised I hadn't seen you wave yet. I just want to go back to um, Alderman Chabot's uh, note that I think in many ways this probably should come back at a different time. I, I kind of remember something similar this not long ago that has taken up very little of our time, and that's the fluoride issue. And I wonder if these things should not come back at a general uh, notice of motion so that we can debate them fully. So I will not support the amendment. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman Keating. Alderman Stevenson. Thank you, Your Worship. Well, uh, just to be uh, clear here, this this was not um, an um, amendment. It was an amendment to the proposal for the uh, Calgary Transportation Plan, but it was to maintain the status of um, of uh, expressway for Métis Trail. That was what the motion was then because it had been up to that point. I'm too, I, I can't support the motion even though I think that we should bring this forward. Uh, I don't think it should be done here because there's, Mr. Logan, you're going to need to do some study on, um, on traffic patterns and the um, uh, build out of the um, areas along Métis before you bring this back, right? Your Worship, we would revisit the Northeast Road Network study based on Council's overall decision on Airport Trail. Because we really have a, a mix-up on uh, Airport Trail because we have Expressway at the, at the south end. We built a big flyover for that at, at uh, McKnight. We have Expressway at the north end uh, coming down. In fact, it's, being, it's already built uh, down as far as 96, the Airport Trail, right? Uh, it ends in the middle of the field because we haven't connected it yet. But one of the things that we're going to hear from when this does come forward is the community associations there and with their concerns about not having the overpasses, especially at 64th and at the 80th in the future when that area builds out and with the, um, all the industrial that's going in there. So I, uh, I think that this should be done in a different way than just adding this on because there's a lot that has to be discussed on this. But So I will not be supporting the amendment. Thank you. 
We worship on suffering from a little bit of deja vu here, and I guess, Mr. Logan, we, we uh, I ran and noticed a motion to do exactly this, and I'm trying to remember when it was. I can't remember if it was within the six-month time limit or not, uh, June or July. Do you recall that? Your Worship, are you referring to the uh, the reclassification? Yeah. Um, I, I, I ran I a proposal. That was some time ago. It was some time ago, but it was exactly this proposal. Um, and at the time, I believe we referred to it as an enhanced arterial because we could do some extra write ins and write outs. And uh, the, the, but the uh, profile of the roads didn't change. What did change was the, uh, the speed, which was really a, fa a function, if I recall correctly, of the type of intersections that we were looking at. That, that's a fair assessment, Your Worship. Okay, and it failed then. Um, I believe we did change the, no, sorry, no, we, we changed didn't. it from some, from the CTP recommendation. No, no, we, that was, that was my, because I was looking for the $120 million at the time for another project <laughs> and it, uh, it failed. But, uh, I appreciate what Alderman Farrell is attempting to do here. It's, uh, it's, um, uh, it's, it's, make no mistake, Council, it's not putting money into a bank account. No. What it does is it avoids costs at another Avoiding time. a future withdrawal. Yeah. So I will support this, Your Worship. Mm -hmm. Thanks, uh, Alderman Lowe. Anyone else on the amendment? Alderman DeMong, then Alderman Collier Kurt. Um, Mr. Logan, just out of curiosity, if we switch this back to a arterial. arterial and the developers have to actually pay for it, are there any existing businesses that have not had to pay for it and will it be retroactively charged to them? Uh, yes, Your Worship. There are, there are lands along this road um, that have not developed, nor has the road developed. It's it's fairly limited. Okay. Yeah. So I'm sorry. Would they so be the answer, being retroactively? Yes, they would, they would be. We would be looking for a contribution to the adjacent roadway, but there's a very very small portion of the road. Okay. Thank you. And on the amendment, Alderman call your card. Thank you, Your Worship. I just wanted to make an amendment to the amendment. And it would be to direct administration to prepare a report with uh, and an accompanying bylaw. Because I, I, I think it's important to have a report written on this and what the impacts are. Uh, it, it would deal with the costing aspect and uh, cost avoidance, that sort of thing. So to prepare a report uh, and an accompanying. If you don't add the word accompanying, it's only three words. Alderman okay, Collier I guess that's a given then. No. Report and accompanying is three words. A report. A was already there. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. <laughs> report and accompanying by law. Are you okay with that, Alderman Farrell? And who was the seconder? I forget. I was, now. and I'm okay with it. Okay. I think it was actually Alderman Footman's, but he's okay with it too. Oh, sorry. All right. Okay. I think we're all right with that. Any further discussion on this amendment? Okay. Did you want to close, Alderman Farrell? I do. This is an important one. Um, I think a number of members of council have concern that we're taking, we're emptying the cupboard and putting all of our residual money into this one area when there are competing needs throughout the city. So I'm hearing from the area alderman that he wants it all, including a road that's in excess of what's needed because of the decision we're just being asked to make, a $300 million plus decision. So that, that really <laughs> disappoints me. This could um, allow some funding for other projects up to 120 million, as well as ask for landowners to share the cost with us. So we're expecting the city to pay once again. I, I, I'm disappointed. Please, Council. Um, I'm just tr trying to find a way to make this, this $300 million more palatable. Thanks, Alderman Farrell. So on the amendment, as you see on the screen, are we agreed? Any opposed? Call the roll, please. Alderman Keating. No. Alderman Lowe. Yes. Alderman McLeod? Yes. Alderman Marr? Yes. Alderman Pincott? Yes. Alderman Putmans? Yes. Alderman Stevenson? No. 
Alderman Kra. Yes. Alderman Chabot. No. Alderman Collier Cross? Yes. Alderman DeMong? Yes. Alderman Farrell? Yes. Alderman Hodges? Yes. Alderman Jones? No. Mayor Nenshi? No. It's carried, Your Worship. All right. Alderman Hodges? Yeah. I should have remembered that. I don't have any amendments. Uh, it's uh, whenever uh, you uh, are, uh, we're ready to uh, go straight to debate. Oh yeah, we can do it now. We can we're do in it debate now. now. Okay. We have no more amendments on the floor. Well, not yet, but there's there's some there's some when, when you when your light comes, you'll have your chance. There's some coming on the issue. Um, the administration has done a lot of detailed analysis on the position of the uh, airport authority and uh, the city administration's view of the airport authority's request. And I realize this is part of the uh, confidential agenda, so I will generalize in uh, what some of the issues are. One of the major issues is cost of land, as we know, 26 million versus six. Another issue is the uh, length of uh, lease on the uh, on the lands that are required for this underpass. And, and we have a, uh, a number of other uh, issues that have been outlined, including uh, um, uh, what mitigation costs and insurance costs the uh, authority expects the city uh, to uh, finance. All in all, uh, for me, this is a non-starter, Your Worship. Uh, the plain fact is the airport authority doesn't see this facility to be, this project to be an advantage to the airport, which personally I believe it would be. They don't see it as an advantage for the, uh, as useful to the airport and the operation of the airport, and they plainly don't want it on their property. Uh, the property, or properly stated, the property they lease from the federal government. So, uh, all in all, Your Worship, I will not be supporting this recommendation. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman Hodges. Uh, Alderman Hodges, did you have another motion to make? Uh, Your Worship, as a courtesy, you've uh, mentioned that you would like the uh, procedure bylaw suspended, but um, I know that uh, Alderman Marr has some uh, matters that uh, he would like to uh, uh, deal with, uh, some personal issues, some personal matters, and I understand that. So um, I'll put the motion on the floor for you as a courtesy to suspend the procedure bylaw as, so that uh, to continue until we're done with this item. But knowing that there are a number of amendments yet to come on and knowing that Alderman Marr and perhaps others would like to uh, uh, conclude here for, for the time being at 9.30 and continue tomorrow at one o'clock, um, I, I put it with some hesitation, but I will put it. Thank you. The motion then is to suspend the procedure bylaw until we have completed this uh, item and recess then to Tuesday at 1 p.m. Uh, Alderman Carroll, were you seconding that? No, no, God, no. I, I've got a pregnant wife at home, guys. I can't, I, uh, well, I, I, I could not be here at any given time. But at any moment. Well, I think you have to seize the day. I'm gonna, I'm gonna second that. Thanks, Alderman Carra. Is this a debatable motion? One moment. Yes, it is. We're checking. Sorry, Worship. What is it? We're checking. If it, this is debatable motion. Um. All right. So it is. So any debate on this motion? Alderman Mar. Alderman Mar. Alderman Mar. And I. As scintillating as this is, is, and I know how everybody is really, really excited about it, uh, I have 10 amendments to oh. go through. I have uh, a whole bunch of comments and concerns with regards to the reports that we've seen, and I have a pregnant wife at home that is due at any moment, as you all know. So um, it would be great for me to, to go home and be killed, but I would, I would really like to be able to, to maintain our procedural bylaw, be able to go home and, uh, and deal with this when we have the procedure tomorrow at one o'clock. Now, I believe that if we were to maintain council tonight, I believe very strongly that this debate will go on for several more hours, 
not an hour, not two hours, but several more hours at least. At least. And um, sound decisions made when there are hundreds of millions of dollars at stake are not made at one and two in the morning. So that's my, uh, that's my plea to my colleagues and um, hope that you will not support the waiving of the procedure bylaw. Anyone else on the motion on the floor? Alderman Stevenson. Thank you, Your Worship. No, I will not support the motion, even though uh, if um, Alderman Meyer wasn't here tomorrow, we wouldn't have those 25 amendments. So mm. um, we'd go pretty quick. But <laughs> anyway, no, I think that we should finish this this evening. There are people that have problems uh, with tomorrow, but uh, at least we got everybody here tonight. So I would like to finish it off and hopefully because I've often said before that debate, debate expands to fill the time allotted. And so I think that if we uh, uh, put, it, uh, put it tonight, we'll finish it quicker. Thank you, sir, your worship. Anyone else on this motion? I should point out that one of the people uh, for whom, uh, all, to, about whom Alderman Stevenson is speaking is myself, because I actually am making a speech in Toronto at the time of our meeting tomorrow. Um, so I would certainly appreciate a passage of this uh, as a courtesy to me, but I also understand the concerns uh, with how long this might go. Any other debate on this item? All right. Yeah, I think it needs 10. Yeah, yeah, uh-huh. I'm wondering if we can put a cap on this one. I really don't think we can make good decisions after a certain time. Um, 10, 30, is there a Alderman Farrell? I would say 11 o'clock. Go to 11. Try to finish it by 11. That's my amendment. And what if we don't? I don't think you can amend this motion. I don't think you can amend this motion. So if it fails, you can put that one. I I'll think recognize you, can. you right away. Isn't that a reconsideration? I do think you can. Because it's a different motion. Uh, Mr. Sully is checking. This cannot be amended. Hey, John. Madam no. Clerk. It cannot be amended. Thank you. All right, so then on this motion, are we agreed? Opposed? Call the roll, please. Alderman McLeod. Agreed. Alderman Marr. No. Alderman Pincott. Yes. Alderman Putmans. Yes. Alderman Stevenson. Yes. Alderman Carra. Yes. Alderman Chabot. Yes. Alderman collier -Cart? No. Alderman DeMong? Yes. Alderman Farrell? Yes. Alderman Hodges? Alderman Jones? Reluctant, yes. Alderman Keating? Yes. Alderman Lowe? No. Mayor Nenshi? Yes. That's carried, Your Worship. All right. Uh, in fact, uh, you, you were at the top of my list, Alderman Marr, but you went away. Did you turn your light off and on again? Go ahead, Alderman Marr. Can you put them all together, all ten of them? Well, what's the fun of that? <laughs> now we have all night. Don't you, uh, don't you want to deal with this? Right. Um, okay, so, Mr. Logan, I've got some questions for you. Uh, this report here, C-2011-05 is a very interesting report insofar as it details all the reasons why we should be doing this tunnel. It's, it essentially is uh, an excellent exercise in saying to not do the tunnel, we'd be kind of foolish not to. Yet um, this other report here, C-2011-06, quite the opposite isn't it? It outlines a very dire situation. Should we proceed? So I've got some questions relating to how we were going to balance the two reports, the public report, which everybody has, uh, has seen, and the, the secret report, which only council see. When I was uh, going over my notes, and the presentation which you, you gave to us in camera, which again, the public was not able to see, 
Um, there's some very pointed questions that I'd like to, to answer, and I think we can deal with some of them in the public realm. Mm -hmm. First of all, uh, the lease of the lands. If we are moving forward with the proposed tunnel, we are in effect improving property that we do not own. How many times have we done that before in the City of Calgary? To this magnitude. Your Worship, um, not very many times. Ever? We, yes, we have. But to the tune uh, of three hundred million dollars? No, not to the two. Well, the only one I can think of is the uh, the South LRT has has uh, no. We got the right away on that. Um, none that come to mind <coughs> of this order of magnitude. Right. Okay. Um, now, since we don't have title, we don't own the land. It's a leased uh, leased land, and. The report suggests that we would only be able to, to have the lease for the tunnel for a finite amount of time, 40 years. What happens at the end of that? Uh, Your Worship, just for clarification, it would be a license. The lease is actually... Uh, You're Calgary right, it's a Airport license of occupation, right. isn't it? Some s sort of. Okay, the, um, which is a little uh, bit more tenuous <clears throat> than, than well, a lease. Well, at the end of the lease, the current agreement is between the Airport Authority and the federal government running through... I believe it's June 30th, 2052. At the end of that period of time, um, the airport authority either has to renegotiate their, their terms with the federal government or the federal government takes ownership back. And any of the tenants that are on that land would then have to renegotiate their leases. So we would be in with a, uh, a pool of others. So we would in effect be having a, a tunnel that we may or may not be able to use and um, really kind of in a position of limbo, wouldn't we? Uh, Your Worship, uh, we would be in a position where even if, if the tunnel was to be have public value and, and, and have value to the airport and they wanted to continue the use of it, uh, we would still potentially have new terms to the occupancy of that land. Okay. So the answer to my question in a roundabout way was yes then, right? Yeah. Thank you. Now... We are also talking, can we talk about <laughs> Hang on one second. You can talk to the issue of deputy, right? Okay, maybe I better not then. Um, okay, so I apologize, I just had to get clarification as to what we can talk about and what we can't. So how does this, uh, if we were to do this, how does this impact our future ability to do infrastructure in the city of Calgary over the next, say, two terms? Uh, with respect to capital budget, with, your with worship? Yeah, exactly, for capital budgeting. Because that's what uh, we're talking about. With respect to capital budget, your worship, uh, within the budget that's been allocated to the transportation department, uh, this <coughs> would largely absorb any major capacity that we had to do a large-scale project. Mm -hmm. uh, with respect to the corporate allocation of the MSI, it would absorb most of the unallocated uh, of the MSI funds that are not already allocated to a department. Uh, with it, and that runs through uh, 2018, I believe, is the term of the MSI. Right. No, uh, and, and thank you for that. Um, so one of my colleagues suggested or used the term, uh, we're emptying the cupboard. Would you characterize this as emptying the cupboard in terms of a capital infrastructure? <clears throat> I would say that the transportation department would have very limited capacity to do any major infrastructure without new sources of funding. So I can characterize that also as a yes. We may get new sources of funding. We may. Yeah, such oh. as Green Trip, but that would be... Right. Yeah. But essentially, right now, as this council is looking at it today, we're looking at this is it. We're the basically we blowing have. our load on one, uh, on one, one infrastructure project. Hang on. Uh, now, you mentioned MSI a few minutes ago. Now, that, that's, that's interesting because the provincial government has before altered the time frame on, M M on the MSI. Yes, they have. What would happen <coughs> if the new budget comes out February 22nd and the MSI has changed? What does that do to us as a municipality, especially in relation to this project? Your Worship, I believe 
you would like to answer this question? I would actually, because I have asked that precise question to the Premier just today at lunch again, who assured me that the current timelines of the MSI are in place for this budget. Now that said, could a new provincial government change that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we have much, much bigger irons in the fire for projects that are relying on future MSI funding than this one, not the least of which is the West LRT, because mm -hmm. that too is borrowing against future MSI cash flows. I think Mr. Tilbert wanted to add something as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, Your Worship. Uh, the statement around losing fiscal Light. 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 the question around I'll use this one, I guess. Um, Your Worship, before the MSI money showed up from the provincial government, we actually had no capacity to take on additional projects. And if something were to show up, we would have had to have seen, seek a new source of revenue, like borrowing or going to the federal government for a source of cash. So we've been here before. We will be here again. Thank you. Uh, and it, it's, it's nice to know that, that there's, uh, there's confidence that the MSI funding will, will be maintained for all of the projects that we have because obviously that's a, uh, uh, incredibly important for, for our ongoing operations. Now, there was some discussion earlier also about uh, sole sourcing. We're sole sourcing a, uh, a portion of this project, are we not? You, your Worship, uh Part of our discussions with the, the Calgary Airport Authority, they have recommended to us that the most expeditious way to carry out this project is to use the construction manager that they have already selected. And uh, we concur with that recommendation and that does represent a single source um, type of allotment of that portion of the work, yes. Is that our normal procedure? No, it's not our normal procedure. We do we do employ it from time to time. Didn't we just get crucified for doing this on another infrastructure project? Yes, we were criticized for this on other infrastructure projects. I think projects. I used the word crucified, which is a little bit more apt. I'm, I'm good here. So. Um, Mr. Logan, just to be clear, uh, what purport, is, I think it's important to get this out because we did discuss this before. What proportion of the project are you talking about here? My understanding is it's probably in the order of 2% of the capital expenditure. It's the the design portion we would do through a through an RFP. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be the construction management, so that would be overseeing and coordinating all of the the contract work on the site. Sort of a general contractor, if you will. Right. No, no, I, no I, thank you. I, I, I appreciate that. Uh, I just need to confer with council for one second. Again, there's so much that, and I apologize to those I following, uh, that there's so much that we can't talk about. Well, I would say that it's, it's, uh, it's fairly severe, actually. Um, well, I'm gonna start putting up my, my amendments then, if you don't mind. No problem, do you want us to take them all, all in one chunk and vote on them separately, Alderman Moore? It just might be a bit faster. Well, I would, uh, it, I would prefer to introduce them one at a time and then bring them up to vote on them as they come, if that, uh, That's fine. If that pleases your worship. Well, no, <laughs> but I don't think your goal has ever been to please me. <laughs> oh, well, that's not true. You cut me to the quick. Uh, Madam Clerk, if I could um, bring up uh, number one first, please. Now, this may not make sense to those in the audience, but um, it is essentially to direct administration to arrange and conduct an independent third party appraisal of the property and to report back through the Land and Asset Management Committee as soon as possible with its findings. I think that this is quite frankly, pure due diligence. If we are working on trying to be as open and transparent as we can be, and if we we're trying to go through the best process that we can, anybody that's involved in real estate would realize that we have to have an independent appraisal done on this property. Thank you.
Your Worship. <laughs> just, just discussing with council how this relates to the rest of the recommendations. Um, I am, I, I am to understand, Mr. Logan, that an appraisal has been conducted, but not an independent third-party appraisal. Appraisal is that correct? That's correct, Your Worship. And I just, I would rather, f I would like to clarify that we're talking about the portion of land, which is on um, the airport Calgary Airport property. Authority lease lands. I think that's that was imp your intent, that's right? implied. I think. Well, no, there's other land too. Yeah. All right. Um, well, the, the the affected area lands. Now, okay. I know that there was an appraisal done. There's two actually appraisals done, and um, how would you characterize them? Would you characterize them as being very close or very far apart? Your Worship, I would suggest that they're they're quite a ways apart. Would it be in the best practices and best interest? to be able to have a third party appraisal to be able to determine more closely what the real value of the land would be. And this would be done by a third party independent appraiser. I think it, we, we feel that a third party appraisal would strengthen our, our perception of the value of the land that doesn't obligate the airport authority to recognize that appraisal at all. Thank you. And the motion is put, Your Worship. I, I'll take my seat until or do I need to stand, remain standing? No. no, you do not need to remain standing, but you do need a seconder. Uh, it was also seconded by Alderman. Thanks, Alderman Collier. Your card. Um, on this amendment. Come on. Bring it. Look, I personally believe that in a sane world, we would be working hand in hand with our airport authority to build this needed piece of infrastructure to all of our benefit. Um, squabbling over land price, I don't want an independent third party appraisal to, you know, I think our, I don't think we should be paying for this land is what I'm saying. And I don't, and I, I, I worry that an independent third party appraisal will set the land price in such a way that we become obligated to pay something that I don't think we should that, be paying. That's a little bit further down the line. That's further down the that's line? Further well, down I, the I don't line. understand your logic here. But. Do you ever? Anyone else on this amendment? Alderman Lowe. Well, I, uh, I agree wholeheartedly with Alderman Marr that, you know, ultimately we need, you know, I disagree with you, Alderman Carra. Simple due diligence says that you take two appraisals, put it in the middle, and offer that. So, but I guess my question here is uh, whether it's appropriate to uh, come back through land and asset standard strategy or to be considered by the team as part of their negotiations. Uh, it seems to me we're putting an extra loop in here which uh, may not be necessary. So, uh, Alderman Marr, I, I appreciate and I agree wholeheartedly with your sentiment that due diligence must be done on the land. Uh, but I'm going to amend this to, to and uh, bum 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 bum. Independent third party appraisal of the property as part of the process from here on in. Well, no, I think, the, I, think, I think the point Alderman Lowe is making is that it, it need not come back. We're just saying do one as part of your negotiations. Yeah, and uh, we want, council will want to know what that is. Uh, and uh, yeah, of course they'll report on it. In, uh, in due course. So, uh, report, just, just end it. After the word property? After the word, and, uh, well, I, I'd like like to. And to report back, period. To report, but I'd like it, yeah, I'd like it to be uh, considered or, or to report back is fine. It'll be become part of the process. It'll become part of I think what I we're see a anyway. conversation going on over here, Your Worship. Yeah, he does. Oh, do you have. One sec, Alderman Lowe, before you put it. Let's just see what the results that, of that's, that. That's what I was saying, yeah. Mr. Logan? Or Mr. Stevens, either. Or Mr. Stevens? Mr. Uh, your Worship, I don't think it's something that we would have before the, what we've sort of described as the start date that we need to work towards. Um, uh, you, you don't think it could be done that quickly? I doubt it. I, I mean, we've already tried to get this work done now, and Mr. Stevens is saying we're, um, the time period that it would probably take is beyond that, but would it still be a value? I don't know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I guess, I guess, 
you know, it, it, and this is, becomes one of the critical issues, and uh, here we are walking up this road, Your Worship, is, uh, Oh, Mr. Stevens, please, thank you. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Yes, we have, we, we began the process of trying to get an independent appraisal, but because of the timelines we were working towards, uh, we did not complete that, so I would have to go back to the staff to find out whether or not someone was still retained or what, um, if, if any initial or preliminary work had been done before I could uh, let you know with any integrity of, of when that could actually be done. That's That's usually what they've been taking on uh, projects of this of this size and magnitude. Okay, yeah, it, 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 the difficulty I'm having, Mr. Stevens or or Mr. Tobert or, or whomever, you know, this is a, a this is such a core piece of due diligence around a project is that you establish the price of the dirt you're going to involve in it uh, with a, with some reasonable certainty. And as Mr. Logan pointed out, there is a significant gap between the, the, the two. The only way we're, we're going to begin to establish what the real value is is when, the, as negotiations go to try to close the gap, that I would suggest we would want at some comfort that the gap is actually representative of the value. Mr. Tobert. Your Worship, I, we're, we're moving closer and closer to revealing strategy here. I know, I know where um, you are, sir. I'm a little bit reticent to say this, but we are already boxed in, in terms of a number, by the things that were explained in the confidential report. And so, although we know that there is, a, shall we say, a rather large number being floated out by the airport, we're bound by the number we put to council. So it's almost immaterial what the airport's number is. We have a ceiling over which we cannot go. And Mr. Tobert, where did our number come from? Our number was developed by certified appraisers who happened to work for us. We can uh, further amend that then to say a direct administration to um, Endeavor. Delete everything after seven. <laughs> No, delete everything after the word administration. <laughs> Two or three Direct things that we could delete it here, Alderman Stevens. I think if, if we if we can do best efforts so that we know. So where endeavor it's at. to arrange and conduct. That's contrary. That's He's not going to take it. <coughs> He's not going to take it. And I'm going to afraid I'm going to have to sit down and and uh, vote against it because to do it and run it through land and asset strategy, as Mr. Stevens points out, we're not going to have it in time for. Meaningful and uh, I'll just leave it as it is just to report back and I'll sit down. And this is what happens at 10 o'clock at night. The worship one out of 10, only 940. Alderman Lowe, <laughs> are you abandoning your proposed amendment to the amendment, then, sir? No, I'm not. I'm uh, oh, you I'm, want it to end it, report just, back, just report back. All right, do you have a seconder? No, lack of a seconder, so that one's out. Oh, I already closed it, Alderman Farrell. But if you would like to, that's fine. So, so on this then, Alderman Chabot, then Alderman Farrell. Thank you, Worship. Well, with all due respect to the mover, um, personally, Your Worship, I don't think that you should have accepted this motion. It, um, it, um, in my opinion, no, no, encroaches order. into the confidential report. It kind of suggests or it leads into uh, undermining our ability to negotiate with the airport. It, it will set a precedence in regards to one of the portions of which yeah. we are considered for negotiation. So I respect you know, I, I appreciate that, Aldrin Chabot, and we had, uh, we had the same conversation up here. It, it's skating on the edge. Yeah. Uh, honestly, I, I can't support this recommendation, nor am I going to speak to the public specifically about what this it kind of suggests. Um, I'm going to encourage council members not to support this, 
we want to have this debate further. Um, I think it's something we should do as an in-camera discussion based on the fact that council voted to keep this report confidential. Fair of course, enough. I didn't vote for that. Yes. But having said that. The council did. The council that was did. council's decision, I'll, and I'll abide by it. Thanks, Alderman Chabot. Uh, Alderman Farrell on the amendment. Thank you. Well, what a difference a couple of months The amendment makes. to the amendment, that is. I'll, I'll support both. I, um, I appreciate Alderman Marr bringing it forward. We've been soundly criticized for not following due diligence with other projects. This project is is many, many times more expensive. So I um, I think this is due diligence, Council. I'm disappointed that you're thinking otherwise. Thanks, Alderman Farrell. Anything else on the amendment to the amendment? Very well then, on the amendment to the amendment, are we agreed? agreed. Any opposed? No, because this is the amendment to the amendment. Um, call the roll, please. Alderman Pincott. Too late. Alderman Putmans? No. Alderman Stevenson? No. Alderman Carra? No. Alderman Chabot? No. Alderman collier -Cott? Yes. Alderman DeMong? No. Alderman Farrell? Yes. Alderman Hodges? Yes. Alderman Jones? No. Alderman Keating? No. Alderman Lowe? Yes. Alderman McLeod? Yes. Alderman Marr? Yes. Mayor Nenshi? No. That's lost, Your Worship. Back to the main amendment then. Further debate on the main amendment before I call on Alderman Marr to close. Yes, Alderman Chabot. Again, on the same vein, members of council, I voted against the amendment. I'm also gonna vote against the original motion. I have not spoken to it, as you know, Your Worship, I only spoke to the amendment. And uh, again, for the same reason that I stated before, I can't, I can't express strongly enough the need for council to vote against this motion. So members of council, please think hard about voting for this proposal. <laughs> Thanks, Alderman Marta Close. I'm gonna echo uh, Alderman Chabot's last words. Think hard before you vote. Because we're saying, we don't wanna know the truth. We don't want to, oh, I'm sorry, who has the floor? I don't want you to make decisions blindly. And recorded vote, Your Worship, because I think this is absolutely critical. This is plain and simple, due diligence. Go ahead and vote against it if you dare. Point of procedure. Uh, where was that, Alderman Duong? It is closed already. But you can raise on a point of procedure if you got one. Not entirely sure if it's procedure, but I'll stop you if, if this is not even going to make it back in time, which we've already heard from administration, What's the point of even having a vote? It's not procedure, it's I part of the debate, but thank you. All right, we've had a request for a recorded vote. Against, this is a vote on this amendment that you see, oops, that you see on the screen. On the recorded vote, Alderman Marr, four. Alderman Hodges, four. Alderman Farrell, four. Alderman Carra, against. Alderman collier Cart four. Alderman Chabot, against. Alderman DeMong, against. Alderman McLeod, against. Alderman Lowe, four. Alderman Putmans, against. Alderman Keating, against. Alderman Stevenson, against. Alderman Jones, against. Alderman Pincott, four. Mayor Nenshi, against. That's lost your worship. Alderman Marr, number two. That was fascinating. Uh, number two. No. Uh, direct administration. Oh, hang on. What, I need to confirm. Uh, no. No. You 
go, well, you can. And this is my, my, my advice. Can you take that off the screen, please? Yeah. Sorry, Council, we're just having a quick uh, discussion with Council here. Uh, we'll be right back at you. Um, yeah, if you want to call for a five minute recess, you can. Sure, sure. Alderman Jones, Alderman DeLong seconding, are we agreed? And any opposed? Very well. And we're back. And just for the interest of those in the gallery, uh, in case you did not hear the motion, uh, we have extended past our normal end time to deal with this item only. So if you are in fact here to discuss perhaps another item on the agenda, that won't come until tomorrow at 1. And I just wanted to let you know that we're just going to finish off this item tonight and then we will adjourn at the end of that. Alderman Moore. Okay. Uh, so before we put up number two, I have been advised to remove uh, a portion of it so it would be the wording madam clerk after city council so it should for number two it should after city council correct okay. no, sorry number two completely okay sorry we're not going to do number two we're not going to do number three um, and your worship this is uh, makes it very, very difficult, I find, to be able to, to do my job effectively when I'm we're really being limited to what we can talk about. And I, th I hope the public appreciates how difficult of a situation this is because we are, um, we're being told one thing in one report and something quite different in another. I don't think that's fair, Alderman Marr. Um, I don't think that's fair at all, as a matter of fact. Uh, and it kind of impugns the uh, professionalism of our administration. I would, That's note, not my I would note that the motions that you wanted to put are, in fact, already contained in the report that we already passed. Uh, okay, so can we can do, yes, number four. So, Madam Clerk, if we could get number four up. And that is, of course, to direct administration to ensure that all municipal construction contracts related to the airport tunnel are publicly tendered and are within the City of Calgary's procurement policy and are in full compliance with the Municipal Government Act of Alberta. This is, of course, uh, to be as open and transparent as we can be to ensure that we don't have any issues with regards to sole sourcing or any of these other situations that we've had in the past. Uh, I believe that this is the, um, the right thing to do and something that we all campaigned on, openness, transparent government. All right, Alderman Moore, do you have a seconder for that one? Thanks, Alderman Farrell. All right. I won't say it, Alderman Farrell. I'm tempted, but I won't. <laughs> Alderman Chabot. Yeah, well, Your Worship, 
Um, the fact that we've heard issues to the contrary in regards to our potential negotiation process uh, includes something that is contrary to the motion that's before us. So I'm just wondering, is this something that you... Yeah, you, you know something? You're actually right about that one. I would uh, Thanks, Alderman Chabot, for raising that. Um, I would, in fact, I, I do believe that that one is contrary, given the given what's embedded in the recommendations that are already there. And if the mover and seconder agree with me, then I'm going to call this one out of order. Well, Your Worship, respectfully, right. I think it's within your authority to rule it out of yeah. order. I always without, like to ask the without concurrence for them from the yeah. movers. I, I, I just like to do it to be polite. So yeah, I think you're right. I, I am going to move this one out of order. Sorry, Alderman Mar. Uh, a legal opinion and opinion from the clerks, Your Worship, with regards to the whether or not this is um, out of order, because I don't believe it is. Uh, the right way to do that, Alderman Marr, is to challenge the ruling of the chair on this, um, because the chair does, in fact, have the authority to do that. I thought you asked me for my opinion first. Okay. Out of politeness, so I'm sure. extending the same courtesy. Sure. Your I'm happy to be polite. Mr. Tully, Madam Clerk. Yes, Mr. Tully. Well, Your Worship, I think it's contrary to the text of what's in the report, actually. So I do share the view that is that is a contrary motion, Your Worship. And the, and the proper procedure would be to put a motion to challenge the chair, I think, Your Worship. Uh, thank you. We maybe I will move down into, um, I, will, I will reluctantly accept the, the opinion of Your Worship and, uh, and uh, counsel then. Uh, counsel with an E, not I. Uh, number five, then. Oh, no, we, you wanted to take that one out, didn't you, Paul? Fifth one. Sorry, just one second. Right, we're dwindling. Uh, okay, well, then could I go to number seven, Madam Clerk? And this is really about uh, public engagement. If we're going to construct a tunnel, which I believe we will, uh, I believe that we should have a public engagement process. When I did West LRT, there was a, um, a significant amount of uh, public engagement, which was done to ensure that people would understand what was happening. And I think that this is something that we, we should do to uh, inform the public of what's happening, how we're going to move forward, and uh, if there is any delays at all, I understand from administration that it is virtually completely contained, but I think that we should still be able to go out there with uh, two Calgarians and explain our, our, the situation. And uh, I see the mayor nodding. I, I was thinking LPT. And again, it's just to have a public engagement. So we have an opportunity to discuss with Calgarians, particularly the area residents, the business, the computers that are going to be impacted by the tunnel. How is that going to impact so them? And if, if I may, Alderman, it's very yes. analogous to the West LRT process, right? After council approved it, we did they nonetheless it. engaged and perhaps made some changes, and in, not perhaps, did make some changes along it's the way. It's a way to reach out to our communities yeah. and to I our citizens, that. Your Worship. Okay. Do we have a seconder for that one? Thanks, Alderman Keating. Any debate on this one? <clears throat> Alderman Stevenson. Your Worship, this makes me laugh. I know Alderman Marr has told me that he very seldom goes to the Northeast, but uh, there have been dozens, there have been dozens of meetings, I mean dozens of meetings up there with the uh, uh, stakeholders. I don't think there's ever been something in this city that has had as much stakeholder involvement as this. So uh, I just, I, I'm sorry I can't help but laugh a little bit, but uh, this is not something that should even be on the, the screen here, Your Worship. Alderman Chabot. Very, very, very briefly, Your Worship. Ditto. <laughs> Madam Clerk, please note Alderman Chabot's shortest <laughs> set of statements ever, Alderman Jones. 
Your Worship, uh, I could say ditto, but I won't. Uh, you know, it's, it's like Alderman Stevenson said, if anything has had public engagement, this has for the last two or three years. I mean, even during the last election, I can assure you, like 65,000 out of about 66,000 people in my ward agree with it, it was the number one issue. And everybody said, I can't believe you guys are even debating this. It should be a done deal. I, I just, I, I don't know what public you want to engage. They're already engaged. Some of them are in the audience tonight. They formed their own committee. They met, they meet every week. They're engaged. Alderman Keating. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I would like to follow along that line, but uh, it, it has been noted that in the two wards here, there has been public engagement. And if this is a truly city issue, then I would like to see public engagement from across the city, including all of the wards, not just the ones that are in this area. Thank you. I hear you, Alderman Keating. I'm just, I'm just laughing because uh, in my world, Boy, did we have a lot of public engagement on this issue in Ward 12, 13, 14. Every forum we went to down there, somehow this came up. But I hear you. Alderman Putmans? Uh, same thing, speaking on behalf of... Big part? And six. And six, thank you. Uh, as it relates to commuters, I think this debate uh, reminds me actually of the West LRT project uh, during construction, um, commuters to the airport, perhaps not commuters, but travelers, uh, will have a keen interest in being aware of how it will impact their lives over the next few years. So yes, I will support this motion. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman Putmans. Anyone else? All right, on the amendment, as you see on the screen, are we agreed? Any opposed? Call the roll, please. Alderman Jones. No. Alderman Keating. Yes. Alderman Lowe. Yes. Alderman McLeod. Yes. Alderman Marr. Alderman Pincott? Yes. Alderman Putmans? Yes. Alderman Stevenson? No. Alderman Carra? <laughs> oh, Alderman Carra. <laughs> I like public engagement, but no. Alderman Chabot? Uh, no. Alderman Collier? Yes. Alderman Demong? If it said all areas of the city, yes, but this is the northeast area, so no. Alderman Frau. Alderman Hodges. Yes. Mayor Nenshi. No. It's carried, Your Worship. Okay. Alderman. Last one. Last one. Last one. Uh, number six, Madam Clerk, if you don't mind. Number six, please. And this is quite simply to direct administration to include as part of the City of Calgary's negotiating team, acting as observers to aldermen, not directly impacted by the airport tunnel project. <laughs> Can you, um, before you even put it, mm -hmm. Alderman Moore, not directly impacted by the airport tunnel project, given that many would argue it's a citywide project, Let's try some different language. Well, uh, I would say, uh, you know, the three northeast or nor the eastern sides. And I was just thinking from ter terms of just a, uh, to try to be as, uh, I could, I could, you know what, I, I would be happy to just to say that two aldermen to act as observers even. Uh, Maybe I'll put who, it as, as And who would appoint those aldermen? Do you want PAC to do it? PAC or, or council? No, why don't you throw an appointed by PAC? Okay. And we'll do that in, on, in March if this passes. Sounds good. Did you get that? Um, negotiating team, no fewer than two aldermen appointed by PAC. Can we start without them? Okay. You don't want to put the mayor on that team, Alderman Moore? I have so much free time. <laughs> you know, some... Um, uh, get rid of not directly impacted by the airport tunnel project. Up to you, Alderman Moore. Okay. Do I have a seconder for this one? Alderman, do I have a seconder? Alderman Keating, thank you. Uh, on this one, Alderman Lowe, then Alderman Putmans. Well, Your Worship, uh, Alderman Moore actually, and I had actually spoken about this, and I, I disagree with it. Uh, it uh, I think, with due respect to Alderman Stevenson, the, there's been far too much aldermanic involvement as managers in this now. 
And uh, we're governors, Your Worship. We're not managers, and we should uh, retain that role. Alderman Footmans. Thank you, Worship. A similar vein, I, I, it's, it's tantalizing, and I wonder if there's any rationale or any, if, if perhaps in closing, Alderman Marr, if you could address what your motivations and thinking is for asking this. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman Footman. Alderman Keating. I just wondered if uh, we could get an opinion of administration of this, just because it, it, it came out of the out of the blue and it looked interesting, but I'm not sure where we're going. Mr. Tobert, we'd welcome supervision. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> of myself. Uh, any further discussion on this one, Alderman Stevenson? Uh, I don't usually agree with Mr. Uh, Alderman Low, but I do. There's been too much political interference in this. If people would have listened to me three years ago, it would be done. Um, so anyway, I, the, reason why I'm not, um, the reason why I'm not going to support this is because there's, having been involved in these meetings so much, we got uh, our legal people negotiating with their legal people, our engineers negotiating with their engineers. Uh, we got too many uh, places. Where would we put these people? I, I don't think that they would add anything to it, and I personally would not want to be one of the aldermen that's there. I would like to have the administration finished what they've been doing for now some uh, three months. Thank you. Alderman Chabot. Thank you, Worship. Uh, I, too, agree with Alderman Lowe. Our, our position here is to, uh, to govern and not manage. Um, I think administration has the expertise we don't necessarily all any of us have the expertise in negotiating these types of agreements and I think if anything we are likely to uh, create a situation that is uh, akin to uh, too many cooks to spoil the soup so to speak so um, I'm not going to be supporting this recommendation your worship encourage members of council not to. thanks Alderman Chabot anyone else before I call on Alderman Mar to close Alderman Mar to close thank you your worship uh, I think very critically, it should be noted that the, the aldermen that would be there would be acting as observers. I think that it's quite clear that we don't exactly know what's been said behind these closed doors, and we want to be able to be able to report to each other. And since most of this is all in camera, I think it's, it would just make it a little bit easier for us to identify for each other's and speak quite plainly how the negotiations are going and what uh, what some of the uh, the issues are, uh, and that's why I, in consultation with uh, His Worship, actually uh, wanted to bring this as a as an amendment. So thank you very much. Thanks, Alderman Marr. On this one, then, are we agreed? Any opposed? Call the roll, please. Alderman Lowe. No. Alderman McLeod? No. Alderman Marr? Yes. Alderman Pincott? No. Alderman Putmans? No. Alderman Stevenson? No. Alderman Carra? No. Alderman Chabot? No. Alderman collier -Cott? Yes. Alderman DeMong? Yes. Alderman Farrell? No. Alderman Hodges? No. Alderman Jones? No. Alderman Keating? Yes. Mayor Nenshi? Yes. That's lost, Your Worship. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Marr, that was it? That's it. Alderman Marr, thank you. Thank you for putting all this and trying to make this whole thing better. I appreciate that very much. Alderman Chabot. Thank you, Your Worship. And uh, my apologies if I may have missed something. Um, during Alderman Marr's debate, uh, some matters I had to attend to. Um, I, I've got a couple of questions, and I'm a, a bit concerned. Um, without going into the specifics of Report uh, 2011 06, there are some concerns certainly that were raised in that report, and without revealing anything, I, I'd just like to know um, administration's position on something that was one of the motions that had been put forward by Alderman Marr. And, and I think a portion of his motion um, was actually not contrary. And that's in really regards to us, um, I guess, um, fulfilling our judiciary responsibility as members of council and not contravening the act. There are some risks associated with this 
that potentially, in my opinion, might put us in jeopardy of, of contravening municipal government act. I'd like Mr. Tully's opinion as to whether or not he believes or whether or not we are committing ourselves to negotiate terms that could potentially put us in conflict with the municipal government act. I think that's entirely legitimate to ask Alderman Chabot. Mr. Sully? Well, Your Worship, as we've talked about before in other meetings, Council does have a fiduciary responsibility uh, by virtue of your position. And as we discussed at the in-camera meeting, um, the administration is attempting to negotiate uh, an agreement in good faith, and they've brought uh, to you the various terms and conditions of that, uh, Your Worship. And so I don't see anything that that the administration has brought to you that if council adopted would put you in breach of your fiduciary obligations under the Municipal Government Act. The act says that as long as you act in good faith, there is no liability that attaches to you and that, and that is with respect to your fiduciary obligations as well. So as long as you act in good faith, which I believe uh, you have done so far as observing your, your deliberations, I do not see anything that would put you in breach of uh, your fiduciary obligations under the act, Your Worship. Okay. Thank, thank you so much for that, Your Worship. Um, now, as far as um, our MSI funding, there's been some talk about um, how we could potentially fund this, including using some MSI funding for uh, carrying costs. And uh, I'm just, I'm, I just want to make sure that we don't put ourselves in a position whereby we're exceeding our, our um, borrowing, our debt servicing, and our debt loading. Um, capacity as as uh, supported by the MGA. We have limitations and uh, Council has imposed some additional limitations and I'd just like to hear from Mr. Sawyer, make sure that we're not broaching that maximum that we've imposed on ourselves Mr. as well Sawyer? as the MGA. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, there are several limits that apply uh, to the City of Calgary relating to debt. And let me just quickly uh, walk through them. Uh, one is around the total amount of debt. And the total amount of debt um, must not exceed two times revenue. Uh, just for your information, 2010, uh, we're sitting at about 54% of that maximum level. We're projected to peak in the year 2013 based on the MSI funding at around 80% of the debt limit. So that is still within the capital financing policy. We also have debt servicing limits. Under the MGA, it's 35% of revenue. And the estimate here, again, 2010, we're sitting around 33% of that limit, forecast to reach a maximum of in around 70% of that limit. So again, we've got room and the other limit is the council debt service limit of 10%. And we're actually, um, to give you an example, in the early 2000s, we were around 80% of that limit. We're projecting to be 2013, less than 30% of that limit. So I can tell you that we are within the um, MGA limits and within the council limits. Okay, Mr. Sawyer, please don't sit down just yet, if you don't mind. You did indicate that around 2013 that we were going to be in and around the 80% um, kind of margin, is that correct? On our maximum debt service, or our maximum allowable debt? That's correct. Okay, so how does it look beyond that? Does it look like it's gonna be declining? Are we going to be retiring some debt to, over the course of the next number of years, or how, how does the projection look beyond that? Yes, I picked the year 2013 because that's where it peaks. So it actually will come off from that level. By 2018, we're projecting to be more like about 55% of the debt limit. Whew. That's all I can say, 80%. Boy, that's pushing the limits. Um, sorry, Worship, um, for that commentary. Um, if I may, we've, Council has approved a motion to downgrade um, Métis Trail from a major to an arterial, or to, from a, an expressway to, to an arterial. We, 
we asked administration to bring that back okay. as a public hearing. We haven't approved it, just okay. to be clear. All right, thanks for that. So now the implications of that, Mr. Logan, does, is there, was there any MSI funding allocated to, towards that expressway that have not been expended to date? Do you know? Your Worship, um, at the moment, we are undertaking the construction of Métis Trail from 80th Avenue to 96th Avenue, and yes, a portion of that project, it's a 2011 project, does include MSI. Is that the question that? Yes, yeah, that covers that question. Now, I guess a subsequent question to that, or a follow-up to that, is if council were to approve this recommendation, um, would that MSI funding then go back into the cupboard, so to speak? No, Your Worship, that, it, we've already tendered and awarded that contract. Okay. so. What about cost recoveries now? If the um, somebody mentioned that we would be able to be able to go retroactive on some of our costs, but of course that would probably exclude some of those grade separated interchanges that were related directly to a, an expressway. Would we be able uh, to recover some of those costs? Your Worship, uh, I think with respect to construction of the road, no. Uh, with respect to some of the land that we may have purchased that is now surplus to our needs, we could potentially resell those. And uh, Mr. Stevens could probably help me. Um, so we often have clauses that we have to offer that land back to the adjacent owners. So there could be ways to recoup a portion of, of those costs. Uh, could I get further clarification from Mr. Stevens on that, if you don't mind, Your Worship? I think Mr. Tober may have some too. Mm -hmm. Oh, go ahead, Mr. Stevens. Uh, Your Worship, if, um, if we obtain land by way of expropriation and uh, the land is then not subsequently needed for a period of up to two years, we have to offer that land back to the <coughs> And of if, course, it's, if it's negotiated, then it's a negotiated transaction and we're able to deal with it as we wish. But that, that rule applies if land is expropriated. And, and on that point, those, those costs associated with that would be based on sector rates, right? No. Not sector rates? No, so sector rates, value. no. When you take land, that's an entirely different valuation. So market value? Market value. If it's done by expropriation, it's usually an award done by an expropriation panel. So uh, that award is usually an award by an independent third party. So then would that allow us to um, sell it back to the vendor at those, at those prices that we paid for it? Uh, yes. Yeah. Or potentially higher if the market no, value is gone? I don't believe so. I'd have to go back. We, I don't think we've come into that situation, at least as long as I've been responsible, where we've actually run into that. We're, we're very careful that when we expropriate land, uh, we're pretty sure that it's actually required. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Now, the only other issue I had was in regards to the MSI contingency fund, and uh, just wondering whether or not we have the capacity, based on the current council directives, being as 50 million was based out of the contingency fund, and uh, council had approved fund financing up to 7% of the contingency fund, specifically for debt servicing that was approved by the provincial government. If we move into this direction of looking at financing some of this using contingency funds, are we gonna, um, I guess, rob the cupboard dry or, you know, where, where are we at with regards to where that's gonna bring us uh, in regards to our contingency fund? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. A uh, couple of comments on this. One, the interest costs right now are sitting at 7% of the total MSI, and that's the maximum we're currently allowed from the province. Um, borrowing the funds, advancing the funds as part of the recommendation around the tunnel uh, would require those interest costs to go higher. They would go higher by approximately 1% to 8%. We'd require the concurrence of the provincial government our indications is they would be willing to do that. That would still be part of, um, uh, so that would increase the amount of contingency dedicated to interest costs as well. Uh, right now we have uh, approximately 70 million of unallocated uh, contingency and the proposal is to take 50 of that and use it towards the financing of the tunnel. So then that would leave just $20 million unallocated within that contingency fund, correct? Out of the original contingency fund, that would leave us $20 million. Okay. 
So we can afford to do it, I guess, is the long and short of it. Now, I'm just curious about some of these other projects that are falling off. And I know that Council had at one point approved some uh, financing specifically for a grade-separated interchange, I believe, at Ogden Road and Glenmore Trail. And I'm just curious as to what impact it's going to have on that particular project. Is that something that's going to fall off the table or is that still moving forward? Your Worship, where are we at with that one? Do you know? Your Worship, uh, the Glenmore Trail East Corridor study or East Corridor upgrades were part of TIIP. Um, they have not, they have had future funding allocated to them. Council has not approved the capital budget for those projects. Uh, they would be, the funding that's been allocated to those projects would be a potential source of money to close the funding gap that we have in this project. That hurts a lot because um, the benefit that that could have uh, for the city as a whole, I think, is uh, not something that I would want to entertain. Hopefully, we can negotiate an agreement that doesn't need drawing from that particular project because I think it's absolutely essential that we move forward with that project, Your Worship. So I will leave it in your good hands to negotiate the best agreement you possibly can so that we don't have to draw on those other projects, Your Worship. And just as a follow-up, Mr. Logan, um, I just want to highlight what you said, which is that no, no particular projects, are, if we approve this today, are on the chopping block. Those would be decisions for council to make should that money have to be reallocated as part of our capital budget process going forward? We're not suggesting canceling any approved projects, Your Worship. Okay, thanks, Mr. Logan. <coughs> well, um, very briefly in debate, if I may, Your Worship. Well, of course. Well, won't be quite that brief, but I'll try and keep it under five minutes. I was about to say, of course. Um, I, I, you know, it, this is a project that I've been supporting right from the get go. Um, I was right beside. Alderman Stevenson when the ATAC committee first formed and um, although I wasn't involved as much as uh, Alderman Stevenson was of course um, they all know that I've been supporting this project all along and uh, I know that this is something that potentially um, is going to hurt us it's going to hurt us financially in being able to be innovative with a number of other initiatives throughout the city but I also believe that this is something that is absolutely essential that it be done today because if we don't do it today, we'll never do it in the future. Um, so it's a short-term pain for a long-term gain and uh, as much as I hate to say it, uh, it is something that uh, I'm going to support, albeit with some reluctance because I know that it's going to have some, some major impacts on the future in regards to our ability to move forward on on some projects that certainly would also be equally beneficial or almost as equally beneficial. But I also believe that uh, it's a very time sensitive issue that uh, needs to be dealt with today. And if we don't do it today, then then uh, I guess we'll be able to move forward on some other projects. So anyways, Hope Council can support the motion and uh, um, looking forward to the challenges that this brings uh, in the future. Thanks, Alderman Chabot. Alderman, Co and that was nowhere near five minutes. Oh, <laughs> it's okay. I turned his light off. Alderman Collier, card. Thank you. Uh, so I have a few questions. Uh, uh, actually, uh, Ms. Cole, if I could uh, ask you some of these questions, is that okay? Thank you. I wondered if you could just, uh, without getting into the specifics, uh, just give an overall, uh, just give an overview of the category or the risk elements uh, as it relates to what we're faced with. Uh, your Worship, um, the confidential report outlines the status of negotiations with the airport authority at this time. And the recommendation in the public report suggests that you should direct us to go back and address some of those risks and risk mitigation strategies outlined in that confidential report. So uh, the letter of December 16th from the airport authority, uh, which was 
uh, called the preliminary terms and conditions regarding the potential eastward extension <coughs> of airport trail and the related tunnel. It was not a confidential letter from the airport. No, it was not. Right. So, um, um, and you're not able to talk about any of the categories of risk? I can tell you that that letter outlines the airport authority's position. My understanding that is in some subsequent discussions, they have indicated a willingness to perhaps move off some of those positions. Until we know uh, at what stage the airport authority is in their deliberations, it's hard to assess the current risk or the risk mitigation strategies that might be associated with this project. Are there any short-term financial risks? Well, there's the... That might be more of a financial than a legal question. I wonder if Mr. Tobert may have a uh, point of view on that. Uh, I'll come back to that then. I'll just okay. stick with the, uh, with the ones that you may be familiar with. Um, well, you, you've looked at this through the legal filter. I'm really interested uh, from the legal perspective. Uh, uh, do, we, do we know the exact uh, construction costs as you've reviewed the uh, file from the conceptual drawings that are done? Again, I think that's a, not really a legal question, more for Mr. Logan. Okay. So one of the amendments I wanted to make, would it be a number seven or eight? We're on seven, Alderman uh, Collier, correct? Okay. Ms. Gray? Oh, eight. Ms. Gray, I, I one, gave yes. you the amendment, if you could put that up. Uh, so it was one that I talked about in camera, and I don't think it's contrary, but it is important from my perspective to have a paper trail as a result of the letter that was written by the airport authority. And it's just asking administration to continue to negotiate with the airport authority in relation to this December 16th letter uh, with best efforts to mitigate the risks uh, to the city of Calgary. Uh, as identified in camera, which we can't talk about, and to report back to Council no later than March 21st. Now, you could report back weekly if you wanted to. You could call a special meeting if you wanted to. But at least, Your Worship, uh, it gets this matter on the record that this is really what we have in front of us as a negotiating uh, point. I know verbally you've said that things changed on Friday and you've had meetings that have changed uh, what, what their intentions were, uh, but uh, if I have a seconder. Second. Uh, I, I do not believe this is contrary, even with an option three. It, it just says that we want you to proceed on with, uh, uh, as a point of negotiations from that 16th letter. So is that, in your po uh, from your perspective, since you've been on the negotiating uh, uh, team, uh, is, would that be appropriately placed? Uh, whether it's contrary would be a, an issue for his worship to opine on. And I will. <laughs> I, I actually don't think it's contrary. <clears throat> Excuse me, Alderman Collier Cart. Part of all of it, except for the report back part, I think is already encapsulated in recommendation number two. It's not contrary, it's sort of already there because recommendation number two talks about the in camera report. Um, but if you'd like to bring that out and make it a little more public, I, I don't particularly have a problem with that. And, and the, 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 real, the real part that will, that will change is the report back at the very end, well, um, and which, is back, which is fine with me. Well, frankly. Your Worship, even if you wanted to say and report back to Council in camera no, no later than the 21st, I don't yes. mind that. But uh, I, I don't... Yeah, like a progress report. I, I have no problem with that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know something? Um, it really... Mr. Tully, if we don't say in camera, then depending on the nature of the report, could we decide if it was in public or in camera? Like this motion wouldn't make it. So we can leave in camera out. If there's something confidential, they can they can put that part in camera if they need to. Okay. Yeah, I think it's fine. It, 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 it's, it's a little funny because just of what it says in number two, but you're really getting at the report back, I think, right? Well, and creating so, the paper trail because what yeah, we have I in think front that's of, fine. yeah. I don't have a problem with that. Do we have a seconder for that? Second, Your Worship. Oh, thanks, Alderman Chabot. Okay, any debate on this one? All right. Can I call it closed, Alderman Collier Kurt? Sure. Okay, so on this one, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Okay. Great, thank you. Uh, so just on my other questions then, uh, uh, Mr. Logan, uh, 
Uh, can you uh, can you tell us today what the final construction cost is? No, Your Worship. And why not? And uh, and what are the consequences of not knowing the final construction cost? Uh, Your Worship, um, until such time as we actually complete the work, tender the work, and go through the the process of building it and dealing with whatever unknowns come up during the process of construction, we won't know the final construction cost. That uh, That's not unusual. And sorry, the second part of your question was? So if you don't know the final construction cost, then what are you asking of council? Um, to well, just uh, approve a blank check? No, Your Worship. Um, I, I don't think that uh, any time we come to council and ask for a capital budget to be approved, we asked for an allocation of budget towards a project, and we asked for authority to spend up to that limit. Um, I don't think we're asking for a blank check. I think in all honesty, we're asking for an amount that we believe covers our best estimate of the construction cost plus a contingency and plus some other costs that we've tried to outline to you as best we can. But really, it's only based on a conceptual design at this point. It's based on a preliminary design, yes which is actually exactly the same as we would do any other budget allocation, to be honest. And you've come back in some occasions uh, and had to ask for more money. Yes, we have. And where would we get that from? Depending on how much money it was, it uh, may be a bit of a problem. I think Mr. Tobert had something to add to that question. Sorry? Your worship, your worship. I think Mr. Tobert had something to add to that question, Thank or you. that answer. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, just to add to what uh, GM Logan has said, uh, we actually have a very healthy contingency. We normally do in any project, and we have one in this particular one, and it allows us to make some uh, adjustments to uh, the allocations provided for construction subject to the limits of our contingency. If we have gone beyond the limits of what we have in our contingency, and your question is, what do we do? Well, we have other monies in the program that we have made allowances for. And our intention is not to spend all that money. And there may be ways of moving some money around and still stay within the program. But let's say, for instance, we get partway through and we know we need more money. Well, we will come back. And there's lots of different ways of getting more money. There's other projects to look at. Uh, there's borrowing that we could do. We talked other about projects, all that in camera. Other projects where? Uh, we don't know yet because we don't know how much we need. But this but is what you're suggesting is this is typical for a project like this. Well, this isn't this, a, this one little part of it is typical. <laughs> But uh, uh, if, you, if you would, uh, Mr. Tobert, um, on other projects, like if we're already uh, um, skimming from other projects to make this one work, and you're saying if, if we haven't really truly nailed down the cost, which we haven't, and it's not unusual that we haven't when we're at these preliminary stages, <coughs> that we could go back to other projects, where, what projects would those be? Your Worship, I, I really can't say. And it's really well, for an example. Well, I'll let Mr. Logan, because we talked about some of those in camera, and you know what those are. Uh, do I need to go through that list again to say we had allocated some money for some future projects, but we hadn't actually, you know, approved the funding for them? They're way off in the future, and if we need to uh, adjust our budgets by going after those, then we can without actually impacting anything that's approved today. So there, we do have some contingency yes. in projects. Yes. Okay, thank you. And uh, Mr. Logan, that tips list uh, is sort of, it's not a moving target, but it's a list that we compile and each year or every couple of years we update it. Some fall off, some find their way up sooner. So more specifically, uh, on the tips list, uh, and I think we're still working on that list as, as we speak. Yes. Um, give me an example of some of the projects with, that would fall off the table. I want, I want Calgarians to know uh, the, the, the challenges and the choices that we're having to make as, uh, as members of council. Um, Your Worship, uh, the, the tips list that we're working on goes to the, two th you know, really looks at the 2019, 2020, 2021 time period. Um, I don't think there's any specific projects that I could sort of say, well, this one would fall off and that one would fall off. We've tried to follow a philosophy that we continue to spend a balance of roads and um, transit. transit. And as Alderman Chabot pointed out earlier, Your Worship, we have suggested that one of the potential projects would be Glenmore Trail East. 
And I, while I, I, I share uh, Mr. Uh, I mean, Alderman Chabot's concern that that project needs to be done, we're saying, well, we can't do everything. We don't have enough money to do everything, so council has to make some choices. Um, so I, I can't really be specific. It's not that I don't want to be. It's, it's just that I don't have that list in front of me to sort of say, here are the top priorities. This is how much we would carve out of it. <laughs> So where would this project have, rank, project have ranked on that TIPS list? You know, I wish I knew the answer to that question because when we did the TIPS in 06, 07, we really started in 2006. We didn't understand the airport's timeline at that time. And uh, it would have been very interesting to, to have gone through TIPS with that in the, in the mix. Um, I, you know, we're speculating. I would have to speculate at this Other time. Day. Uh, as far as land acquisition goes, uh, mm -hmm. how many other parties would we have to uh, enter into agreements with uh, as far as land acquisition, or is there just the Calgary Airport Authority? Your Worship, if, if we followed through with the additional, um, with the additional <coughs> roadway links to the east, uh, we would have a minimum of two landowners that we would have to negotiate with. Could you speak to the timeline that we're faced with between what we're being asked to do tonight uh, and uh, when this decision has to be made? Um, Your Worship, um, the Airport Authority has been very clear that, they're, that they intend to close uh, Barlow Trail on April the 3rd, 2011. That's approximately 55 days from today, I believe. Um, it's, it's my feeling that we need to be in a clear position prior to that date as to whether we're moving forward with this project or not moving forward with this project. And the sooner that that, that decision is, is rendered by council, um, if it is to go forward, then we need to get working with them, with the airport authority as quickly as we can so that we can identify what needs to be done or what could potentially be done immediately. Um, so this, you know, virtually today, is the answer to that question. That's how soon we need to know. It's not that we have to push dirt tomorrow, it's that we have to start designing and start communicating and putting together teams and things like that. So you need to know today, but uh, you don't know the results of the negotiations with the airport authority. Sort of based on this December 16th letter, uh, there are a lot of issues that are raised in there. Uh, and you're, you're needing to negotiate a pretty complex agreement in five weeks. So what element of risk does that impose on the City of Calgary? Your Worship, I think that the, you know, the risk is, is different if, if it's Council's will to move forward. Then we have a, I think we have a different indication to, to the Airport Authority that we're prepared to invest significantly into that piece of infrastructure on their property, which I think enhances both the overall city than the Northeast Network. Um, and that would significantly influence those those negotiations and, and, and would help to reduce our risk. Uh, reducing the risk as far as cost delays, as far as, um, I think that would be the biggest one that it would help reduce. So could you vote on something if you didn't know what the agreement was? Your Worship, I, I don't think I could really answer that. I've never been in your seat to answer that question. I, I, I fully appreciate this is an extremely, extremely difficult decision to make this evening. Uh, may I ask Mr. Tobert? He actually would like to answer that question. We're not asking Council to sign an agreement today. We're actually asking Council to give us permission to, within a set of strict confines, not to be exceeded, an agreement with a third party and the agreement's quite clear and it says that to go ahead and do that negotiations and so our intent is to do that hopefully successfully within the confines as approved by council if however <clears throat> we reach a, a, a position in which we weren't able to we would come back to council and say here's where we are Here's how far apart we are. And we would do that as quickly as we could. So we're not so asking what? council to sign a blank check or to um, approve something for which the, the risks are unknown. We've done the best we could to define the risks 
and we've tried to limit it based on a certain set of criteria to say this is how far we'll go and no more. Uh, on that point, Mr. Tobert, I, I have, in my years on council, never seen such a well-written report as the confidential one that outlines risk to this corporation. Uh, and so I'm very impressed with that. I think you do know the risks. Um, they've, they've been outlined very clear, clearly. I think they're quite extensive. And I, I, I just wonder um, how will you go, how will you, what, what is your process on a go forward basis to mitigate all the risks that are in that confidential report? Like, Your Worship, you anticipate daily meetings like this is going to require so much work, and I want to know if if are, are are we expecting the impossible with the timeline that we're imposing on you, with the risks that are at hand? <clears throat> no, I don't believe it's impossible. However, it takes two willing parties. Yes, and um, we we're, we're certainly motivated. Well, some of us are probably more than others, Your Worship. So, uh, thank you, and thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Logan. I know my colleagues have some other questions as it relates to uh, to this matter. Um, it's uh, it's probably obvious that I I'm having a lot of difficulty with this. It's uh, it's it's probably more complex than anything that we've dealt with on council, and that we have to deal with in such a short period of time and that we can't talk publicly about because we will cause uh, you know, difficulty for the corporation and put the corporation at risk, which none of us are prepared to do. And, uh, and uh, uh, hopefully the airport authority is listening tonight and I would say that I don't support us going forward with this. It's an impossible timeline. The risks are too much of a burden. And I think it's unfair to expect our staff to reconcile all these risks. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman Collier. And let me just say thank you for asking those questions. I think that it is really important that uh, we have this discussion and precisely on the elements that you raised. So thank you. Alderman Lowe. Well, thank you, Your Worship. Um, and um, 5 to 11, I'm afraid I do have some questions. Uh, some of the questions I have have been asked and answered. I will say from the onset, Your Worship, that uh, a couple of things I'm going to say. One is that uh, I don't view this as a vote of confidence in you. Me neither. Uh, my fact that I'll be in the chair tomorrow does not represent an Alberta uh, coup. <laughs> so uh, with that, yes. I'll, uh, yet, yet. So I'll carry on. Uh, Mr. Logan, if I could, uh, I will. I will admit when I. Uh, in fact, I'll state categorically, when I read Report 05, first time I was significantly disappointed. Uh, it, I'm more accustomed to very objective reports, and I found this report to be far from objective. And actually, I thought of you, if uh, you had not been on one side of this, that you probably would have been somewhat less than kind to the report. Having said that, Mr. Logan, looking at, uh, at uh, page three of six, the right-hand column, where you list the options, option one, option two, and option three. Option one and option two, you provide some uh, analysis and, and costing, et cetera, over uh, about you know 20 to 30 year period. And yet option three, the recommended option, mm -hmm. you give us nothing beyond two years. Not exactly. That was the thing that leapt out at me. It was a complete lack of apples to apples turnips. So looking at option three and projecting ahead, what do you see that will be needed in Later on in the report, it seems to say that even with the tunnel, mm -hmm. we're, we're going to have to do uh, roadway improvements on Mady Trail, on Country Hills Boulevard across. Uh, I saw no mention in the report about uh, 128th Avenue over Deerfoot and 11th Street Northeast <coughs> through Stony 
and off Stony Trail as an alternate access. Uh, I saw no discussion in that at all. But this very narrow, do it now, put all your eggs in this basket, and life is good. Your Worship, if I might, seeing as you've sort of implied that I wrote a biased report. Oh, I'm sorry. I um, didn't imply. I, I was instructed. I, <laughs> I was instructed to write a report to come back on this particular option, in in effect, and what I tried to do was inject into that report some uh, opportunity to sort of say, do nothing is always an option, but I believe in this case, do nothing will have a cost over time, and I was trying to to quantify for council's benefit sort of if we didn't do anything now what might we have to do differently over time um, in the absence of that particular roadway link and I felt that there were there were interchanges that we would have to build and uh, um, we also wanted to be bring forward the information that we did earlier about the tunnel and imply that uh, if we were to bore that tunnel later on that it would be considerably more expensive meter for meter, if you will, and we did get an outside would have had, We would have had the interchanges built by then. I think we would have. Yeah. Um, so it's a fair comment that in option three, we didn't forecast, okay, at, at the same, exactly the same time horizon, and maybe uh, maybe I could have put a little bit more rigor in that given, you know, a, a, a fuller process. Um, the difference in the two is really what, what would you have to build at, say, a 30-year horizon in one versus the other end? And the difference would have been, um, at 30 years, I've indicated that we would probably have to build grade separations into and out of the terminal. Those aren't included in either cost, so that's neutral, they're out. The Deerfoot and 128th is not in either number. Um, Why not? I guess what would be fair is, would we have had to build a free flow along airport trail by the time I said we would have had to build all the air, all of the, the interchanges around? Um, I mean, it, I'm, I, can, I can go back and take a look at that. It's, it's quite possible. Uh, however, the numbers that we've looked at would suggest that probably not. If you have two parallel routes, you probably wouldn't need to have free flow on, uh, on both of them. Probably Maybe not. either one of them. Well, possibly not on airport trail. Yeah. Which is my point. So it sort of spend Three hundred million on a tunnel now, knowing full well we're going to spend another three hundred forty-five or whatever the number was here uh, in another twenty years to get the other parallel route in. Uh, sorry, I that is not what I meant to say. I, I I think that if we were to build, if we were to invest in the airport trail corridor, that would be our free flow corridor, and the the other corridors would remain as sort of arterial corridors over time. Maybe I, I wasn't clear on that. I apologize. So I take it then your, your view, sir, is that, that uh, this, is the pen, this, is, this, this is the ultimate solution to an east-west corridor to, through uh, north-central Calgary. Your Worship, I, I think that would be the only free-flow east-west corridor we would need, and I think it would, um, we would remain with uh, Country Hills as an arterial-grade road. And I believe that, uh, as per our earlier discussion, we could go back to a, a non-free flow corridor on Métis Trail, based on the, the forecast that I've seen. Um, in, in, in broad terms, I think it gives us the best mobility. And if we weren't pressed for time in construction, that would be what we would be working towards at our, uh, as it was warranted on a citywide basis. One of the uh, discussions I've had Suggest, uh, suggested, and I know you've, you've uh, disagreed, that uh, day one open, the at-grade intersection at Barlow and Airport Trail through the tunnel will operate very close to F. That, that's not my information. And uh, I realize that's not your information, but my question is, did you ever put this out we, we have traffic studies uh, yes. provided by the, the uh, group advocating this. Uh, we don't know who funded those. We, we have our list of suspects out there, of course. And uh, we know that the city did its work. Did we ever consider peer reviewing those? Um, I, 
not our not our most recent piece of work the the functional planning study which does include traffic volumes we did not however we we made it publicly available sort of anticipating a peer review by uh, the members of the public who were vocally against the the project uh, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure that that would be an objective peer review no. uh, by peer review I mean is uh, you and I get to, you and I get together and select the third one and say here go do it we well your worship what we have done we used our regional transportation model and we did do an independent peer review of our regional transportation model by Parsons, Parsons Brinkerhoff mm -hmm. and they they assessed our regional transportation model to be uh, one of the top three in North America so I would say that we we're using a fairly robust tool we input information that came directly from the airport authority on a joint study we did um, I, I didn't think that there was any um, real macro assumptions that we that we couldn't sort of substantiate I, w I wasn't too worried about the forecast okay just the advice reaching me is just to the contrary in that mr. Logan and I, it's enough to make me worry uh, I mean we're forecasting uh, your own words are suggesting that there will be a tremendous amount of traffic in airport trail when it becomes a the main uh, expressway from Stony East to Deerfoot and uh, seems to be some things there your report further and I'm, I'm staying on uh, Porto 5 uh, your worship uh, page uh, 5 of 6 a couple of things in there worry me is 123 million dollars uncommitted MSI funding and the innovation funding for capital programs was uh, as identified as a possible source of funding at the time when we uh, received the MSI funding council established the uh, the innovation fund if I memory calls correctly I believe it was 160 million to start and out of that we purchased a uh, affordable and attainable housing project uh, up in uh, Alderman Putman's ward were there are there guidelines around the use for that innovation fund Mr. S I, I can't answer that question maybe mr. Uh, Sawyer can help me with that uh, your worship I believe that those funds were earmarked around the innovation but there was no specific that I'm aware of criteria around it okay uh, would it be safe to say it was uh, when we when we bought that uh, condo project that uh, innovation because we we could get this but also opportunity that we could act on very early if I recall that was sort of the rationale we used at the time but not if we didn't it's not part of the transportation envelope is my is my point okay. the uh, same page I'm moving over to the next call and city staff are current presently investigating the ability of, oh I'm sorry uh, annual road maintenance of the underpass estimated to be forty five thousand dollars a year um, which in one hand struck me as not a lot but uh, I'm not hardly an expert in maintaining a 650 meter tunnel but the next paragraph down uh, cast staff for presently investigating availability and cost of operating insurance and the cost in the range of uh, 1 to 2.5 million a year which has an immediate operating impact on our operating budget of uh, somewhere between you know if you add the 45,000 and, and these two us one one and a half to uh, to uh, three million dollars so there's a are there other other anticipated impacts on our operating budget of this tunnel uh, your worship uh, we, we did look at what would be sort of the standard per lane kilometer operating which is fairly easy to determine we looked at things such as the um, the cost of operating the the lighting and, and the electric electrical draw for the ventilation systems and uh, that's reflected in the forty five thousand dollar number um, there would be additional um, operating related to the monitoring which we would feed back through our traffic monitoring center and I imagine that uh, it would also feed over to the airport's security system as well. Uh, the one to two and a half million is is related to uh, insurance that we would have to carry for liability on the airport uh, leased lands. 
And uh, the reason why the spread is so great there is that in the time that we've had available to us, it's difficult to shop a what if number to, to the industry. And uh, um, that's sort of the range of, of numbers that, it, that we've been able to not nail down to date. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Logan. The, uh, Your Worship, I'm, I'm having much of the trouble that my, several of my <coughs> colleagues are having in that, that uh, the balance of my questioning was really centered on the report that we cannot talk about. And uh, it sh which shall not be named. Which shall not be named. All those, it's sequentially numbered to the one I just talked about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but there are some issues that, uh, that I think questions I would like to ask. And uh, the, the one that worries me the most, financial risk that worries me the most, is the fact that we are effectively committing all of the balance of our MSI funds plus other capital funds to this one project based on an, uh, a payout for of, of the MSI, albeit while uh, the province is agreeing today that they're not going to change the schedule, that, that has been their habit when they get into trouble and we've accommodated them. And I, I know the Premier announced quite plainly he wasn't going to cancel that program, which was the best news we've had. He didn't, in his announcement, he, he indicated he said to you he's not changing the schedule, but this year. This, this year. year. This year only. So, uh, to Mr. Tobert, the, the impact of building this tunnel on our ability to be uh, nimble from a capital perspective. Can you comment on it? Mr. Tobert? <clears throat> Whatever flexibility we had it, before council, if they were to approve this project, would be consumed to a great degree. That's, uh, that, that's a good answer, thank you. And uh, what you're basically saying is we spent the credit card up made one payment on it, so we've got whatever room left the payment vacated for us. I believe our uh, line of credit still has some room, though. <laughs> I'm not worried about the line of credit. I mean, we can always borrow money, but you know, again, reading this report, one of the worries I have, and I, I mentioned it in my, before we went in camera, that uh, you know, item three in the bylaw that we're asked to approve which I think is the standard clause in all borrowing bylaws, says that if there's a deficiency, we will raise taxes. And we're hearing of a gap here, some $30 million. So uh, there's a risk there, a significant risk. And that goes directly to the rate payer. I, uh, I, I listened very carefully when we were in. Um, the uh, I, I did spend the weekend going over that report in a great deal of detail and trying to develop a, uh, a matrix. And uh, the principal areas of concern, of course, and I understand why. I can't speak or ask the question publicly about them, and I think that's a shame. So having said all that, I remain unconvinced. I've always had three problems with this, with this project. The need, cost and the funding, and security. That's been my mantra for as long as we've talked about Somehow, in my view, I have the sense the need in this has been hyped up like uh, flogging a, uh, uh, a timeshare vacation. You know, it's a, a nice to have that by the time you get out of the, the sales pitch, you just got to have it. And there's a gap in the middle there. And it, that, that has never been closed for me. We don't know the cost. We do not know the cost. And that worries me. 
security issue. Um, we can talk about that hypothetically till we're pink in the face, but I remain unconvinced. And one of my worries is that we build it, we buy it, and we build it, and we occupy it, only to find out that perhaps we have to restrict who goes through it, which would impact negatively the airport's advantage if they're looking to serve their commercial customers in their, in their uh, industrial lands through that. If they're looking for that, then it seems to me there's, they should be contributing to the, the construction of it, but they're not. They've made it very plain they're not going to. So at the end of the day, Your Worship, given what we have and given the late date, you know, the short time we have on it, my experience in, uh, in other boards, if we were looking at a, an investment of this magnitude at this point, uh, we wouldn't be making a decision. The board would be simply saying, carry on. Here's, here's the concerns I have. Tell me how you're going to mitigate these risks as you go down the road. And it would be a long way down before we started making uh, in principle decisions, which I, I think we're being asked to make here. And quite frankly, I haven't got enough comfort and I'm significantly concerned about the financial impact of this on the city in the immediate, the medium, and the long term that I cannot support it and I cannot recommend it. So with that, Your Worship, I will sit down, but I will vote against it all. Once Thank again. Thanks, Alderman Lowe. Alderman Pincott. Um, thank you. Uh, picking up some. So currently, our MS MSI um, for interest. We're at 7%. We got the government to, the provincial government allowed us to go up to 7%. So did they, they had to change the sort of the, the rules around MSI to get to 7%? Uh, Your Worship, yes, there was uh, a restriction of up to 5%. And basically, we went back to the province and got them agreed to move to 7%. So based on the proposal here, we would need to get them to move to 8%. There has been relatively senior level discussions who have indicated uh, a willingness to do that. Okay. If, so I, I'm, I just, if we don't get that, if we have to stay at 7%, that means then that the 36 million that is <coughs> described as interest charges, would, where would, how would we pay for that? Um, I think we would have to look for some alternate funding and could come back to what Mr. Tobert said earlier around some potentially other projects. I don't know specifically. All right. Um, and uh, if perchance MSI is stretched out a little further, I mean, that too would impact our carrying, our debt ability to carry interest on MSI, right? Would that naturally follow out of that too? <coughs> well, I think, Your Worship, um, we're probably in a situation where if the provincial funding is stretched out, our ability to maintain our expenditure pattern and bridge finance it uh, is getting pretty limited, so we would have to look at some projects to delay out with the funding. I suspect. To, just before you sit down one last time, I know exercise at 11.15 at night is a good thing. Um, Absolutely. Uh, so just, uh, so I, let me understand then how much money from the MSI funding bucket that we have, the 3.3 billion, how much then if, if next year MSI, because we have a commitment that it's not going to stretch out this year and not going to change the timing this year. But let's say in a year's time, it is stretched out a, a year, two years. How, over, how, how much money of projects can we actually, will we have left available to delay at that point? We'll have completed West LRT. I guess your worship, I'm a bit of difficulty with that. We are, right now for 2011, we're expecting 
just over 250 million in funding. And we have projects that add up to much more than that. Yeah. Um, the same situation in 12 as well. So if, for example, we didn't get all the funding that we're assuming, um, then we'd have to but we'd look to move a portion of projects out. Okay, but I, what I guess what I'm asking is, of the, the, the projects assigned to the $3.3 billion that we got, how many are will not, at the end of 2012, have begun that they would be available for delay? Uh, I can't say for certain with the information I've got how many have not or, begun, but the fact that they've begun um, still means there could be ongoing expenditures in 2012 and 2013, and some of that may have to be delayed even if they have begun. Right. What exactly has begun versus not? Uh, I don't have No, that. I, so I'm trying to understand. Again, this is getting to, uh, we're, we're losing wiggle room mm -hmm. all the time on the MSI, and this is, this is taking away further. What, what we have before us with the, the, the interest charges being MSI, as well as pulling all the little bits of MSI that are left over um, is taking away even all of our wiggle room. And that if, per chance, the provincial government looks and goes, for whatever reason, they stretch the MSI funding out further, we'll have to look outside of MSI for funding for those projects, as well as potentially this project. Uh, potentially, but again, we do have significant expenditures planned in 2011, 2012, 2013. We'd have to look hard at some of those that could be delayed a year okay. or two potentially. Okay. And we'd have to go through that. All right. Thank you. Um, so potentially there's $36 million there that we'd have to look at for other places of funding. Um, Mr. Logan, the 31 million dollars that's identified from other projects. I understand you can't actually identify which projects those are. I mean, you've suggested a few, but what if we get into what council likes to do, which is say, well, you're not actually cutting the project in my neighborhood, and you're not cutting the project in my neighborhood, and you're not cutting the project in my neighborhood. And so we're left with 31 million dollars that we haven't actually agreed on which projects would get canceled or delayed for a period of time. For that $31 million then, where do we go? Your Worship, we would have to, um, excluding that option, you would have to increase revenue. And we have different ways of doing that. You can either temporarily do that by incurring different kinds of debt. Okay. Or we could uh, seek to increase our revenue uh, through other means. There's a number discussed in the report that uh, I recommend that we pursue. You know, for example, I've been um, suggesting that fuel tax is something that we seriously need to go back and talk to the province about, uh, particularly in the case of funding road projects. Yeah, no, I agree yeah, so wholeheartedly. Outside of the context of this discussion, I actually yes. agree with that wholeheartedly. Yeah. Uh, so I, I don't think we should wait to see if we actually make the numbers work. Don't worry, Alderman Pinkton, <laughs> I'm on it. Good, glad I'm to hear it. it. Glad to hear it. Um, uh, the operating costs for this um, tunnel. Uh, Alderman Lowe pegged it at $3 million. I'm actually, be, I'll be a little more generous and peg it at, I, in my, when I looked at it, when $2 million-ish for the operating costs. Um, you know, over 25, 30 years, when we're, the horizon that we're looking at when we're comparing different things, we're comparing a horizon of 25 or 30 years, that's $60 million. <coughs> um, is that something then, I mean, is that, that's growth in the roads budget that we're going to have to look at for, well, starting with the next business cycle? Yes, Your Worship, I thought it was important that Council understand that given the <clears throat> unique nature of this facility that there would be an, uh, an unusual operating cost. And uh, I would... You know that it, it would have in, an impact if we were to absorb that within our existing operating budget, and we would intend to come back with the operating budget in the 2014-2015 cycle and request additional funds for that. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, that's a, a tenth of our snow clearing budget every year for 
for that. Um, now, uh, let me go to the report. Um, I just, I want to understand um, the, the, the do nothing option that was before us. Mm -hmm. It says, okay, so if we're not doing the air, if we're not doing the tunnel, there we need to do all of these other pieces of infrastructure to the cost of 350 to 425 million. The the how I read that was that if we do the airport tunnel, that it, it we will not do any of those upgrades over up until uh, the year 2040, listed in here. Does that mean then that truly Country Hills Boulevard is going to stay two lanes? Because just just earlier in the report, it actually talks about increasing Country Hills to six lanes, widening Country Hills Boulevard to six lanes. So are we truly going to leave Country Hills Boulevard at two lanes for, until 2040? Uh, no, Your Worship. I, I think that the the systematic development of the Northeast Network would occur, and that's listed on page 4 of 28, mm -hmm. um, that those improvements would occur in both scenarios. Okay. Uh, I think that the difference is in the do-nothing scenario, we're seeing that the planned development of Country Hills Boulevard would be insufficient to accommodate the traffic that we've forecast that would want to use that route, and particularly the turning movements um, at the northeast and northwest corners of the of the uh, the airport. And we and this is a piece of work that we we actually did quite some time ago, and and, and have communicated to council in the past. Right. Yeah, because so, we've talked about this before, when we we're when we we're talking about the alternatives. If we don't get the tunnel, then this is yeah. these are the upgrades that we need to do. But it sounds like we'll be doing those upgrades whether we have the tunnel or not. Um, Your Worship, I, no, I, w I would suggest that, uh, you know, maybe we, maybe we should add several more pages on this, but uh, there are the, uh, how can I say this? There are things that would be there with a tunnel and there are things that would not be that would not be required without a tunnel and what I'm saying in the do nothing scenario is particularly on Country Hills Boulevards we will have intersections fail and we will have to invest more than we had other than we have in our current long range plans and I would also suggest because of the north south movements to move around this block of land that we will have more traffic using Métis Trail in uh, than would then would be in place with the uh, with the tunnel scenario mm -hmm. Are all of those upgrades to Country Hills and, and the like, would those all be funded solely by the city or would they be funded by um, adjacent landowners? The, uh, the interchanges would be funded by the city solely and the, uh, the one that would have a cost share that we'd anticipated having a cost share would, at the point where we needed to improve the access to and from the terminal, right. um, we would see that as being a cost sharing for Part of that is, is city traffic, part of that is traffic going in and out of the terminal. And uh, our prior discussions have, have indicated that that should be a cost sharing arrangement okay. with the authorities. Is that um, airport trail in Barlow and airport trail in 19th? Yes, sir. And are those the cost of those intersections or even the cost share cost of those intersections included in the, the price that's before us? They're not in either one. They're not in either? No, either. Okay. So we should anticipate that at what point? If they would do. be required in, in both scenarios at some point in time, probably 2030 and beyond. Oh, okay. So we will, we have, if we build out the tunnel at the original plan of two lanes, either way, those intersections will deal with that for 20, 20 years. That's, that's, uh, best information that we have okay. and I, I didn't think it was fair to those intersections are going to be required in either case I, I think it is fair to say that in the build the tunnel scenario option three that we would trigger them sooner and I think that's one of the major concerns that the airport authority has is that we will incur these costs for the airport authority sooner rather than later however 
we're also forecasting that a third of the trips in and out of the terminal will use the link to the east. So it's a bit of, you get what you pay for. Right. Um, uh, okay. Now, I, I, I want to talk. I don't, I don't understand transit here. Uh, and I don't understand the LRT being in this because everything I've heard and read about the LRT and access of the LRT to the airport is that it has been planned to come from the west. And this seems to suggest that it's coming from the east. So is that, is that, the, is that the plan now? Um, well, to, actually, to be perfectly honest, Your Worship, LRT has never been planned to go to the airport. Um, this has been, we, we have identified a primary transit corridor along airport trail, and we've, uh, we've identified that with an, a northeast line and a north central line, there's a perfect opportunity to tie the two together with a rapid transit system of some description. Mm -hmm. um, that could be in the form of a bus rapid transit or a rail-based transit, but uh, if we were to come in from the, the west side, it would still be, um, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be the LRT. It could be a, it could be an entirely different system. Okay, but the, the, the cross-sections we're looking at are LRT. Compatible. Compatible, coming from the east. The plant, the, the report talks about adding a station there to, to get LRT to head the spur uh, off. Your Worship, there, there is a station plan there now. That okay. would not be a new station. That okay. is the next station that we have identified in our existing plans. Okay. Um, so if perchance we, I mean, LRT to the airport is, as far as I'm concerned, and I was, you know, I've heard this from a lot of people, is, is something that is definitely needed, that if you, you know, we hear all the time, world-class cities have LRT, LRT to the airport. We have a plan before us that actually has a nice little picture that includes a nice, <laughs> nice little train. Uh, and you talked about that earlier, about you know the clearances and allowing for it is LRT compatible. Um, does, does this follow then? Would transportation be looking at, say, looking at running that next station and LRT to the airport before it gets to, well, as far as I know, there's three other lines that might be that are planned before we even get to that one. Would it be looking at bumping that up, say, right after the Southeast LRT or before the Southeast LRT, after North Central, after the tunnel downtown? Your Worship, I think that if, if, uh, if Council decides to proceed, then yes, we would have an opportunity to go and, and, and take a look at the feasibility, mm -hmm. the cost. Um, one of the getting a little bit of detail, but you know, one of the things that we've we've learned from our discussions with the airport authority is that one of the reasons why they might like to have a different system is the ability to pull it in closer to their terminal. Our, our trains are a little bit bigger than than you probably need to handle the demand, and you'd have more flexibility if you went to a slightly different system. The downside is there's a transfer involved. Yeah. Well, two, um, we could down. branch the line at. Uh, at the 96th Avenue station on the East Branch. Uh, Canada Line, for example, has a branch at the south end. One goes to the airport, the other one goes farther down the line. Um, we have options. I guess that's, I guess that's the bottom line. We have, we have options that we could explore. Realistically, what's the horizon on that? 30 years? No, actually, I, I, you know, as, the, uh, as a number of members of council have spoken today, we don't really know what our next tranches of funding might be from other levels of government, but I've noticed a significant trend over the last few years that those have tended to be focused on public transit. Yeah. Yeah. And that's kind of one of my big challenges with this, is, is this is infrastructure that is solely targeted towards car culture. It supports and the ration a lot of the rationale behind needing this now mm -hmm. build it before as opposed to later is in anticipation of a pretty much standard same kind of urban development that we have been doing in the Northeast that this is this is one of the arguments for that was there any reason why we didn't 
given our new MDP, given our new trans uh, transportation plan, actually look and say, this should be trans a transit-only connection? Um, honestly, no, I don't think we, well, yeah. Well, there's one transit-only scenario that we did discuss, and that would be in the, um, the bore in the future, you would, you would just bore a, a train tunnel. Right. Which is a lot less complicated because you don't have to involve um, general public access, and it's it's a, I, I would suggest it's a simpler facility. With respect to the car culture, actually, one of the points I wanted to make about the you know the the do this now versus do it you know don't do it at all is uh, I think it's in line with our multiple parallel routes. Is that it gives you the opportunity to maximize the development on some of these other corridors. Um, we've we've looked at downsizing the road. We originally had a 10-lane cross-section. We've taken that down. We've reduced the operating speed. There's a lot of things that we that we have tried to reflect a, a slightly different thinking. But unfortunately, the reality is even even with our Go Plan Horizons, that individual vehicles will be the lion's share of of uh, travel on our roadways, and we still have to accommodate truck movements. And it doesn't matter whether they're hybrid powered or hydrogen powered. They're their individual vehicles, and uh, we need a transportation system that will accommodate that in the future. Yeah, and you sort of get stuck in the chicken and egg when we start looking, and that's that was one of the joys of Planet, was that it actually looked at land use and transportation together. Mm -hmm. And if we're saying we want to do a different form of land use and a different form of transportation, and yet we're putting transportation infrastructure in place that supports status quo land use, and that so you'll never get the different land use if you keep building the infrastructure that supports. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's that's I look at this and it and the arguments for it are status quo type of urban development at best. Um, and that I find disappointing. I, that's that's one of the challenges I've had with this from the beginning is that it, it supports exactly the same notion, 40,000 people living there where we have 1.2 cars per person. And this su it supports exactly that. And that is, I, I'd be all over this if we had said, it's transit only. How do we make transit only work? And then how does that support the kind of urban development that we've said that we want to have for our city? We're, with this, we're embedding uh, in a in a sunk asset, we're embedding uh, doing the same for in the northeast for another 20, 25 years, and and that is disappointing. Uh, thank you for answering questions. Sorry, Alderman Pinkout, were you putting an amendment to make it transit only? Okay. Oh, Alderman Putman's. What good timing! All you. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, procedural question, if I may. Uh, are we asking questions of administration and debating? I've noticed we're, we're sign okay. doing it all. Through Your Worship, General, General Manager Logan, who's been on his feet for approximately 14 hours. Thank you very much. Um, 12, well, it seems like a long time anyway. I was, I'd like to follow up a little bit where Alderman Diane Kali Urquhart was proceeding in terms of risk management, but in particular the risk on cost overruns and implications or the impacts on other projects. And I'm wondering if I could ask you please, for those that might not be aware of, just maybe a two or three sentence description of the TIPS program and I'd like to dig a little deep into that. So what is the TIPS program please? The TIPS program is the Transportation Infrastructure Investment Plan. It's a document that the Transportation Department publishes every three to five years and it outlines our priorities for capital funding. It doesn't necessarily, uh, it's not a council document that allocates that funding strictly, but it says that here are our highest priority projects and given the cash flow that we know to date, this is the sequence that we would do them. We also look at sequencing um, construction so that we don't have conflicts. And specifically the last couple of go-rounds it's spoken to the size of the bucket, if you will, between public transit, roads, and um, active modes, ped cycle. Thank you. To provide some context to the risk, I'm wondering if you could tell me approximately how many projects are 
uh, in the TIPS program at any given time over the next, what, five to eight years, as you mentioned? Or? Uh, we're probably actively looking at, say, 70 or 80 projects in a 10-year time frame. And what would the uh, magnitude of the capital investment be on those projects? Just sort of, again, to give some context to the risk of a cost overrun impacting desirable identified TIPS projects. There, it's quite a broad range, Your Worship. It, it goes from a low of, of proje programs, annual programs that are less than a million dollars up to things the size of West LRT, which is over a billion dollars. But typically, say, a, an interchange, if you will, would be in the 25 to $50 million range. And an LRT extension would typically be in the 50 to $100 million range. In the aggregate, would that do we have some sense in very broad terms of uh, recognizing a lot of these are, are still 10 years old and perhaps very general broad range estimates, but nonetheless, for a sense of orders of magnitude, what would the entire program, TIPS program budget be over the next decade? Um, Your Worship, the, the total of the last 10 year cycle was about, um, I, do, I have that. That number here, so just give me a second. Grand total of all projects between 2009 to 2020 was approximately $2.7 billion. Two Actually, two, the 10 year time frame, 11 to 20. So this year through to 2020, we're looking at $2.7 billion. Not including future LRT lines. Uh, this includes our, our. This includes West LRT, Northeast uh, to Saddletown. It includes um, Northwest to Rocky Ridge. Thank you. Thank you very much, General Manager Logan. Adib, what I would like to do is is perhaps just comment a little bit on what, speaking for Ward Six, what the implications or the interest in in the um, project is. I, I asked staff today to track the calls to our office, recognizing that all, not all calls necessarily reflected Ward 6 residents, but nonetheless calls we fielded. Fielded approximately 90 calls today, 90 calls, which surprised me. And I was further surprised to learn that 98% of them were in favor of the tunnel. So uh, uh, frankly, an overwhelming uh, response, that unscientific, but nonetheless, there it is. During the campaign, I was surprised that, like many of us, we knocked on thousands of doors and spoke to perhaps uh, more than a thousand people, uh, and this topic came up frequently. And I was surprised by the number of people in Ward 6, a, a fairly far removed from the, the airport, and um, the 60, I would say two thirds of the people at the doors almost invariably volunteered a question about what. Um, what my position would be on the tunnel and, and frankly I've always been a bit of a skeptic and the overwhelming response was very positive towards the tunnel so I, I proceeded to finally figure out the questions to ask why and it was I think a very genuine part of a very incredible citizenship it was along the lines of for once in our generation let's not leave an infrastructure deficit this was perceived as an opportunity to proceed and leave something behind for their children that would not be a traffic tie-up. They endure these every day of their lives, and they would like not to have that as an example of what this generation was doing for the future. A lot of people had a clear understanding that the population densities might well be a few years into the future, and that we were indeed making an investment in the convenience and efficiency and, and productivity of people coming behind us. And I thought, my gosh, I think I've got to get behind this project. Um, this, if, 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 if the voters of Ward 6 feel this strongly about it, uh, it behooves me to support the project and, and happy to do so. So it's out of that genuine uh, desire to, to do something that we've rarely done as a city, which is to actually to build for a group of people coming after us. Uh, it's on those terms that I will be supporting this motion. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alderman Putmans. Alderman Keating. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'm reminded of a time not that long ago back in the budget deliberations when we were talking about improvements to transportation and I was drawn between changing practices for savings and just again approving another uh, a budget process. Um, so I, I, I was also worried I guess at the same time uh, 
in this that it was kind of a pivotal moment within our collaborative council on how we're going to go down this path. And I respect both sides of the argument, and I am concerned about the risks and putting all the eggs in a basket and these. But I, I, I need a couple of clarifications, I guess. When we're looking at further projects or drawing from other projects, it's my understanding, Mr. Logan, that this will only happen if we see no savings in uh, negotiations or if the contingencies are not needed or are need, or not realized, I guess is a better question. Yeah, Your Worship, yes. Um, I think that's a fair comment and I, I welcome any and all questions that we can, that we can offer to, to clarify unknowns so that you can make the best decision possible. But in this particular case, uh, we are carrying contingencies in our cost estimates, as we've as we've indicated, um, which are as big, if not slightly greater than the gap. Although I would I would advise council that we suspect that we will have to use a portion of those. Um, and yes, you are correct that the uh, the range of potential numbers negotiating with the airport authority could work in our favor, or could work against us. It, that it, that is one of those risks that we haven't been able to nail down. Thank you. I mean, the risks are there and we have to move on. Uh, I have been quoted as being undecided and in favor and undecided and in favor, and, and that's exactly, kind of, I guess, how I've gone down the path, but um, I will blame Mr. Logan for making my mind up. Uh, and, and I'm gonna quote you somewhat. Uh, and it said, we are building uh, an infrastructure before the problem exists rather than after the problem exists. And I really truly believe that's a change in practice. Uh, where we are looking at something and you saying we're going to need it uh, we're going to save by doing it now um, the unfortunate part is is we wish we were under different circumstances so it would make us more comfortable but um, on that basis i will be supporting the motion thank you thank you alderman keating alderman mcleod thank you your worship i see that we're down to two lights after me so i will make this very short and uh, and me alderman mcleod and me Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, and an amendment? <laughs> no, good heavens. I got an email this morning about the tunnel, and a uh, friend of mine, and, and he said, think big, act bold. It wasn't quite where I was thinking of going, but I do think, um, in some respects, this is a leadership issue. I think that um, we're asked as council members to make the best possible decisions that we can with the information that we have available. Um, so what many of the points I was gonna make have already been made and I'm not going to repeat them. But I did approach this with an open mind. Um, there, were, there were a lot of good, um, good points made on both sides of the argument. Um, one of my thinking big things was the LRT and it very much appears to be an afterthought in the equation here it's there's no money for the cars there's no money for the tracks there's a little there's space but no lrt perhaps a bus um, but that has always been a big factor for me and i guess if i had seen transit as a priority i might think a bit differently about it um, another point um, that stuck with me is more of the same. Um, we, we in many ways appear to be starving the future by spending today. And it's all about accommodating cars. We really, um, we, we don't have, we, when we spend this much money, we don't leave ourselves a lot of room for contingencies. And the other piece of that is that we don't really know what priorities we're setting aside when we, um, put the money towards the, the airport underpass or tunnel. Um, so I guess, you know, when you try to do a cost benefit and you say, well, what, what is the cost? It, I, the equation for me is what is it we're giving up? And we don't know. We don't know what the answer to that is. We haven't seen the tips list. Um, we do know that we're spending most of the money that we have until 2018. So we really can't even think about 
going forward. And, and I'm on that same vein. I mean, for the Southeast Rec Centres, well, the four Rec Centres, we're talking about P3s. I don't even know if the financing costs for the P3s are factored into all this. Is this going to impact that? But I do know that we didn't have enough latitude with those rec centres to be able to build them with our own money. And yet now we seem to have enough for an airport tunnel. And, and I guess these are the cost payoff things that, in my mind. The other piece point um, that has not been mentioned is the airport authority, while it's not a money-making enterprise, it is a commercial enterprise with the ability to attract revenue. And um, any other organization that comes to us that wants roads pays for roads. And I don't understand why, well, I guess I do. I mean, the airport is quite happy if we'll pay for it all. But it would seem to me, if they're not contributing, if there's no financial contribution um, from the airport, then they can't be all that concerned about it. And, and that, that, that becomes a problem for me. I, I, I think that we're building roads to accommodate an organization that is growing, growing to meet the needs of the city, albeit, but I don't see this as a social issue. I don't see it as be something that should be entirely taxpayer um, funded by the taxpayer. I see it more as a financial decision and I'm, the math is not working for me when the airport won't contribute, and not only won't contribute, but wants us to contribute or um, to consider compensating them for put, putting in a road to their facility. That, to me, is just completely backwards. And for those reasons, I'm not going to support this. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman McLeod. Alderman DeMong. Mr. Logan, um, I'm particularly keen about sole sourcing and single sourcing, and any time somebody brings it up, it makes me kind of lose a few more hair, which, as you can tell, is a very dangerous thing for me. The sole sourcing you mentioned and the company being sole sourced, to your knowledge, would the airport authority have put this contract up for tender when they received the contract from them? Your Worship, um, just I guess for clarity, um, the airport authority did tender out this the construction management contract. They went through a procurement process that I believe took a year, <coughs> if not more, when they selected PCL Parsons Dufferin. Okay, so would you characterize this as sole sourcing, or from our point of view, or more as trusting the homework of another entity? Your Worship, I would characterize this as we had to balance off using a single source, the benefits of doing that versus the potential cost of getting a better price if we went to the market. And um, my advice to council is that I believe that the benefit that we gain by using the same construction manager outweighs the potential cost savings that we might get by going to the market. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask some more questions, but I can't for the life of me think of any others that haven't been asked at least twice here tonight. Thank you. <laughs> There's no question that this is a great deal of money, colleagues, um, and there are risks, many of them. We have to start planning for growth, as Alderman Putman says, rather than reacting to it, or maybe it was Alderman Keating, I can know, you guys, interchangeable, right? Okay. Um, I, too, I too, during the campaign, was, was hit at the doors many times with regards to the tunnel. Uh, I was already leaning towards it because I, 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 for the most part, would like to see an LRT at some point get to the airport. I think it's an integral part. Um, while I'm campaigning, the candidates out in Ward, or the, <laughs> the voters out in Ward 14 were suggesting that they were in favor of it. So over the course of this, since we got this, knew this was coming up, I actually commissioned a poll in my ward and uh, I wanted to confirm that this is what, that they still wanted this. Um, the results for me were really quite surprising. Just as uh, Alderman Putman's, there were 1,170 in favor against 650 against. Now, in, in Ward 14, one of the farthest wards away from the airport tunnel, to be voting two to one in favor of that is, is amazing as far as I'm concerned. And, and, and 
kudos to them. Um, uh, they've got, we've got, we're, we've got our own concerns out in, in, in the southeast. We've got the southeast LRT, Deerfoot. Uh, we'd like a functioning interchange at 22X. But the Ward 14 is willing to say, you know what, this is a choice. They see the benefits of this, and they see that this is a choice that, they, that the city needs to make. And for these reasons, I, I'm certainly going to be voting for it. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman DeMong. Alderman Carr, I feel like maybe you've spoken on this already, but it might have been the amendment. Ah, all right, Alderman Carr. Well, I'm just going to briefly say that I think this is, I'm, I'm going to try and be brief, if we can. Um, Alderman Carr, I am yet to speak, yeah. so. <laughs> I knocked on close to 20,000 doors, and everyone had an opinion on the airport, and it was overwhelmingly like I think I can count on one hand the people who did not support the airport tunnel um, we have received tremendous uh, feedback through my office and it is 90 percent in favor of the tunnel and that's my ward and citywide uh, our job I mean and personally I've been a major advocate of connecting LRT to the airport for years now I used to tease uh, John Hubble and, um, and uh, Neil McKendrick every time I saw him, have you drawn that line yet? And I'm talking about the Northeast LRT to touch the airport, and they're always like, Ugh. We have to do it, and there's no other way to do it. I think that this keeps a vital door open. I'm sorry it's come down to a do or die moment. I am a huge advocate of the fact that we are building <clears throat> way more infrastructure than we have tax paying structure to support it, and we have to fundamentally change our approach to growth. But this is something we need as we move forward. I've been to airports all over the world, and the ones that are robust, multimodal hubs of transportation options are the ones that are going to have successful cities and regions as we move into the future. So I will be supporting this. And I wish the terms were less dire, and I wish uh, it wasn't such a crisis, but I'm behind Calgary and vice versa. Thank you, Alderman Carr. Alderman Lowe, would you do me? Alderman Lowe, would you? Thank you. How do I turn this mic on? Your Worship. Thank you very much. Um, I actually will be brief. I think we've heard a lot today. And first of all, I want to finish where I started, which is I really want to thank administration. If you had told me uh, when I first started this job that quote unquote bureaucrats, and especially the people from the city solicitor's office, could be so flexible in their thinking and really be able to work to move this stuff forward, I'm not sure I would have believed you. And regardless of the outcome tonight, I really want to highlight that our administration has done yeoman's work. They've, I've really been very, very proud of what they've been able to accomplish in such a short period of time. And I also want to thank all of my colleagues around this table. You know, there was a, there was a kind of a silly article in the, in the newspaper today that talked about how having a divisive issue at council may mean that council is not able to work together anymore. And I don't think anyone intended that to be the meaning. But I don't think that's true at all. And I've said from the very beginning that occasionally we will have 15 to nothing votes, sometimes 10 to 5, and yeah, sometimes 8 to 7. And regardless of how things turn out today, as Alderman Lowe standing in this spot, of, oh, I don't know, an hour ago, said, this is not a referendum on anyone. And I just really want to be able to, I just really want to thank all of my colleagues for being people of principle, for tackling this, for asking really tough questions. Because we should ask really tough questions about issues like this that are so important to the future of our city. So I want to thank you all for doing that, regardless of what side you find yourself on uh, in the ultimate vote. My point of view on this is perhaps well known. I do believe that this is a vital transportation link. I do believe that we need to move forward on it. I believe that for a long time. And I too uh, 
in my travels around the city have heard a lot. And I, I wouldn't say it's 98% Alderman Putman's in favor, but it's certainly extraordinarily high. And I had the great, great privilege of traveling the breadth and width and length of this city and really found it remarkable that no matter where I was, I remember a, a forum ostensibly about Southwest Calgary transportation issues at the Mid Sun Community Center when everyone wanted to talk about the airport underpass. Um, it was the tunnel then. And, you know, the remarkably how people in the city came together and said, you know, I think that that really matters. And I remember even reading in the newspaper someone who was concerned that the flyover serving his own business might be delayed, though Mr. Logan says it's not going to be delayed after all. And he actually said in the newspaper, you know something? Build the airport underpass first. I can wait. Because I think Calgarians have really shown a remarkable generosity of spirit in all of this. And I think that the motion in front of us today is a really good example of creatively thinking about how to do this. Should all of the financing go through, I can't underline enough that there's no impact on the property tax, that we've been able to find other sources of funding uh, for this. And I think that's a good thing. Do I like it? Do I like the fact that we are being asked to give a mandate for a negotiation that's not yet completed, that we still have so much fuzziness? I don't like it at all. I wish, we, I wish Ms. Cole could have come here with a done deal as she normally does. But we weren't able to do that. And the fact that we were able to get to this flexibility I think is very good. There are a number of risks. And I'm concerned about some of them. I'm concerned about a lack of future flexibility if there are new projects that we do not yet have funding for. And in fact, Alderman Lowe pointed something out to me today, which I thought was very important, which is does this restrict our ability for future cost-shared provinces with the provincial and federal governments? It's an excellent question. I'm concerned a little bit about our debt capacity, though Mr. Sawyer has, I think, answered that very well, saying that we're well within our area. So really what this comes down to for me is do we want to take a risk on a project we know we need and be able to go a little bit outside of our comfort zone in order to do that? Or do we want to wait for some sort of unspecified um, future project that we may not know anything about now? And I think the choice in this one is clear, that it's important for us to move forward. The final thing I want to say um, before I sit is I just want to make it extremely clear because I think that this has been reported poorly. And we have heard a little bit even around our debate today Insofar as this is not a referendum on me, and it doesn't matter if you like me or not, you know, we'll vote on the, on the issues here. This is not the mayor's proposal. You know, this is certainly a proposal that I asked administration, as I always have, from the first day I met with the ALT, to take the data you've got and give us your best possible recommendation. It's then council's job to apply a political filter and determine whether or not to accept that recommendation. And I really think that this is precisely what we've had. So, you know, assertions about, you know, was this truly a biased report, I think are unfair. Because we did, in fact, ask administration to answer a very simple question. How much is it actually going to cost to build this? And what would the cost to the citizens of Calgary be if we don't build it? And that's the answer we got back. And I'm very confident that the answer that we got back is precisely what's in the report. It costs more not to move forward than to move forward with this project. And in that case, I think that that answers a lot of the questions that we've heard around here. Is there a need for it? What do we do if we don't build it? To me, it's pretty straightforward that we need to be able to move forward with this project now. All of that said, once again, I thank administration. I thank all of you, and I do hope that you'll be able to support this. Alderman Stevenson to close. Thank you, uh, Your Worship. Well, I want to, I want to address a, a couple of uh, things that were brought out here. One was um, safety issues that were brought up and in the research over the last three years on airports with tunnels, and believe me, there's a lot of them still being built around the world, even after 9-11, but uh, Atlanta is a great example that you see in there that is eight lanes underneath a, of an of a, a, uh, interstate, and it's set up to accommodate 18 lanes. That it's not something uh, that uh, is in, on the radar for Canada or the United States to change. Uh, the other thing that was mentioned was accommodating cars. There's quite a bit about accommodating cars. We have to also understand that we need to accommodate trucks. This is, uh, the airport is built in the middle of uh, one of the three main um, uh, employment hubs in, 
in Calgary, and it will be a home to uh, nearly 100,000 people in the next 30, 40 years as far as jobs, and that it means a lot of trucks that are going to be running around there. Um, I want to mention something that is, was brought up about the, um, the cost of the, the variance in the cost of the, the tunnel. But really what we've been saying or what I've been saying and the, the group have been saying all along is exactly what the cost is coming out at. It's a 198 million including 38.3 uh, million in uh, contingency to build the, the tunnel and the road. And that's, the, that's exactly what we've been saying. Of course, there's been people out there saying 500 million and 800 million and so on. But there was certainly, there was one quote that came in at 40 million for 250 uh, meters. That means that it would be around 100 million for the length of this tunnel. The, the concern that I have also is the depleting of the MSI and putting us in this position. But I asked council to think about the fact that if this had have been brought to a council's attention in when it was first sent, uh, the city was first notified about it, in the early months, the first quarter of 2007, then you would have been looking at putting on a tips list because I'm sure the council of that day would have said, hold it, we'd better look before we spend a billion dollars on the West LRT and all the rest of the things. Maybe we need to cut something back to put this thing on the tip list. So it should have been there. And by the way, uh, members of council, when we're looking at the costing and spending all of the money and everything, there are options like the toll, the acreage assessment, the province, the feds, charges for utilities. We heard uh, Mr. Logan say that that wasn't considered because they have to go through there. So all of these things are things that uh, could be uh, money coming in. I want to say a particular thank you to all the, um, the hotel people, the business people, the community associations that have worked so hard to make this an issue and I got to say that this is not hype. This is something that is real to the people who live in that area and are affected and their businesses are affected. It's not someone selling a timeshare. This is something that's urgent and it's needed and it's needed now. I also want to say thank you to the fellow members of council and to the mayor. Uh, there's some of you, the, some of the members of council that have been with me on this thing from day one and uh, working and helping to put this forward. And, and I gotta say that Mayor Nenshi has really put so much into this and worked so hard with all of the members of, of the administration and the, our, uh, the team of uh, GMs have done an unbelievable job. And I just have to say thank you for what you've done. And uh, the thing that I have said from day one on this for the last three years is this council is a chance for us to plan for growth instead of waiting and reacting to growth. So I ask your support on this, and I'd like to ask for a recorded vote. Here. Thank you very much. On the recommendations as amended, a recorded vote, please. On the recorded vote, Alderman Marr against, Alderman Hodges against, Alderman Farrell against, Alderman Carra four, Alderman Collier Cart against, Alderman Chabot four, Alderman DeMong four, Alderman McLeod against, Mayor Ninchy four, Alderman Putnam's four, Alderman Keating four, Alderman Stevenson four, Alderman Jones four, Alderman Pincott against, Deputy Mayor Lowe against. It's carried, Your Worship, 8-7. No recess. Yes, well, I'm about to, but the mayor has to take the chair.
one PM tomorrow. Your Worship, we moved to the Lord. Right sorry. Now? First oh, sorry. The the um, we just need to uh, we need to do the uh, borrowing bylaw, which was embedded in this. So on the borrowing bylaw, I don't have the number in front of me. One B twenty eleven. First reading of the bylaw. Are we agreed? Opposed. Opposed. Uh, call the roll, please. Same division. Same division. Same division. Uh, we put it in already. Yeah. Same division. No, sorry, sorry, Mr. Tully was just having something else. Agree to same division? Agreed? Very well. Should I move um, uh, recess, Your Worship? Thank you. Uh, motion to recess until 1 p.m. tomorrow. Seconded. Are we agreed? Thank you all.